Good morning, everyone. Like any convention, things are always going to start a little bit late. Like any convention, uh, uh, I saw friends last night, had a good time, had a laugh, hit the bar a little bit, had a few drinks, and stayed up later than I should have. So here I am starting uh, my initial live stream. Um, there was also a hiccup. I, I set this up to go on my desktop. And uh, I thought the file would save to um, YouTube and I'd be able to immediately access it from my laptop that's set up for, for streaming. And nope. So I had to, to re-enter all the information, which, you know, ate up my breakfast time. So my eggs are getting cold. <laughs> all right. So um, this is, this is going to be a little different because I get to use all my studio tools um when i'm doing work today i already have uh three or four pieces lined up here um some some stuff i've never drawn before and some stuff i've drawn before but we'll still need to get reference so um the other benefit of being in my studio is i have desktop um to the left of my drawing table i can pull up reference as i need it um i can even print it out i might print it out so people can see like what i'm using as reference and um what i'm using uh as inspiration to draw and how different those things can be um i think i want to move the camera a friend of mine said oh you should you should really get a two camera setup like this is the first time i'm doing this dude i will i will make do with uh, this one rather nice new camera i got a brio 4k and um see what i can do with that so i think i think today i got a really nice really big piece i gotta do um but i think i'm gonna start that tomorrow um uh, because i'll take a, a a big chunk i, I want to ease into this i'm going to start with two of the smaller pieces and the way i work in my studio is i uh, i do a lot of penciling on this um translucent bond paper in fact, the brand is, I can, I can talk about the tools as I go. This is the, uh, this is the brand, the paper I use uh, for almost all my initial drawing. And uh, I just realized I better update some of the links that it might be a little different. Um, let's see here. Might be a little different from what I initially posted where I'm, where I'm, I'm streaming from. And uh, the new link I had to create. Oh, it looks like I'm live. So that's that's good. Um, yeah, so I use this translucent bond, which is increasingly more difficult to get. Um, this paper, I'm going to say um a lot as I ease into this. Uh, this paper is uh, translucent. So if I do an initial drawing and I like parts of it, but I don't like the whole of it, I can like pull the sheet off and stick it in and see if I can find a drawing on hand that can share. That's not part of something my publisher hasn't shown yet. I show this? Oh, hang on, here we go. So I, I drew this Hellboy on Zoom um, uh, last weekend and uh, it's ink, so it's gonna show up a little too well, but the, it, it serves almost as like tracing paper. I think it shows up pretty good uh, here. So if I did this with pencil, and like parts of it, um, other parts I didn't like. I wanted to move things around. I wanted to like redraw the head, but float it up a quarter inch. Um, this is something I started doing in art college. This is like a technique one of my illust uh, illustration teachers taught me is drawing this paper and you can immediately take the drawing you're happy-ish with, put it underneath the next sheet and use it as tracing paper to redraw immediately. So you, there's almost like no skipping a step. Now, if I was 100% digital, that wouldn't be an issue by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but this is part of how I learned to do drawing was like just work on paper uh, with a pencil. And um, but when when I'm happy with this, because there's actually been a drop off in quality in art materials um, since I was a student. Um, uh, Bristol board, the, 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 I guess the bread and butter of most comic book artists career is nowhere near as good as it was in the eighties and nineties. 
it just isn't. Um, there's been a few anchors who uh, gone into length about how badly the what used to be the gold standard Strathmore Bristol, Strathmore 500 Bristol, um, that it's just it's just not there. So my solution was to actually incorporate the computer a bit. So I'll do all this drawing on this paper. I can I can brutalize this paper because it doesn't matter because I'm not going to ink on it. As um, soon as I'm happy with the drawing, I'll, pour, I'll scan it in Photoshop. I'll clean it up a bit, and then I'll print it out on the artboard um, in, a, in a light blue, which a lot of artists are doing nowadays. Um, toss the initial sketches because they don't matter. And then I'll ink on that, that now newly uh, printed out uh, bristle board. And what that does is it means that all the... Um, uh, graphite, um, pressing down on the surface of the paper, erasing, drawing, erasing, drawing, erasing, drawing, erasing, doesn't affect the surface of the Bristol board because they actually treat the surface of artboard. So it can actually, you know, take the ink a little bit better. So all I'm doing then is all the shenanigans I get up to when I'm applying black ink to paper. Now for the first one, I'm doing a bust first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, YouTube over here, I'm going to type in the name of the character. And it's a weird one I've never drawn before. It's really cool. Um, ah! Um, some of the pictures of this guy are, are just bizarre. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll print this one. And, uh, oh, what happened now? And, see if I can get this to fill. This is fine. This is, this is the character. Hopefully it'll show up well on the stream. This guy, this guy, never drawn him before. Um, he is going to be the first piece I'm drawing today. It's Razorback. He's a Marvel character. I ended up reading his backstory because um, I think I was aware of this character. Uh, but I never read anything with him, and uh, I've never, of course, I've never drawn him before. Um, he he doesn't really make sense to me, but I'm going. I'm going. This is going to be fun. So what I get to do is I get to put the uh, reference like right here, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be. It's a it's just a bust uh, on nine by nine by twelve. So I get to do some warm up sketches. Uh, I might do a lot of garbage sketching just to get a feel for what this sucker looks like and and then when i'm happy with it i either might just go right to nine by twelve because it's just a bus or i might um actually go through my whole process where i'll, I'll do a pencil drawing i'm a little more happy with it's still going to be loose as crazy and and then do printing out nine by nine by twelve which uh would give everyone a real real sense of like how i approach this work so just which pencil do I want to start drawing with today? Uh, so use this chunky Staler. It's like a one millimeter lead. So now busts are traditionally a Greek bust. Let's go up here and do it. A Greek bust is like, you know, a classically proportioned statue. With all that curly hair. So that's where, you know, the whole bust angle comes from. So that's the traditional Greek bust. A lot of times in comics in, in, in North America here, a bust will just be <clears throat> a three quarter or a profile headshot. Um, and they'll just, just stop it. Um, you know, like if it's Batman,
Grr, I'm Batman. I am the knight. Grr. Might just draw the bat signal. Uh, signal. Symbol. <clears throat> hey, did I mention it's early? Um, on his chest, and then they'll just leave it like that. Wow, that's a terrible bat symbol. There we go. Grr. And they'll just say, okay, this is my Batman bust, and they'll just leave that. So it, it's the same thing. Bust is basically head and part of the torso. Um, so if I'm drawing this guy with this massive boar helmet, uh, I got to think about uh, um, how everything can fit in. Like I, if the character like this, what I, what I might even do is I might actually go pull up some photos of boars or an actual Razorback boar because I, I I have a feeling that this is this is very much a cartoon idea of what a boar looks like, which could work. Um, but I generally have like a more realistic style. I, I could uh, go and find a couple of pictures of, of an actual Razorback. And uh, I could even print them up, put them here so people can see what I'm using as reference um, to run with. Because, I mean, these, these tusks here, they don't seem to make sense um, outside of comic book reality. The eyes obviously don't uh makes sense i mean it's like in in the mask here his eyes are way up here uh, like literally above where his his head is uh because his mouth is down here so how does i mean you know does he have like stark tech so he can actually uh um have like uh, goggles or something so he can look at the, the the razorback eyes i mean that would be that would be hilarious <laughs> i think if i if i remember correctly um he, he he started as a truck driver from texas or something and i think he's kind of a superhero uh or a good guy i i don't think i mean he looks like he's a goofy i, I gotta be honest here he looks like he could fall right out of the teenage mutant ninja turtles comics and i think they do have a boar headed i think they do have a boar headed uh villain in the turtles um but this guy i mean He's gonna, his, his bottom jaw is going to be, like, buried in this mask. And I got to decide, like, how big he's going to be. I mean, it's like, I could I could be kind of lazy and just just draw this, redraw this. And sometimes at a convention, that's that's all you got in you. you, you you're just like, I'm just going to draw what I'm seeing from the reference. And, uh, and it's going to be vaguely influenced in my style. But... One of the perks of being in my studio because I can actually access so many more tools. I can actually look at what a real boar looks like. And in fact, I, I think I am going to do that. I, I'm going to pull up some references. It means it's going to be me talking about a meter away from the mic. So hopefully the audio is good for that. And um, actually, actually, this is a good cutoff point for the bust. So what I'm going to draw, what I'm going to focus on is this part. So that's going to be the bust. Um, and it's going to make a nice natural uh, termination point for the bust. So I can just have that floating. But I got to tell you, I want to have a better sense. Uh, I really want a better sense of what that boar's head looks like. So let me let me pull up over here on my computer what a boar's head looks like. I'll print out the reference. I'll put it on screen for everyone to see. Okay, you know what? I'm going to add Razor back in, not just Tusk more. It might be different. Oh, wow. These things, this is very, very different. This is very different from what the cartoon character here looks like. Wow. There's, there's a lar large variety of, like, what... I think this is the best picture to put print here. I'm going to print this one. I think it's hilarious, actually. But, um, yeah, oh my God, I would love to have like, access. 
like I'll, I'll have either my phone or maybe even like a, a tablet computer with me so I can pull up reference when I'm at the con if there's decent internet connectivity. I'm not a better shot at these pores. This is this is weird. Good one. Oh, here's the headline. Former Arkansas Razorbacks mascot Tusk the Fourth. Guy's at 10 years old. Is, is that a good good year for a good span for a, a four? I guess maybe. All right, I'm gonna print this one out too. Luckily, my new printer is stupidly fast. I should run out of ink on camera, though. But here, here's here's the first one I came up with. Um, this is so different from this. This this looks like part of the tusk broke off. Um, or that might be a tooth, and the tusk is there. Uh, because some of the reference photos I I pulled up are very different from that. In fact, here's a nice big picture. So, like, what, what, oh, what? <laughs> I think that's, these are teeth right here. And then it might be that the tusks are growing out of the bottom jaw and coming up around. So I guess, like, I now, you know what? This is, this is just me. This is, this is how I work as an artist. I now want to see um, this boar or a boar with tusks like this with its mouth open so I can see how those tusks connect. And it may be something I have no application. Okay, I'm going to open both. All right. Yeah, okay. Oh, wow. Oh, this is good. It's kind of gross because it's a taxidermy. Uh... Oh, wow. There's like a variety of taxidermy boars. Um oh my god this is these things are fascinating. I am now I am now in love with the bizarreness of of uh tusk boar. There's some great reference is that the best one to use or is this one? More of a profile shot that I'll probably have to. Brown wild boar, razorback, feral hog, pig, shoulder mount, taxidermy, real tusk on eBay. You could own this one. I'm going to print it out. You guys have to see this. Oh, God, this is a huge picture, too. Oh, and it's tongue. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> this, is, this is radically changing how I'm going to be drawing this character. Because um, this character, this mask, I, it looks again like it's a cartoon boar. But this is this is what a razorback looks like. It it looks like I mean this head almost looks like a tapir 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 tapir. Um, and there's its eye. It's really really dark. That may not come up in camera. But you got these kind of like almost like toothy protuberances coming up from underneath the upper jaw and pointing upwards. Then you got these big curved tusks coming out from underneath and he's jutting forward I, it, this is wow and somehow they went from this to that i i wonder i wonder how cartoonish they went with the three quarters profile i wonder i wonder if there's probably there's got to be like a more realistic marvel artist i'm going crazy this is this is what i do though this is when i'm when i'm drawing Character for first time, I go I go stupidly deep into the the research uh, so I can actually figure out what I'm doing, uh, where I'm gonna go. This guy was in She Hulk, wasn't he? I think he was one of the the goofballs. There's a picture here. And they got a radically different Razorback here. Uh, it came up in the image search. Wow, there's some action figures. There's an action figure. Oh, it's custom. Sorry, never mind. Oh my God, this is uh, there's some cartoonishly brilliant Razorbacks. I can understand the appeal of the character now. 
Um, this guy is bizarre. It looks like this is a John Byrne drawing of Razorback. Yeah, which, which what am I going to show? There's the Marvel Universe. It shows a profile. Oh, you know what? It's, it's, oh my God. I wish I saw this first. Okay. Open image and new tab. It actually has a straight up profile. This would have been the perfect thing. Add first. The old classic Marvel handbook. Uh, complete character rotation of Razorback. They've they've given him a kind of a stylized thing here that's not uh, wasn't visible at all in the first drawing, wasn't visible at all in any of the other initial pictures that came up. This boy is thick. Look at this guy's arms. Oh my god! I mean, he's like he'd give Sergio Oliva like a complete run for his money. And uh, wow, his color sense that that turquoise and yellow. With the brown, oh, fashion week. Here we go. But he, he's got, he's got. I mean, I, this is before Rob Liefeld. He's got belt pouches going all the way around. Like he's got full on belt pouches, like on the back of his body that he can't even re really access because he'd have to open those and pull shit out of that. Holy crap! And his legs are kind of. These are not good legs. It's from that angle. I can see where they just flip, flopped the figure, and then he, I. I if you've been a Marvel fan as long as I have, and when this came out, you were getting it. I used to get, I got the comics in them for a while when I was working at Marvel in the 90s. They reprinted them with, on cardstock, so you could put them in a binder. And I think it was, um, I think Joe Rubenstein inked them all. I can't remember who penciled them all. I'm mostly penciled by the same guy. And I have a feeling there were so many to do. He did body types. He probably um, traced them off like hundreds of them. I said, okay, this is the super thick guy. Uh, and then you would just add this on then in, in the pencils, then it would get inked and it would be like faster. But, oh my God, look at these boots. I mean, I think, I think it was Eric Larson who posted a little while ago, like the difference in like um, Captain America boot in like the, the 70s, 80s. Where he come down, he had that, 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 those those cool pirate boots that John Bishima got to draw all the time. Right, and that was that was the Marvel boot at the time, and it was like you could draw that in no time at all. It adds movement and shape and everything. And then like the modern boots, whenever you put on something, it's like they're actual military boots. You got to get that like the tread underneath the boot. Is this shooting showing up? Yeah, there we go. And uh, you draw like all the laces, all the texture, all the all the detail in the boot. So I mean, these are these are boots from the early time of comics, where it's like, as long as it looked like a boot, it was a boot. Uh, I kind of almost miss those days. I really almost do. But I'm digressing. But I'm going to be on camera for a very long time today, so I, I can I can digress. So this is this is who I'm drawing first. Razorback. I'm just doing a bust, which means I'm probably just going to be drawing the hood with that mouth in there. Oh, his eyes. I guess his eyes are are. I guess this is his field of vision. I mean, <laughs> uh, which which makes it really questionable why he has the eyes up there. Uh, and look how thin that, I guess that's why he's Razorback. I guess that's some, probably some sort of like metal razor so he can bend over impossibly far and charge someone and that razor would hit them. Oh man, Marvel. Wow. I missed, I missed the years when like those were what you would come up with. So I'm going to have to somehow take that design, make it coexist in my head with what a Razorback actually looks like. Notice that 
they have like tufts of hair starting to come up here. So they have uh, tufts of hair coming up, like almost like, um, I guess a mohawk of, of uh, like a, a more feral natural mohawk with those raggedy ass ears. And, and these tusks. Wow. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be doing an impromptu redesign of Razorback so I can do a bust that makes sense to me. But the way that this um, set of tusks, let me erase it so it might even show up on camera. So this set of tusks, which don't actually match the tusks in the Fort Reviewing part, um, are all coming up from the top. No tusks from the bottom where the mouth is here. But in an actual Razorback boar, you have tusks up top and bottom, which are really, really prominent. So I got to figure that stuff out. That's going to be interesting. Again, I'm, I'm going to make the challenge for me to uh, make all of this. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, it's early, man. I didn't even get to eat a full breakfast. I got to make all of this um, compatible in my head with with what i'm going to do here with razorback so i'm actually i'm going to i'm just going to plot down a very simple head keep in mind that this guy is like some sort of insane level bodybuilder who's never competed i mean if 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 my oh god if, if someone had that body um in the bodybuilding look at those arms look at those arms oh my god madness um i mean his calves are no hell um his glutes need work but those arms oh my god what are those 30 inch arms impossible um again i'm digressing because I'm, I'm just enjoying this too much so he's going to be wearing this boar helmet uh so i i, I want it to have more of a feeling of a boar and I am going to open its mouth more. And I'm going to have the bottom tusks proper coming out. I should get. So I'm going to put his head inside the, the boar. It's going to make it feel more like a fantasy piece, I guess. And then I'm still going to give him like that, that weird kind of spikish thing happening here. Yeah, I think I think this I think this will work. I can exaggerate stuff too, so it's like how did that come out like that? It's gonna flare out, so it's gonna actually stick out like that. And he's gonna have some teeth coming forward. And his head's gonna be buried in there. I'm gonna give him like an extra thick neck on the, the hood, because the hood, the hood just literally goes like wide here. So I'm just gonna Give him more of a raggedy look like that. The boar eyes are back up here. I want to look a little crazier, so. I want to keep an idea of that, that weird flaring spike. Like a fin, you know, like a shark's fin. And that's kind of an angle. Uh, maybe like that. Okay, so I'm not going to draw the boar's tongue in there, but you're going to get a sense of like these teeth coming out. I'm not going to do like this weird kind of loose, like uh, brown blanket. What I do is I'm going to make it look like a point of fur coming out into the shoulders. And that allows me to get his head in there. So his eyes are going to be implied in there.
don't want to make, leave dead air. This is this is what if I do this in the future, I want other artists and a host involved. Um, so there won't be dead air. People can ask questions. Why are you making that decision? Oh, I don't seem like a good idea at the time. Um, yeah, let's let's go on here. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just going to leave the eyes without pupils. I think the pupils look almost like bizarre. Whereas, like if if I leave them clear, it'll it'll give the implication that maybe there's some tech there allowing them to see. God, I'm overthinking this. No one's going to be happy wearing that. I mean, he looks. He looks kind of scowly in here, but he looks kind of happy here. I mean, I wonder if I can do this. Here we go. So he, he looks kind of scowly in the front picture, but in the middle picture, it almost looks like he's smiling, right? I mean, he's like, hey, I, look at this cool boar head I got. Um, he's really most happy because of all the pouches. Um I'm gonna do. You know what? I'm gonna give him, this boar here. Looks like there's almost a a bit of a mane, like as it rises up here and tufts up. Looks like there's a bit of a mane coming back onto the underside of the jaw. So it's like that level of fur. So I'm gonna pull that around. I'm gonna give him more fur there. Yeah, I can be really lazy. There's this this cartoonishly redneck level Arkansas Razorback design I saw when I was looking on my on my computer. And um, first off, it's kind of offensive to me um, that they immediately go there. But um, I, I kind of like the idea of like doing this the shaggy animal head. And getting all the, uh, the, the, I think, I think this is a working design. Now you wouldn't see this tusk over here, like just visualizing this in three dimensions. Um, the jaw would be over here and it'd be coming down under there, meeting the nose. So this tusk would be over here, coming out like that. So you won't see that other tusk at all. Uh, and that's one of the things I always, when I, when I used to teach a drawing, I said, you know, try and be able to see transparently through objects, especially when I taught perspective. Um, so you can actually have the character make sense. Like in real, like if I was really, really planning this out, I would, you know, this was going to be like a job where I was, I was doing concept art for like, they had, someone had to build this head. It very much would need me to uh draw it in three dimensions fully understand like what's happening on either side of the head uh, this kind of occurs i like that it's almost like a bear pigs and bears are related so that means the boar is related to a bear and that's why i guess there's a similar like a more elongated snout but there's an element of of a bear Just drawing a very generic bear here. Now I think the barriers are further back here. Yeah, so you can see where they're like a very similar element to the bear. So bears and pigs are related, as I understand it, evolutionarily. Expect digressions like this all day long. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I think I think this is where we're gonna go. I'm not sure how. I, you know what? I think I want that razor to start here. Now in the rotation, they have a cool little thing that gets buried. There's like a weird little spike right here. Pull this up. It's a weird little spike right in there. See that? It, it it regresses from the front, and there's a spike, and then it swoops around. So I th I think that's a cool little feature for this. So let's let's pull the razor coming up over here. So middle line of the head. 
or the helmet coming all the way around. So let's have this regress and then let's have the, the blade spike like that. And what we'll do is we'll have the hair go around that. And it has these weird kind of like structural residual lines. So what we can do is we can say there's like structural supports to the spike going across. And we just see those regressing as we get back here. So I think I have, at this point, I don't want to draw this boar's tongue. I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's completely fake because uh, it's a it's a stuffed boar head. But you see that weird kind of like ripply tongue? Uh, I don't I don't want that coming out underneath that guy's chin. Um, so we're going to just um, have like textures there, like the underside of a jaw, like some sort of like, add some shadows. Probably going to be like, he probably stinks. I mean, he's wearing this, what? It's going to be like a 50-pound helmet because it's got this metal thing here. It's probably got all sorts of support so he doesn't break his neck when he runs into people. So it probably um, weighs a ton and smells terrible. Um, so he's probably not, and he's also a truck driver. So he's on the road all the time. So he doesn't. And this is like the 80s, so the rest stop situation is probably not great. So um, very likely he doesn't have the best hygiene. Well, nowadays they have like really, really, a friend of mine told me, I asked him about it. So apparently some of these rigs that drive these transport trailers, because there's so much pressure on truck drivers, days, they actually have bathrooms in them. Um, if I have anyone listening, feel free to, you know, tell me uh, what the current situation is with, uh, with truck drivers whether or not whether or not they travel with a toilet um i'm sure that's exactly the type of information anyone checking in the stream would want to know uh, truck drivers toilets or no but i think yeah, i think this is the design i'm going to run with uh hopefully that's clear enough for you guys it's going to feel a little bit more like um what a kind of like fantasy D D. Like if you had a uh a guy in D D movie coming out soon uh a guy in dnd wearing a boar helmet this would be i think more like what it would be the head it's not overwhelming the head as much as in in the comic book um and it just feels like something that's existing around the head a little bit more so if if i was in love with this very drawing it's too small i could i could theoretically scan it blow it up in photoshop and draw on top of it but i think i need to redraw it and get get a better sense of that but um, just to go back to what I was saying, it just started the stream about using this paper to do most of my drawing on. If I wanted to do the drawing right here, maybe I'll, you know what, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna pick up a finer pencil. So you can see, it's almost like there's a ghost of my previous drawing living underneath what I'm gonna work on here. Where's my, there's a nice point seven pencil. This is my studio. Everything's a disaster. Everything's everywhere, but I know where it is and I can find it reasonably quickly. Here we go. Oh, that's a ballpoint. Oh my God, it looks exactly like one of my pencils. And there it is. These are um, my two favorite types of pencils to draw with when I'm doing somewhat more detail. Um, they run 0 0.7 nib, uh, nibs, 0.7 uh, uh, pencil leads. Uh, this is a sumo uh, grip, so it's actually easier on the hand because it's thicker. I don't end up like over clenching my hand. Um, the the pocket clip, um, I, I took that off because it was just sitting on my hand so much. And then I don't have pockets in my studio. So I love these. I have a couple of these. And when I see, the, see these, these Pentel Click 0.7s, because you can just click, click, click. And the lead comes out from doing that. Um, I like these a lot. They have they also have that little rubber grip there, which is which is nice. It's not as not not as comfortable as the sumo, but um, I can pack a lot of these when I'm traveling. If one breaks, they're a lot cheaper than the sumo. Um, so I, I I generally buy these in like three packs when I see them. And both they both use the same lead. Uh, the sumo is great because you know. The whole the whole 
tip point just recedes into there. Um, you can see it's it's all out now. Oh God, safety. So uh, not only is it better to protect the lead, but it also protects the part that holds the lead, so it doesn't get damaged. With this, try to make it click in the back. When the lead's done, it just goes back in this little, actually quite delicate piece of metal that holds the nib when I'm drawing. Um, that's vulnerable to getting. I've, I've had to throw a couple out because they got bent. And when I straightened them back, they, they didn't let the lead come out very well. So here we go. I'm going to do a more tightened up version of it. I'm going to get, okay, so there's a real peak there. I'm going to let some things be a little cartoonish. I'm going to do some ridging just above the nose. Well, I'm going to draw the one nostril. Have that come down like that. And it comes up to the top tusk. I want this to come out and be a little bit more visually apparent. So I'm going to pull that tusk there. Have it kind of point back. Yeah. It's it's a good idea when you design things to have things that kind of like visually connect, create shapes within them. So I have like the curve of this tusk actually comes around and actually just underneath the eye line and matches up with the top of the jaw. So it creates this nice little curve there. Yeah, it's 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 a little inside baseball, but when you when you have things like that, when you have those curves within a shape that actually reinforce each other or ear, uh, mirror each other. So I got this swoop here. So the bottom jaw is going to have like a, almost like a same swoop coming down. They just help the design feel like a little more cohesive. Not entirely sure like what shape I'm going to give that eye. I'm going to leave that for there. Still going to give it like those uh, eye crinkles or those like scowl marks. And the ears coming up over here. So I move to the other side, vi visualize where that ear is coming out. So if this is the ear up over here, so that means it's going to be on that part of the helmet. So it's going to go up, point away. Not going to be as visible as much, but there we go. So that's going to be the ear on the far side now, not, not as far up there as the previous drawing. There is a bit of a cheekbone here, but everything's kind of flat. And when everything's covered with that much hair, a lot of a lot of the structural elements get lost, but you can emphasize them with how you light the hair. Now, I want that that beginning of the faux hawk from the boar be coming up. And then I want that spike. I want more of a rigid change in direction. Let's take a look at the, uh, the original design again here. There it is. All right. So again, here it it's shoots back from the top of the, the, the helmet like that. And then there's like a little spike that comes like that. I think I want to go like that a bit more. So it's it's I don't, I don't, other than trying to come up with a visual swoop for the profile shot where it looks, I guess, like a mohawk or a, a horse's mane that's coming back here. And, and the boars clearly don't have that. Um, I don't think it's necessary for it. So I think I'm going to have it more of a spike coming forward. And here's the little nub of a moo eraser. I got to tell you, okay, I'm going to digress a bit again. As we go through, because I don't get to talk enough about this, my favorite erasers are Moo erasers. They are a incredibly soft. I mean, we're 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 talking like beyond spongy, squeeze, super super soft um, vinyl eraser, and um, they don't 
abrade the surface of the paper nearly as much as traditional uh, like Statler uh, vinyl erasers. Um, they just they just kind of like lightly almost wash it away. And I just love these. This one um, broke in half because again, they're incredibly soft. Um, but uh, this seems to be like, there's a little rock of an eraser. Seems to be the perfect size for like just lightly fixing drawings. And it, half the pencil fits better in your pencil case when you're traveling than uh, than a whole eraser. But okay, so I'm gonna have that spike coming out. So you can actually like, you know, I don't think you run into people as much as as essentially headbutt people. So he could he could literally like run up to someone. They're, they're completely freaked out by this guy with this giant ugly mask running at him. And then he could like just swing his head and like, hit him on top of their head with this spike. Um, let's do that. Let's give it some support so it's like a real dangerous spike. And I'm going to put like a little support there and a little support there. So there. And we're going to have the hair grow around it. So yeah, that's the way I'm going to do the spike. Next, going to come out like that. This is his ear. And deep inside the recesses of this helmet. Or reference here again. Get to that camera to see if you can see what I'm razor back. Um right. Implication of the jaw coming off here. I'm going to go really dark there. Now, that bottom tusk is going to be emerging from the front. Now, the curvature in three-dimensional space, it's going to come out. It's kind of flaring out. I want it to hit about there. Can I make that read more visually? I think I'm going to end up doing this. Because there were some photos of Razorbacks I saw where these tusks, or these tusks, which are some of them, were actually grow growing what appeared to be over top of the upper jaw, which that would be that'd be crazy to try and like you know eat your breakfast with that. I'm bringing up breakfast, of course, because I didn't finish my breakfast. Um, I wanted to go live. Okay, so then comes under the jaw, and there's the other parts of this is coming out. I'm going to give it a more distinctive point. I am pressing a little bit harder than I normally do just to make, make sure this shows up on camera. There we go, yeah. I think that my initial placement was a lot better than what I got here. Yeah. Moo! Real races come from the secret cow level in Diablo. Um, okay, so we got that. Got the jaw opening. So I want. Rah. Um, let's give them some teeth jutting forward here. Okay. As I'm drawing this, you get a sense of like what decisions you're making, how they're going to pay off. I'm finding that this part, the upper part that I've been focusing on, is now really visually overpowered by the bottom part of the jaw. Whereas I'm really happy with this. I'm really happy with where his face is going to be sitting in here.
I'm finding that this almost should be like more powerful. Yeah, I have a feeling that just, I mean, because his eyes are sitting there, so then on top of it, it's up here. So this is too small. So again, if this was just a standard um, uh, at-home commission, I think what I would be immediately doing, yeah, that's coming back. Oh, actually, you know what? I want this to come down a bit more. Here we go. Um, and I might do this just so you guys can see like the end result. Um, I would I would port this into Photoshop. I would like copy, cut all of this, put it on a new layer, and expand it. Yeah, because you know what? There's this nice, there's a nice kind of like swoop where these connect in terms of how far forward the snout goes. And here, that ain't happening, even, even if I want it to be more conservative having a here. So the snout should really be coming this far forward. And everything should just be bigger. I'm going to give him like big dark bags or dark areas around his eyes to make those pop. Yeah, if I go a lot bigger, see, this still has to be. Maybe, maybe part of the problem is this tusk doesn't come forward enough to me. This is coming forward here. Yeah, tusk should really be coming that forward, then flaring back. Yeah. No, actually, let's not do Photoshop for the first piece I'm doing this weekend. Let me do the old school method. So we have the head in here. Got a sensor. This is going to come and I want the point to be there. So it's going more forward. Man, horns in 3D space are always weird. Do like the weird kind of jutting forward teeth I got here. I'm happy with those. Okay, so the jaw swoops around. I want to keep placement of the upper tusk behind here. But I want this jaw to come forward more, the upper jaw to come forward more. I'm literally just going to pull us all here. Ridges. Bump on the snout. Come back down towards the eye. I'm going to be moving that eye up. So the swoop is going to be like this now. Um, I'm going to place the eye there. Secondary bump in the snout. I'm, I'm look, breaking down the anatomy of the snout here where it's like you have the in here goes up, comes back, goes up, goes back, goes up, goes back. So I'm, I'm not necessarily slavishly trying to draw that. I want to echo those, those bumps and ridges and everything that we're seeing in the design of the creature or the helmet. Yeah, and that feels a lot more. I'm going to pull that neck even further back here. The, uh, the back supports and just imply that like this thing's just monstrously huge. And then I still going to have the hook come back, but now I kind of want swoop. So let's pull this up here. Give them that razor back spike that goes up higher. Here it comes up, breaks the design a little bit. So it draws attention to the ear, right? The ear. You're still going to be over there somewhat. Yes, yeah, so that feels a little bit more physically consistent with 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 how. And I now want to make these tusks really freaking huge. 
you don't have to see the far tusk as much. I can literally do this. There we go. I have it like disappear into the snout there. But then I got to make this tusk. So that would be the tip there. Pull it over here. It's flaring out. So then this tusk come like that. Do thrusting here. It's coming more to a point to us here. So. I use line weight to make that pop. Guy is still going to be in the suit here. Maybe I'm going to tilt his head back a little bit more. I think I think this works. I think this works a little bit better. So this is this is the inane process I will go through. Uh, not inane, but you know what I mean. But it's like it's overcomplicated. I could have just drawn that, right? I could have just drawn that with that weird kind of like doggy snout and um, like real cartoon boar head with with the weird kind of like tufts of hair in front. Um, but this feels like if someone commissions me to draw a character, it feels like they want me to do this, like the stuff I'm doing as I, as I sort this crap out. I'm going to give it some like ridges to support that spike. So like if he's, if he's headbutting someone. And that feels... Yeah, this feels I'm I'm giving the person who commissioned me something that I did. It's like instead of me just drawing the character, it's 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 me doing what I do, which is kind of like the point of getting a different artist to draw something. And so if his head's there, then his real neck's here. So this shoulder is going to be going over there. So I'm going to have more of a swoop down like that. I just come over here. I might just let the hair grow. I think, yeah, I think this is, and you can see the difference. It's like, I did this drawing. It's like, it's almost like it's floating up, but this is thrusting forward. Just looks a little meaner. Like if I was doing color, I'm already envisioning that this eye's like glowing red, not, uh, um, not a weird cartoony eye with a pupil, like, like right? I mean, that's just, you need to have like red LED lights inside that helmet. Uh, and maybe he's actually got like telescopic view for, through the, the nostrils of the snout here. Uh, this is gonna be a very dark, I'm gonna render the hell out of this. So this would be all dark. I want to imply the, uh, the jaw. So it's gonna be like, this is probably all gonna go into like super heavy scribbly. Because I, I, I do love to scribble. Um, I am the scritch king. I'm scritchard pace. Um, that, take a look at the reference again. See if there's anything else I can pull up. There's like a real thick part of this. No, so this is going black. So this would be really dark. You're like a flare of the hair as it comes around here. This would be dark. Let the hair come forward. Let, I'm gonna let the spike disappear and just let the hair come back here spiky. This black gums coming here. So let me. Get this to black. I'm 
And since he's inside here, this will be all in shadow. So I got that head to right. I might need to be. Forward. This is. As I think this through. Yeah, because this tusk is definitely in here. I like the swoop coming in through there. Have that come back down there. Maybe have this for you, but see more of the nose. The wonderful thing about the moo is I can kind of use it like a limited needed eraser. I can just push it and it pulls a lot of the graphite up. Do that, then I definitely want the hair kind of like, yeah, it seems like almost at this point, the hair kind of goes away to snout. I don't want to... So there's gonna be a shadow point here, gonna pull that into the eye. The eye's gonna be dark all the way back to here. And it's going to be dark here. So this might almost all, all of this area here might almost all be like rendered into, into a nice dark shape. Let the chest come forward a bit. I might just like let this go in the rendering, just let the lines drift off and apply more shape here. Yeah, I think I think this is uh yeah, because if this is sitting on nine, like this is actually close to the size I need to draw it then. Um let me pull this down a bit more. Okay, so that applied supply the shoulder. And we'll let this. Yeah, because if I'm drawing nine by twelve, I'm going to grab the pad nine by twelve. So if I'm drawing a nine by twelve paper, all those sad eggs that I brought into the studio with every intention of eating. Uh, see, this is already the width of the nine by twelve, and I usually like being a little bit smaller. I could do it. I guess I could do it um, like this. That works. But either way, I've already done the drawing a little bit bigger than I need to for, for the 9 by 11. So yeah, so I'm going to port this over. Let me clean this up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to pull this up over to Photoshop. I'm going to reduce it slightly so it'll actually fit. And I'm going to print it out on the art paper. Yeah. Uh, print it out. Um, new laptop is telling me that I should restart the computer. Well, I think I'm not going to do that today. Not unless I have to, like some catastrophic thing happens. That's when I'll restart the computer. Yeah, so I am going to, I'm going to scan this, resize it slightly in Photoshop, which I'm not going to put on camera because that would be me moving the entire setup. I'm going to put this buddy here. Everyone should be looking at my boards. Uh, let's get some painter tape so everything sticks. I should get like a little card that says scanner. Maybe I'll do that. So it's uh, people understand exactly what's happening when I'm uh, not on camera and I'm doing crap stuff like this. And this would be the benefit. I do this with other artists going forward. Suddenly it's like, you know, you can look at what the other guy's doing while I'm off scanning. Um, so let's let's hope that uh, next time I do this, I corral a few of my buddies into joining me. 
That's how it played today. Oh no. I get somebody to join me so you can actually look at someone else's beautiful work while I'm off camera or they're off camera. Oh, this new Twitch drawing is on my skin. Okay, I got the brand new Epson Workforce 7840 because my other printer and scanner died a horrible death. Uh, and I'm very happy. It's like the first time I bought a new scanner printer in. I want to say nine or 10 years. And I am very, very, very happy with both the scanning and print quality. And this is not a paid advertisement. This is the Epson Workforce WF7840. Look it up. It's a very, very solid all-in-one unit. I'm very happy with it. Uh, let's see here. Import. We have support. Start. Okay. Uh, custom settings, because that's what I do. Um, All right, scan it. So at some point, I'm going to have a better setup when I can actually show what I'm doing on my desktop, but not not today. Um, so what I've done is I, I anything I'm going to draw with, I scan at a minimum of 300 DPI. Um, and uh, a lot of times I'm just lazy. I don't change the settings from one thing to another. So I just scanned a finished inked piece, and I scan everything I do in ink at 600 DPI. Um, so I'm scanning the pencil drawing at 600 DPI because, you know, lazy and speed. And um, Okay, so yeah, okay, it scanned up quite nicely. Put the settings to get a slightly darker line work, and I jump over to curves. People who know Photoshop will know exactly what I'm doing just by describing. Go to curves. I move the uh, dark point a little bit further in so I get a nice dark line quality. And I move the white point in um, about halfway through the first box on the right to really get the white. Pops, so I don't even get a lot of grays or anything. Um, in the editing thing, sorry, the, uh, the image thing, I, I just turn it into black and white so it gets rid of any sort of floating color. Um, but then before I, I do, do, do. yeah, so I gotta make this a little bit smaller. So image size. Like this. Two, five. 300. Yeah, I think this is going to work a lot better at that size. So you oversize the top. So it's 11. So if this centers, it'll be half inch, half inch. Okay, that works. I don't, I don't want to muck with that. Now, when I print in black and white, I used to do all the things where I put a new layer, a color layer on, drop in my favorite light blue, and um, that would that would how I print. Now I go to hue saturation. Uh, I set the hue to 180, which is a blue. I change the saturation to 100, percent and I do the lightness at about somewhere between 80 and 85 depending on whether or not um, uh, I need to see the blue easily. So like it's like preliminary work and I just want to redraw it on light blue paper. Or if I'm inking, I'll put it at the higher end. So it'll be like 83 to 85 there. Uh, so print this. Yeah, I like how that there. Print settings, make sure I'm using red paper, number 12, card stock. All right, print. And I, I got to tell you, the thing I love about this new printer I got, I, I just got it two months ago. It is the fastest, fastest printer I've ever had for printing art quality uh, artboards. So it prints on cardstock incredibly quickly where I'd, I'd be waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, this thing is pretty much, you're going to hear a beep in like a second. There we go, it's done. Can you see the blue? There, there's that 
super light blue of the drawing I just did. Now it's on the, this is, I think this is Canson um, and it's plate. I, I generally draw in vellum a lot, um, but I have some a nice plate and I figure for the line quality on this piece, I want um, a slicker surface. So then the, uh, I can, I can do stuff with it. I can do stuff with it. Um, the other piece of might be drawing in this later this week. I saw I won't get this, let this get dirty. And up there. Time to start inking. Now, uh, someone asked me about the uh, pens I use. Uh, I use a large variety of inking tools. But these are my favorites. Um, in terms of markers, I am a big fan of the Rotring. See here. That's right. The Rotring Tiki Graphic uh, liquid ink markers. So they are a marker, uh, but the ink inside is like in a, in a reservoir. It's not sitting in a sponge, slowly getting pulled through the felt tip. It's actually liquid in there, so it actually flows more freely. So yeah, I go through the pens a little bit faster than the old microns, but the ink quality is richer and darker in this. So I, I, these, these are why I like these. Um, however, I all, I've been a fan of liquid ballpoints, uh, liquid ballpoint pens for a very long time, ever since I saw the Pentel V5. But I recently saw these online and I tried them and I fell in love with them. So this is the Oto graphic liner. It's 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 just a ballpoint steel tip ballpoint pen. It might be tungsten carbide ball. I don't know. They all have these fancy things. But it is also a liquid ink ballpoint. So the ink flows incredibly freely through these. So I have these. Um, and Derek Robertson turned me on to these. These are my favorite little uh, brush pens uh, in terms of markers. Uh, it's a Uni Pin Fine Line. And it's a pigment-based ink, and it is like if you can. Oh, there we go. Uh, is that getting in the focus? There we go. Nice focus. And it's a uh, sponge point uh, brush pen, and you get incredible line quality, uh, and you can go really, really thick. Uh, and it's a pigment ink, so it 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 uh, it's it's just great. I love it. So if I want to do like chunky brush work, like without pulling out the brush, which I have brushes, uh, I grab one of these. Uh, what else do I use on a regular basis? Um, I use a lot of Posca uh, markers, paint markers. And what I like about this, it's an, it's an acrylic water-based ink. I can get like really, really super coarse, scratchy lines that drop out because it's paint. And it's, so if it's not loaded, I get these like very degraded lines. But I also get these nice opaque areas. I get the ink flowing really heavy, and I can do like really nice black areas. And white ink from a gel pen or another paint marker, when this is fully dry, sits better on that than it does over inks. Inks get absorbed into the paper, so the paper is still ready to be absorbent to uh, white paint media on top of it. Whereas this this makes the surface a little less absorbent. It it kind of like seals up the surface a bit. So your white lines will sit on a Posca or any other, like over India ink, if I wanted to use India ink, but I'm lazy, so I have pens. And, uh, oh, you know what? I need to show that. I don't know when or if I'm going to be able to do this this weekend, but I was watching um, at that stream with Jeff Johnson, Dan Panosian. Uh, um, oh, God, I'm blanking. They haven't done it for a while. They were doing regular Thursday night uh, draw sessions. But I think we're in con season. So anyway, I saw Dan Panosian using this massive chisel tip Sharpie. And I ordered, now they have them up here in Canada, but I ordered them from uh, Blick in the U.S. to get a bunch. And I love, I love the effects I can get. I can get like this very, very almost dry brush effect by just lightly stroking. Or I can just like chunkily fill in blacks. With again, this is um, a water-based, uh, essentially an acrylic. I think I'm, I've never tried to re-wet it. I should try and re-wet it because I just use it the way I use it. 
but letting this fully dry the white from a white paint marker or white pen pen sits in that so in terms of white paint i use a lot of like fine line white poscas unfortunately i go through them very quickly because the paint does dry because the tip's so small but um that sits on and i don't want to press too hard because the, the black's not fully dried and the crushing disappointment when i pull up, pull up like one of these white ink ball points and they sometimes they work amazing i get this incredible like white line quality and sometimes they're dead i i think there was a video where i saw travis charay he pulled one of these out and it just dropped white paint like uh, sorry, uh, white ink perfectly it just it just fell out of the pen it was like oh my god and i have never had that experience i've never had a white pen jelly roll that just just gave up the ink they're all like you know stubborn little bastards saying no no i don't like you you don't deserve to have oh there, there, there we go that, that shows up you can see that little scribble so that's about as, as best a flow i can get out of any of these ball points they don't last very long for me so i generally buy them in bulk uh and when they die i toss them and, and curse i'll try not to swear too much um what else do i use a lot here that i might be using tonight? All right. Okay. So this is this is the thing I've been using for uh, a long time. You can get the Pentel pocket brush, but this is a nice um, metal one, metal uh, brush pen where I fill with uh, platinum carbon fountain pen ink, so it doesn't clog up the brush too much. So it doesn't go anywhere near as black as say the Pentel or anything. But for scan quality, it, it's it's pretty good. And if you just do two coats, you you get like a, a reasonable black. So I, uh, when I do brush work, like hair and stuff like that, I'll often be using this because it's just, it's just a great, real, real natural hair bristle brush. And it always has a nice point and it's always ready. So this is not the Pentel pocket brush. This is a slightly high-end brass one. And I think it's a Pentel. I got it off of Jet Pens. Um, I love this one. But... The recent thing is I, I, I've had one of these. It's a Pentel color brush. And I bought it. I went, oh, my God. So it's like just a squeeze brush. But I hated the ink inside it. It was, I think the first time I used it, I used it on a Marvel, one of the early Marvel sketch covers. And to this day, I don't think the ink is fully dry. It had the weirdest shiniest tackiest black ink of any any tool i ever bought and so it just sat there in my art drawer you know uh, as a disappointment until i saw a video where someone basically took the pen apart cleaned out the parts inside the squeeze chamber where all the ink is stored okay and put their own ink in it and uh so i did that with this and right now what's in this is a mix of cheap fountain pen ink and some acrylic black uh ink <clears throat> and the reason why i do that fountain pen ink keeps it from really drying too much in here and the acrylic black ink gives me more opacity and somehow the combination makes it a little bit more matte but it still can be a little chicken th uh chick thick and chunky not a chicken thunky um and i can get almost like very very coarse brushy effects which I like. I like to be able to build texture with this brush, or I can like load it up. You have to squeeze it a bit, let the ink kind of. Oh, it's fine. Can you see that? There we go. Go here. Yeah, you see the bubbles there. That's side effect of this, but I can get nice, nice thick black areas, and then I can get, go to dry brush really quickly. So this is an incredibly versatile brush tool for in my kit. Whereas I normally pull out um a flat synthetic and i would uh have a little reservoir of black ink i dip it and i'd use it on a side piece of ink which i might end up doing this weekend and then so i could do a dry brush so it's a lot of prep work for a dry brush whereas this one almost right after taking the cap off i can get this nice textural dry brush and i can actually get a point on it by just twisting it and then i can get like points to dry brush which is which is really handy so it becomes um, I think any artist, they develop a, a repertoire of tools that make specific marks 
as soon as they pick them up. And so that's, that's, that's my, my reservoir. I got um, markers and, and liquidating ball points that essentially do the same thing in terms of line work, but there's, there's a way I want to approach putting the line down and the ball point does it a certain way, which is different from the marker. A marker can be a little more dry brushy. Let me pick up a thicker one here. Uh, do I have a point three? Here's a point three. So the liquidating road train, uh, if I roughly, sorry, lightly uh, draw the tip across, I can get almost an invisible line. I can get, I'm leaving almost a ghost of, can you even see that? Yeah. Let me flip to the camera, see if it'll focus. So you can see these little scribbles that I, I barely put there. Can't really do that effectively with the liquid ink ballpoint. You can do it with a traditional gel ballpoint, but I also get these rich black lines just by putting a little bit of pressure into it. But I can also go from there to like, let them drift off into like nothing. But the liquid ink ballpoint, um, I just get a nice, beautiful, consistent um, flat line. It's a deadline. Uh, if I really wanted that that true sense of a classic drawing with a nib, I'd pull out a nib. I have uh, dip pens I don't use very often, um, but I do use them. If I want that kind of like traditional um, dip pen line that has like a lot of shape and quality. But instead of that, what I do is I take the, the brush pen and because it's a fine point, I can actually, too early in the day for me to actually get like a really good line, good line quality with this. But I can actually go from like super fine. I can do like consistent rendering that has like some belly to it. And it still has a very much of a sense of a pen line. So this is this type of little cluster of like thick bellied lines would be something I used to use a, a, a crow quill, like a hunt 102 or something to drop the line down on. Anyway, that's me talking about my ink tools before I start inking. Let me let me pour some liquid down my throat because my throat's getting a little dry. Hey, all right. I uh, just saw someone posted in the chat. JC Dragon 81, good morning. Uh, only doing this for oh, about an hour and a half already? No. Is time flying that fast? I think it is. Um, I should talk about it. I'm planning, I, even though I started about 10 minutes late, um, just a little tech snap as I'm as I'm learning. This is the first time I'm doing an event like this. Um, I'm every two hours are going to take about 15 minutes. Um, and so uh, at, at around, I guess, 11 o'clock my time, uh, I'm going to take a little 15 minute break. I'll put up a sign saying I'll be back at such and such a time. And then two hours from that, I'm going to take a half hour for like a lunch. And then I'll uh, come back, draw for another two hours, 15 minute break, let my throat recover. Um, and then I'll draw to the end of uh, the first day of C2E2 and we'll celebrate our first day of C2E2 at home. Oh, I just noticed. Uh, live streaming actually has a running clock. So we've been doing this for one hour, 23 minutes and 58, 59, one hour and 24 minutes. Okay. Um, oh, your glasses. I will do a lot of my, okay, so I don't need prescription glasses, but I'm getting old. So I, I'm using readers um, when I draw, but I find when I'm doing like the initial pencil drawing, um, I don't mind the little bit of blurry vision. It allows me just to see the overall shape as opposed to the details when I'm doing like a planning drawing. But when I'm inking, I want I want my glasses. I want to see with a certain amount of precision uh, what the lines I'm putting down look like. So I am going to start this. First off, make sure there's no graphite. No, you know. Part of the benefit of being a mixed media artist, because I do a lot of watercolor and gouache and stuff like that, and also use some airbrush. I have these squeeze bottles with some water just sitting here in my in my studio. So before where I take a break, I'd go walk, go to the, uh, a sink and I'd wash my hand to make sure there's no graphite on my hand when I'm about to ink something so I'm not smudging everything. I can literally put a little bit of water 
and a paper towel, which I have a lot of in my studio because again, watercolor gouache and everything and you know, cleaning up ink spills. I can literally just make sure there's no leftover pigment or anything on my hand before I start inking. It just means I don't leave my studio as much as I should. It's a sad life. All right, so I'm gonna start with uh, point one, Oto graphic liner. This is not the fine. I have uh, three uh, values of pen I use more frequently. So this is the point, sorry, the zero one. Uh, for a chunkier line, I will use a three. For super fine detail stuff, like for, if I'm in there drawing faces, eyes and stuff like, especially in smaller figures, I got a zero, zero, five. So this is the finest line uh, I will use in these in this line of Oto ballpoints. They do have a, a much larger range of uh, pens available, but those are the ones I order in bulk. And I do the same thing with the. <laughs> let's put let's get this on camera. So um, I order most of my pens from a store called Cult Pens in the UK. A lot of people in North America should order from Jet Pens. Uh, in the U.S., but uh, international shipping is 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 a bear, and Cult Pens offers um, everything, pretty much everything that Jet Pens offers, but from uh, the U.K., which is actually cheaper for, for me to get in Canada. So I'll order my road train tickies in bulk, and then uh, I'll open up the pen because they have those you know display things to sell the pens. I'll just tape them together, and they're sitting there, so I can literally grab. Uh, my pen as needed. So it's like I'm stocked up for a, at least a couple of days. Um, but uh, yeah, no, this is this is this this will last me four to six months, uh, depending on how many pages I'm making. Uh, if I'm just doing like and right now, I'm doing a lot of covers. I, I got this great 10 page I'm in the middle of uh, for Ahoy. I can't talk about other than that. Um, that if, doing sequential pages, I burn through a lot of pens. Covers, not so much. Uh, cause it's just one, one image and somehow everything just seems to use less resources that way. Um, but yeah, so I, I buy those in bulk. I also, here we go. Did I pull that? Here we go. Here's a whole bunch of the Otos also done taped together. These are, these are all just point one, uh, uh zero ones. Poscas I buy in bulk. There's a there's a, a an existential dread. Uh, talk to any artist who's been working for uh, for it has, it has to be over a period of time. Um, it's 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 something that's experienced more so by artists who came before me. Um, but even like I I finished college in '89, so I've been working. I started working my last year of college, but I've been working as a professional since '89 till now. So that's 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 not a short period of time. Over those decades, so many of the materials I loved using, and, and it's like they became like integral to like how I how, how I approached drawing everything. It's like oh, this pen does this for me, so I need this pen to do that. And then you know the company gets bought by another company, and that new company no longer produces that pen, or they change how they make that pen. And it's it's crushing. Um, so I developed a habit of like, if I like something, I buy a lot of it. I'll I'll happily drop two three hundred dollars on a marker I like, so I can use it for a long time, and have it in bulk in case something happens and they stop manufacturing that pen or marker or brush or whatever. It's um, my friend Howard Chaikin. Where did I put that? Oh, I, I put it in a safe spot because I don't want to risk damaging it. There is a parallel rolling ruler that isn't made anymore. It's uh, You might have seen them. It's like a ruler. It's got a little bar that's got a little two rubber wheels so you can actually move it up and down. It's got a little grip point so you can hold it. It's it's a really fast, easy way to do a lot of parallel lines instead of like sliding you know, your set square up and down on your drawing table. You just have this wonderful little device that does it for you. Um, he found out they were going out of business that, uh, or they weren't going to be made anymore. So he went and bought a box full and he gifted one to me. And it is, it's, it's a tool I never got to use until Howard gave it to me. So, I mean, that uh, whole level of like 
we always we always try to have our ear to the art supply supply line to know if something we like might be going out of manufacture or might be changing. And it happens with pens, it happens with papers, uh, it happens with brushes, it happens with paints. Uh, Joe Jusco um, was on Facebook. He was talking about how Liquitex stopped producing uh, cadmium pigments. And he lucked out and he found in a little out of nowhere art supply shop that had some. And immediately I knew the joy uh, of, of finding that lost treasure, that, 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 that item you, you, you loved using. And then, you know, it, suddenly it's gone. I mean, that is, that's part of the tragedy of being uh, an artist in this, in this time is so much of the stuff that we learned how to make art with is commercially non-viable to some of these com uh, companies that buy other art supply companies. And um, it's a tragedy, man. It's a tragedy. So you should, you know, whenever you see an artist who's, who's looking really, really sad, it's not because we're artists that we're sad. It's because the stuff that allows us to be artists is just getting harder and harder to come by. So buy us drinks. Uh, <laughs> If you see us in a bar and we're sad, no, it's entirely about art supplies. Nothing else. Nothing else in our life ever gets sad. It's always the art supplies getting discontinued. Um, I'm sure someone might disagree, and they're wrong. God, don't take me seriously on that. Um, although I'm, I am a little bit serious. It, it is heartbreaking when um, a material that you 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 learned how to make work for you in a very specific way is no longer available. Um, when I was in art school, pelican gouache was in these glass jars was the perfect stuff to have if you if you worked in gouache. The pigments were strong. I mean, it was gouache, so it's not like super high end pigment to begin with. But um, those jars, you, they could your paint could dry to a bone in terms of like just no moisture at all. Throw some water in the jar, seal it up, shake it, let it sit for a week. And suddenly it's, it's, it's almost as good as new. Um, I think Pelican was bought by, was it either bought by a Japanese or a German company? I want, I want to think, I think it was bought by a Japanese company. And almost immediately all those pigments were gone. Uh, it, it, almost immediately in the sense of like my experience of like, oh, maybe I should buy a couple more jars. And um then I think I ran out of uh, magenta. I went to get more and they're like, nope, not, not. And I think this is just like six months later, gone. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking, I tell you. I'd love, I wonder, I, I know other creative industries like photography, like certain films will no longer be manufactured. Um, graphic design, there's tools that have been completely replaced by the computer. Uh, I think there was a website for a while that was like the uh, Museum of uh, Forgotten Art Supplies and things like the waxer were no longer around. And a waxer, yeah, you don't need a waxer. Now, what a waxer would be, uh, it, it, you would take a photostat or a uh, piece of uh, type that was printed out by the early computers. So you'd have like print ready type and you'd need to put it in a layout uh, in imposition so it could be photostatted again for print. And you want to be able to, so you wouldn't have to use rubber cement, you'd use a waxer. And what it is, you take your photostat, run it through the waxer, and it put an incredibly thin layer of sticky wax on the back of this, this, this photostat. And then you could apply, move it, and reapply and everything because the wax was just sticky enough to do the job uh, of temporarily putting things in place. And and that was like this this wonderful. It had a wonderful smell to it too, like this this warm wax smell. And it's gone because no one needs it. But every once in a while, I go, damn, I I kind of like this job I'm doing by hand. I, I a waxer would make it ideal. You're never gonna find them. I think I think there's a, there's been a recent trend where writers have been using typewriters again. Not just they, they just they just like the idea of a typewriter. So I, I've seen that there's there's actually stores selling typewriters 
again, refurbished typewriters or, or typewriters that were never used, uh, stuff like that. And I think there's a little bit of that. that this tool, this bygone tool, it's no longer manufactured. And it just creates a different sensation when you're when you're making something. I think I think that's where writers get that. I think I think the return of the moleskin sketchbook or uh, and notebook, these quality little notebooks that uh, writers and journalists and everything used to rely on in a bygone age, um, are are back, and they're back partly because of nostalgia, but also because it's like the products went away because the assumption was that that that. The people out there, I mean people, everyone, uh, writers, just just people who like having notebooks, didn't want nice things. The, that, uh, the idea of a moleskin sketchbook um, being a high-end, high-quality paper little notebook that you could take notes in when you had a cell phone that could do it or, or uh, a tablet PC that you just carried in your pocket, that there were unnecessary things. But it's like... No, I think I think as we go through into a more modern age, and every age is more modern than the last, apart from like you know, morals and social skills and all that stuff. Um, those are the things; those tactile experiences, those 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 things of value, become more important to us. There's um, oh god, I'm having a Star Trek memory. Um, when you watch like a Star Trek episode and they pull out a book. And they're reading a book. I think I think there was um, one of the early movies with uh, Shatner and Nimoy and everything. I think he was given a copy of uh, I think Wrath of Khan. I think he was given a copy of Moby Dick. And, and if you know the movie, you know exactly why Moby Dick is is the one they 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 draw on for this. Um, and the idea that a book is a gift in like the 24th century. I can't remember the exact century. God, I'm, someone's going to revoke my Trekkie card. Um, no, I, th- I I don't think the tactile experiences of certain creative elements like books and notebooks and tools making marks on paper, I think that is a very real experience that people are going to want to cling to. It's like, yeah, I've drawn, I, I got a, uh, a drawing screen, a drawing monitor in my studio. Um, I happily use it to do digital color on all my uh, most of my comics work, but I got to tell you, I love painting on paper. I like using real pigment on paper. Um, there's a Batman piece I started. Oh, I was going to start the stream off with working on that. I'll, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. Maybe I'll start off by finishing off that Batman piece here. Um, so I really want to do a little bit of color work on here instead of just all pen and ink. Um, I think that experience of using traditional materials on traditional surfaces and not being able to hit control Z all the time is, is, is an important aspect of, of us being human. It's also why I think long-term it's, I, AI art is going to do a lot of damage um, long-term, even, even though it looks like, you know, a lot of companies are realizing the, the, the moral, ethical, and legal problems with uh, those algorithm image generators. Um, it's not going to stop people from making art. It's just going to make it harder for people to make a living at making art, um, which which is kind of weird. Um, if, you, if you were following it at all, and it, it's increasingly an embarrassment for the people who are aggressively pro uh, AI image generators. And uh, I'm going to digress in my digression. Um, when they call it AI art, it's a lie. We do not have artificial intelligence yet. We're nowhere near there yet. Um, best scientists say we're like 50 years away from actual AI. And I've actually seen, actually, yes, there we go. I've seen people who defended the quality of these algorithm image generator programs as if they were children. Say, well, AI is very young. And it's like, of course, they don't fully understand like what they're doing. And it's, I'm going, you you understand it's it's not intelligent. And the guy didn't 
want to concede that point. He thought we were living in the early stages of 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 the singularity, as it were. We're we're, we're about to see artificial intelligence promulgate a, across all the whole spectrum, and it's like, dude, that's decades away. If if it ever happens, I mean, I think everyone's assuming because of science fiction that we are going to have artificial intelligence at some point, and I'm not fully convinced we will. I mean. I have seen scientists predicting um, essentially immortality uh, since the 70s. They were saying it was like 10, 20 years away, from, we, we won't have cancer anymore. 10, 20 years from now, uh, people won't die of old age. 10, 20 years from now, this won't happen, that won't happen, the other, this, that, and more. And um, here we are, you know, 2023, we still have cancer. We still have people dying of old age. Uh, we just had a massive pandemic and we got people you know, arguing that the the science solution that we have for it is dangerous, um, dude. We're we're nowhere near the point ready or able to deal with uh, real artificial intelligence. And luckily, we're at, at best thirty to fifty, maybe seventy years away from that ever happening. But um, even if that does come around, even if we solve all the legal hurdles and get through all the problems of what what it does to give over creativity to a machine, um, there's still going to be people who are going to want to take a pen and put it on paper and make marks and do the best they can to communicate visually with someone else with traditional art tools. I, I don't think that's that's gonna go away. Um, and I'm, I'm glad of it. I, I wanna keep drawing. I don't, I think at some point I would like to not have to like, you know, stress, I have to do this much drawing to pay my bills. I have to do this much drawing to pay for my retirement. I would like to draw for just the draw, the joy of drawing and painting at some point. And um, because I do this cause I love it and which doesn't mean I, I do it for free, but I mean, I do this because I love it, even though I could do other things for more money. That makes more sense. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, vinyl making, there we go. Um, yeah, I think, I think there is, yeah, just a well-done algorithm, yeah. I, I think the resurgence of vinyl is very much uh, part and parcel of that quasi nostalgia drive that humans always seem to have. I, I think we love old things um, partially because it actually brings us back to where we were when we first encountered them. Um, I think I think vinyl. I, I saw someone uh, who did a very, very, very detailed breakdown on that vinyl sound quality. It, all, all the things that people say that vinyl has, like it's a warmer sound, it's a fuller sound. Um, there's no actual evidence of it. And that's not to in any way dismiss someone who loves vinyl. But what the reason they're, lo they're coming up with reasons for why they love vinyl that don't exist. When all they have to do is say, I love playing music on vinyl. And that's all of the reason or excuse you need to, to buy um, a classic vinyl record player, buy classic vinyl records. You love playing things on vinyl, more power to you. There's a market that allows you to do it. Um, you don't need excuses like the sounds better because it isn't. You don't need excuses that... Um, <clears throat> that music produced on vinyl is somehow better because it isn't. Um, what is important is, is that you enjoy playing music on vinyl and you should play music on vinyl if that's, if that's what you want to do. Um, so that's, that's my take on it. I think, I think uh, we should let people do what they want to do if it's not hurting anyone. And they don't have to come up with bullshit reasons to, uh, ooh, I think that's the first time I swore today. Um, they don't have to come up with reasons that don't bear out to justify it. I, if, if, if I enjoyed vinyl record, I had a, a, a nice vinyl record collection and I just enjoyed playing it. 
that is justification in and of itself enough uh, for me to continue to. I don't need to. I don't think anyone should be forced to come up with weird justifications for why they like doing things they like doing. If it makes them feel good, let them do it. I'm pretty good at blathering when it comes to making sure there's no dead air in this. I, I, I'll just keep talking nonstop, although I, I am going to have to drink again sometime soon. Okay, um, so you can see how I'm building tone. Um, I, I'm doing a lot of cross hatching. This is what I really like about uh, if I was doing this with a dip pen, not only would I have to be more careful with every single line to make sure they're, they're hitting a level, and I can do that, I've done it. Uh, but it's a much slower process. Um, whereas with this, I can I can aggressively approach uh, the tones with adding textures and cross hatching without waiting for the next layer of ink to dry and not worry about the actual tip because those Hunt 102s are very sharp, tearing the surface of the pen, which is far more likely with um, the drop in quality of modern art papers. I mean, it used to be, I was very lucky. Uh, my, I, I was visiting my friend, Mark Shanebloom in Montreal in the very early eighties. And he had some then already starting to go out the door, DC paper. And it was really toothy. It's, it's surface was so toothy. It was almost like sandpaper. I could use it to polish something. That's how hard the surface of this DC paper was. <clears throat> and he gave me a couple sheets of it. And uh, I ended up doing uh, one or two assignments. I think I ended up doing some spot illustrations. So I ended up cutting the paper in half so I could do both spot illustrations. And the amount of abuse I could do to those papers, I didn't, I didn't, you know, abuse them, but it's like I was drawing with like a dip pen. And uh, despite the scratchiness of traditional dip pens on our artboard, there was not one bit of, of uh, surface damage to the paper. It, it took all these, these lines and it crossed hat, uh, the cross hatching on it went, went down beautifully. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing paper. And already, apparently at that point, DC was phasing that paper out because Strathmore wasn't making it. It was, it was just this beautiful, super durable uh, Strathmore 500 vellum finish. Um, and it's like, they don't make it anymore, man. And it, it's not a point where like some other paper company came up and said, like, you know, we're going to, we're going to fill the niche because uh, paper, paper manufacturing is not a cheap, not a cheap thing. So if you're going to manufacture paper, you have to do it in volume and you have to sell in the volume to make it worthwhile. So I'm going very dark. I'm using this as my primary reference point for the bore at this point. I'm probably going to go in with some white paint when I'm done all this to add some like more some hair textures. But you can see I'm using the the cross hatching. And when I cross hatch, a lot of people think traditional cross hatching is you have to go that direction, then you have to immediately go that direction, which is cross hatching. But this is hatching too. This, this is actually hatching. Parallel lines is hatching. Cross hatching is when they overlay. Yeah, cross hatching. Um, and I like putting layer on layer of ink in just slightly different directions. And all I'm really doing is is I'm creating a, a sense of texture, and I'm reducing the white, but I'm also doing it in a way where I'm reducing the white in almost random shapes. And I'm a big believer that. Um, Art's more interesting when you have like a more organic natural shape happening um, as you develop your values and tones and everything. Yeah. Okay, I, li I like where, where this is developing. Hard to believe this is <laughs> a Marvel character who looks like a cast off from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But this is this is where I'm going with it, baby. I'm sticking with it. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah. 
Um, looking at JC Dragon 81. I enjoy the experience of looking at a cover, putting it in, starting the music, that little crackle before the music. Oh, yeah. There's all these things, these all these nostalgia triggers. I mean, I really miss. There used to be um, these books that would, that would collect uh, the best album cover art of a year. So it's a big photo book of nothing but album art cover art and done in the shape of an album. Um, I don't think I have one in my studio, so I can't go grab it. I, I think I have a couple still. Um, and you could look at these really big, beautifully designed images that were album covers. And uh, as is, I mean, it's like they get, they would put them on cassettes. So there'd be a little like, you know, two and a half by four inch little versions of the album cover. And then you know, CDs were a little bit better because they were like, you know, four by four inch uh, versions of the album cover. But reducing the size of the image meant that the album cover art became so much less important to selling an album. And you, and you think about some of the classic, uh, I mean, just think about Richard Corbin's cover from Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell. If you couldn't see that on the 12 by 12 album cover, you you couldn't understand the sheer majesty of, of that image. That was just such a crazy, crazy album cover. And I have to think, I have to think that um, that album cover was a big part of that album's success because it was so bonkers, so good. I mean, it was just Corbin at his peak that guy riding a motorcycle and just like just bursting out of hell it's like oh my god it's 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 incredible i'm having a nostalgia kick without even seeing the image uh i'm just thinking about that and going oh my god that was so good i mean i, th I think meatloaf passed away didn't he oh okay yeah yeah those i think i think the books were put out by the same company that did the studio. I think I think I think that was Roger Dean's. God, my memory is not what it used to be. But I think I think the uh, the publishing company that did the studio also did those album art covers. I think yeah, you know. Uh, I think you have like a bit of a scowl happening here. Play that nostril a bit. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, it got to get some sense of that head sitting inside that mask. Sorry, every once in a while I have to focus on the drawing. <laughs> Yeah, objects coming towards you are usually a little tricky, especially if they curve to get the sense of them coming out. So you got to pull tricks out in terms of line weight and all that stuff to make it work. Hopefully I'm pulling it off. I want to. 
and I'm doing all this line work. So far, I think, apart from a little bit of the uh, the uni brush pen, just to get some thicker lines in there a bit, everything I've been building so far has been with the one ballpoint pen. And I like it. His teeth in the in the mounted head look like hell. I, I bet I bet without looking it up, I bet that uh, boars, these are teeth that just continually grow uh, like some animals have, and uh, they use this to like dig up the earth um, when they're like rooting for, I don't know, truffles, maybe boars like truffles. Um, yeah. Oh my God, these things, oh my God, just being bitten by this would be like a nightmare, wouldn't it? Although, okay, this is this is a digression. It just made me think about just because of how terrible the teeth are in this. I read an article about someone who survived being attacked by a hippopotamus. Now, a hippopotamus, there's no way, there's no way you can look at a hippopotamus and think they don't look goofy. I mean, they look like a a vaguely alien grimace from the old McDonald's uh, um, mascot team. Um, but as soon as it opens its mouth and you look at what's happening in its mouth and you realize how freaking big a hippo is, you go, that is terrifying. And I read an article, it's still, it's still online, about a guy who was attacked by a hippo. And at one point he realized he was fully in the mouth of the hippo. And being in the mouth of the hippo, what was keeping him from drowning. Um, I, I think he ended up losing an arm, but he survived the attack. And um, the man, because I think I think a hippo might have the strongest jaws of any animal on earth. And it's got those massive, massive teeth that look like the teeth that look like, you know, like a, a adult man's arm is like, that's how big those teeth are. Oh, yeah. And, and it's like, there's people were joking about feral hogs. And my first thought was, it's like, like people are joking about feral hogs because the idea of like pigs as being dangerous is alien to most people who, whose closest experience of a pig is watching Babe adventure in the city or eating bacon. Um, look at, look at these teeth. Look at, the, look at those tusks. Um, there's a reason why when you were boar hunting, you went out in a group back in the middle ages. Um, there's a reason why people want their heavy duty rifles if they live in rural areas where there are feral hogs. Um, you, you need a reasonable high powered rifle to take one of these, what are they, like 300, 500 pound monstrosities who are, who are like, despite weighing that much, they're actually incredibly lean and muscular and fast. These things get, these things will kill you. Um, yeah, rant over. Anyway, scary animals, scary teas. Uh, How are we doing time wise? Oh, we're almost coming up on a 15 minute break for me. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this part, get a sense of how I want to render the far side. There's a, there's a lot of different ways you can make something recede. You can either do um, a, a sense of aerial perspective where I could just draw this tusk, this side of the jaw under here lighter and just kind of like have the sense that it's fading away from like the heavier line work of what's coming on over here. Or I can, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the shadow of being inside the mouth all the way through here. And then I'm going to pull that shadow up on the underside of the tusk. Allow that just the way it kind of fades out behind the really dark part of the snow here. 
that creates the idea that that is that is receding away in space. So there's light hitting the tusk over there. There's all the shadow. I'm, I'm going to be shading the interior, like the face inside here. So that's going to be uh, much darker. And it's going to, and it's also going to help make this tusk pop forward. Yeah, I think I saw. I don't think I want to start rendering that face yet. I want to get a better sense of like what the value like of the hair coming around here, um, the way that the lip of the jaw comes around here. I think I'm going to go really dark here too. Here I am doing it, saying doing exactly what I said I was going to do. Try and get a sense that there's hair and like stubble in the bottom part of the jaw. I want a sense of like, okay, his neck's going to be in there, but there's hair coming down to the bust. And I think I'm going to make this go from black. And this is, this is actually something I don't think you can effectively do with a dip pen. See the way I'm just doing these like stupidly fine, fast lines here? The cross hatching, but I'm moving at such speed that the ink's not coming out at full, full flow here. I'm getting finer lines from this ballpoint than I would if I drew. Like if I draw slowly, I get a line that thick. But if I draw fast, the line breaks up a little bit and ends up being a little thicker, thinner. So I can still build to the same values, but I get a much finer build of of the line work there. I can also go lighter like what how i made the line work lighter here uh even though he's gonna have like he's got this he's got this massive body let put this back up over here he's got this massive body so that the other shoulder is going to be like over here so just to imply that the torso goes over there i'm going to bring the lines like that all right uh, we're a little over two hours i'd like to take a little 15 minute break rest my throat a bit um, what should I do here? Let me pull out my bag. Um, hmm. Actually, I know what I'm going to do. Take a piece of a very small paper from somewhere. I mean, I see they're completely surrounded by paper, and I want to paint that by level sheet, and can I find one? No, not not something that. Yeah. Put right out of my printer. Okay, almost two o five. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come back at. 220. Don't want to risk damaging that. See if this is thick enough. That's legible. I'll grab another piece of it's showing up. All right, I'm gonna grab another piece of painter's tape. I have so many rolls of painter's tape in my studio. Um again, I use it. I haven't used it yet, but I use it actually use it a lot in my pen and ink work. Um, I use it a lot in my painting work, of course. Um there we go. Ah, I am going to go actually finish eating something. I'll be back in 15 minutes. I wonder if I can mute this in the meantime. Mute. All right, cool. So I'll be back at 2.20. See you guys soon.
All right, I'm back. Um, I didn't take the pack. Oh, yeah. I Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I see that there was a bit of a hiccup. I'm learning a bit of a hiccup posting the link that I thought I was going live with versus the link I'm actually live with. So uh, I did a little correction on that. I threw a little bit more ice in my drink so I can soothe my throat as I chatter nonstop through this day. Um, um, so, yeah, let's let's. Let's get back to working on Razor uh, Razorback here. Um, oh, if you ch click the hamburger menu on the post, you can change that the URL. I don't know what my friend means by the hamburger menu, but I think I'm just gonna keep going. Um, oh. Uh, JC Dragon has seen an angry hog. That was insane. I would imagine. I would. I would imagine that seeing like one of these monstrosities bearing down on you would be a um, uh, a pants changing event. Um, it's it's you've, I've seen the action movies where it's like your hero sees a hog in the jungle and he, he needs to eat something. And he somehow manages to jump on the back of the the wild pig and kill it with a stick. I don't think that would happen. I don't. I think that's about as likely as like someone wrestling an alligator and killing it. Uh, I think there are certain creatures that are so far beyond what what humans are physically capable of posing one on one that uh, they're great fictional things. I think a single wild boar versus your usual unarmed even athletic guy is, is going to um, pound that guy into the mud. Um, uh, we, there's a reason why boar hunters would, would go out in groups with like special boar spears uh, and armor. And there'd be a bunch of them. And I think, I think they even had like um, special boar shield that they would drive into the ground and and put the spear over it so like the boar could run into the shield and it would still drive the guy with the spear back but it, it would protect him from you know having you know his legs shredded or his intestines spread all over the uh the the ground um yeah what a way to go man that would be a terrifying way to go um, yeah, I'm pulling this brush out. Um, I just want some kind of like rough, but thick, textury brush strokes in here. So I'm going to render over top of this, but this is me putting that, putting down essentially um, a value and a texture as much as lines. Uh, I'm going to let the pen work carry most of this i'm also gonna get rid of that boards here yeah it's just really really dark in there so i'm gonna go in there make that darker in there you know what here we go yeah i'm gonna bring these strokes through here so i want i want the sense of that head you know i'm gonna do i am i am i'm not gonna put the mark down here but i am gonna want to have the sense of that that helmet curving around there Yeah, that gives me a good solid base to work with with the line work here. I'm I'm, I'm going to continue working with the uh, the zero one auto graphic liner. But I'm I'm actually uh, I I got to get finish this part. Get get that sense of the shoulder there, the sense of the helmet, the back of the neck residing around there, and then I got to get that head spike, that razor on his head uh working in a way i'm not sure how dark i feel i feel like i want to give it like an edge and then let it be dark on the just on the receding edge of the support and let that 
really get across the idea that that's, that's a really super sharp, almost like a blade on top of his head. Um, and I say that without actually knowing anything about the character. I mean, I don't know. Is that, is that a blade? Um, without reading the comics, I don't know. Uh, a little bit I read, I think it was on the Marvel Wiki. He was a truck driver and he worked with another superhero. I, I can't remember which superhero it was. Helped find his sister. Um, and apparently he fell in with, um, Mangog or one of the, I, I, I and that's, that's what made me think of She-Hulk. Cause I think he is connected with the whole She-Hulk universe or a subset of the Marvel universe there. Uh, and you know what? It makes sense with like how often She-Hulk goes into the goofy and the absurd in the comics and in the TV show. Um, having a guy who's got a giant boar head as his defining feature <laughs> that makes sense. Mm, tempted to make this, yeah, I'm going to make this rounder, just a little bit rounder and let that come in. Uh, let's get this happening here on his face. I figure I if I if I blow the face, I'm just gonna start all over again. <laughs> it just won't work if if I don't get uh, this face right. So I'm gonna build some very light hatching for value here. Following the shape of the form, they can hatch to get more darkness in there. Because I mean, he's inside this mask. He's, he's he's he should be entirely in shadow. So when I'm building value like this, what I'll do is I'll use the lines I've already established a lot of times as defining areas where I'll I'll hatch into. So um, overlapping hatching won't create odd shapes in the open areas. Um, that's just, that's something I, I just learned over time to, uh, hide my limitations. There's some artists who can do these amazing lines and they just all match up when they're uh, rendering form. I'm not one of those guys. I'm a scritchy, scratchy guy. And you kind of see where all my lines go. And the development of everything. So I kind of got to use tricks to hide my shortcomings. Oh, my phone's making noises. Oh, what do you got happening here? Oh, just a whole lot of things I don't need to respond to. So I wasted your time by checking. But uh, I think that's working out. Um, what I have in my studio uh, adjacent to my drawing table is a uh, 12 by 18 mirror. And sometimes I use that to make an expression so I can like ape it for a drawing I'm working on. But sometimes I just hold the drawing up sideways like this. You can't see it like that. And I look at the reflection. So I'm immediately seeing it as twice as far away as the mirror is. 
So the mirror is about four feet away from me. So now I'm looking at it from eight feet away. And it really pulls the drawing tighter together. So I can, the mistakes really pop out when I do that. Um, so I think I got the values generally right here. I want a little bit of a... I kind of want them to fade into the shadow and the inside of the mask. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit darker here because he's, he's in that helmet. So I want him to recede into the darkness of that helmet. And I might come back in. I might do a little bit more white paint on the tip of So I got a nice heavy black line around this uh, tusk right here. Um, and it still kind of pops, but because I'm going so much darker here, I may actually want to just bring some white paint into there and just make the whole sharpness pop out of the dark. And instead of using a heavy line to make it uh, have more 3D qualities, uh, removing the line entirely might make it uh, jump out more. Yeah, that's the working theory anyway. So this is um, one of the benefits of using a liquid ink pen <clears throat> is uh, I, I, I really just, by using quick parallel lines, essentially scribbling, um, I can build these areas of tone that are out of line incredibly quickly. And it blends in really quickly with that, that a coarse brush stroke I did with the color a color brush pen with my own ink in it. And all of a sudden I have a value area in here and a darker shadow area when I cross over it, because then I can do this out of this coarse texture area, which is going to hide a lot of the line overlap. I can then focus on just having the line flow out of that core shadow towards this back edge, which is where I'm going to let the line fade a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm generally happy with the tonal value I get there, and I want a little bit more of that, that coarseness of the further show through. I jump up to the, the point 0.3, which is the chunkier pen. And then I can come out of that, the bit of brush I did here earlier, and I can hatch into that tonal area I did. And just that line quality difference gives a coarser sense to what's happening in, in the gradation of these lines here. And I can uh, and difference from essentially the line space is the same with I'm make, making a very similar line space with the point three point three zero three as the uh, zero one, but that creates much smaller white spaces between the lines. And it has a, both a value and a textural effect. And 
And doing like stuff like this allows me to almost fade the black. I, I really like, especially when I'm coloring my work, I, I'm not a, I, th I think areas of solid black have a very specific use. And, uh, but if you're doing color work, um, I want some color behind my darkest areas. I want, um, I'd want some reddish brown or some yellow ochre peeking through some of these near black areas. Uh, it, it, just that little bit, see if I can pull it out. How detail can I get here? So you can see these really, really small little bits of white in the areas that are near black. So if there's a color underneath that, it's going to poke through and it's going to create an effect of color through the darkest areas of my image. It's not going to be pure black, which only can have one value, pure black. Um, it, it allows, it colors, it colors the black without actually doing a color hold on the black, if that makes sense. And by hatching with the thicker line across the finer line, it has a wonderful effect of darkening and adding texture. And now I can, just a thicker line going into the lighter hatching earlier and it, still fades but it has that sense of like turning in space i might go back in with some finer lines after i'm also going to possibly do some white paint on top of that too with and have that pen kind of white paint pen dissipate a bit into the ink because then it'll be just lightening the lines as opposed to obliterating them with white paint Wow, so this is almost done, but for that fin. Now I got to really, really think about how I'm going to draw that fin. I don't want to use the point three to start. I want it to be really sharp and smooth. So either, like if I was at a con, I'd either use a circle template to get part of it. Um, or... Ah, uh, drawing sweep. So I have a set of French curves. They're very small. They're very limited. They're really good to travel with. But um, when I found these on Amazon, they're called dress sweeps. And you can get these incredibly long gradated curves and some really fancy ones. Um, it allows you just to do more, more variety in your line curves here. So I'm going to... I don't want that. I think I want that. That using the fine line because I know I can go over it when I'm happy with it. No, reverse it. There we go. There we go. This will work. It's about me basically just getting happy with um, the initial shape because I'm going to go over there. I'm going to coarsen it up, make it a funky line as I go. Do I want more of that? I do. I do. I want more of that um, straight recession. I want more of a spike. And then a tighter curve in towards the scalp. How does that work? Mm. Curve I want. I think that's the curve I want. There we go. All right. So now I've I've committed. I can I can correct it. But I've essentially committed to uh, the general shape of the spike coming out of his head. I want to give a sense of thickness. So I'm drawing on the underside of the curve as it shows. And it's going to get thicker.
All right, so that gives me that head spike. Maybe I'm a little too underneath it. No, I think that works. Um, French curves or sweep? I think it's sweep. I'll stick with the sweep. Everyone's seen it. Um, That didn't show up. Line didn't uh, skip. There we go. And I want a sense of a blade traveling. So I just want to give it a, a thickness of that blade right here at the fore edge. I don't need the line to show up that much, but there we go. All right. All right. And he's obviously hitting people with it, so it's going to be beat up a bit. So I'm doing some line impression so I know I can roughen this line up a bit. So I'm using almost a, a very shallow angle, the ballpoint, so it's not leaving down a full line of ink. It's like when I do the really fast lines. Um, what it does is it allows the, the line to be a little more degraded. Um, it allows the cross hatching to be less obvious. I find that it's good for, um, building a sense of almost like machine tone or more even machine uh, uh, like when I use my rubber stamps to create tone. I, I, I think I might, I think there's a piece where I would be able to use some of my rubber stamp stuff. So people have been wanting to see me use my rubber stamps live. So this, this weekend is going to be an opportunity to do that. And I'm not, okay. So as I build this tone, you can see like gradation from like a little darker towards lighter as it goes into the fur. I kind of want that because I want that sense of this being a shiny piece of metal opposed to a weird kind of brown fin uh, in this in this character. Um, and I'm going to go in with white paint on top of it to make it look like it's beat up. I'm also going to like the struts, I'm going to use some white paint to define them as as coming out of the metal. So I'm not being, I don't have to be careful building this tone because it's going to be so, uh, such a roughed up metal spike blade thing coming out of his head um, that the sloppy line work is actually going to work in my benefit. It's like if I, get, I got a notch coming in here, I can actually pull that notch right into here, right? And do like all sorts of noisy, violent lines, or it's like he's clearly been headbutting, you know, vehicles, tanks. He headbutted a tank. That's 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 what our Razorback does. That went dark, and I like, but again, doesn't matter for this type of line work because I'm going to be going white paint to get special effects. If I want a darker line going up, what I do is I just start increasing the angle of the pen upright. So it's more likely to spill ink out onto the paper. A little tone here towards the edge so the white will pop a bit more. All right, so this is, well, you know what? I wanna do a little bit more here on the, on the, the bust edge.
back here. Now, would it be would it be too cartoonish to have flies circling this guy? Again, it's like I I I I, I maligned his personal hygiene earlier, um, but I mean he's a bore, uh, a big stinky helmet guy. Um, would he would he would he attract flies? Um, I, th I think this is a little bit benefit. Like if if I start doing streams on Twitch, um, I could have people on audio. I could actually have like a, a few friends, and we could chat chatter about uh, you know whether or not Razorback would have would have flies orbiting him. You do. Um, I think I'm going to hold off. He is a hero. I I I know he's he's played for laughs a lot, but he's he's as I understand it, like teaming up with a superhero to save his sister, that kind of makes him a good guy. Uh maybe he's a bad guy now. Um he looked like he was kind of a bad guy in She-Hulk, or at least at one point, anger management issues. But you know, let's let's just make him look cool ish as as I can. I, I'm trying to make him look as cool as I can. While understanding that he is a guy with a giant, ugly, bored head helmet. Um, sometimes I get sloppy about putting my pens back. So when I, when I get near to finishing something, I like to throw them all back in so I can have something of a reset. There we go. Let's get to Posca. I want some of that coarse hair. This pen might be dying. I did use it a lot last month. Yeah, that pops a little bit better. Just want some some a little bit of white line work to make that hair feel a little coarser, a little more unruly. Again, let's get a little bit of that. Worse note. Yeah, this pen's dying. working that's all I really want to do in terms of like white paint in the hair be a little wetness here on the snout 
I mean, it's a helmet, so it wouldn't really be wet, but, you know. Makes it pop a little bit more. Pop. All right, so let's get in here. We got, let's break the lineup of the, uh, that line coming through there it's a, it's a it's a really strangely subtle thing but it adds so much when you get it right where you beat up your line quality a bit and suddenly it's like oh yeah i get that and you really get what you what you did there now the problem again with the posca over uh, pen line it uh it gets absorbed in so this can only ever be like a, a subtle change um but to deal with that yeah this i think the downside of the posca is if you don't use use them a tremendous amount like as soon as you start um what happens is the the actual nib um dries up with the paint in it and then you can't get it to flow as regularly. So you end up um, getting the pigment out and then dragging a line across using uh, the nib as a terrible dip pen for white paint. Push this back a bit. Bye. How's the hair coming to the ear, I guess? Let me a couple of hairs here. Now, for a real true opaque white, um, Pentel correction pens. You can; these are so versatile. They'll cover everything. Their their line is not as fine as the Posca, but. Um, you can do things like, let's say I like this fade, but I want it to fade a little bit more. I can scribble Posca and make that fade a little bit better. I don't know if you can see that. So it just breaks up the super fine lines you put there and it dries reasonably quickly. Um, <clears throat> more of a point here by taking a little bit of black ink right off the top edge. I think this one's done. I think Razorback's done. Um, there's my moo. There's my moo. Gonna clean up a bit because even though I washed my hands, there's going to be a little bit of graphic graphite pickup, a little bit of ink pickup on my hands. So I got to do a little bit of cleanup. Uh, do I have a brush handy? I just shake it up. Oh, there it is. These things are so handy. And to sign it. All right. Um, do I want to put a shape here? Tempted. Tempted to put a shape. Pencil. So if I did a shape. If you don't draw your commission in a uh, tight frame, sometimes adding like just a little graphic shape just pulls it together a little bit. And that far, that, 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 so I'll do this. shape comes down into there maybe yeah, i know it maybe here all right let's let's make this
the lime just chunk down into there. And weirdly enough, just adding a kind of like a geometric shape. I'm not entirely sure I'll leave the line to this. I might go heavier with uh, a Posca marker or something. But adding that element just kind of unifies everything um, in a way where it's, it's, yes, it's floating in white space, but uh, suddenly we got this, this, this shape happening here. Um, yeah, let's get the Posca in there. Oh, you know what? Let me use my brush pen. There we go. I want like a little chunkier line. I think I'm going to go and I'm going to throw some tone in there. Actually, you know I don't think it needs it. I think I think this works. I do want to merge this line into the fur a little bit more. Trust me, I think I know what I'm doing. I think. Post it notes, baby. Instant masking. And entirely, this is just about, you know, pulling it together. A lot of times, like, there's a, a beautiful drawing can just sit on the page sometimes, um, and that's all it needs. I just felt that the shape, when I finally got the, the boar head shape working, um, it was too angular, pointing too many different directions. So I thought, you know what, let's, let's simplify the silhouette of the illustration here, or the commission.
whenever you start doing stuff like this, you always wonder, God, am I screwing this up? Is this is this not or doing what I think it's going to do? I think it is. I think it's working. I think it's working. Actually, going a little bit darker here allows for the teeth and that other far side tusk to pop a little bit more. So ages ago, there was an art book for Transmetropolitan as a fundraiser for, I believe, Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. And I got asked to contribute at the last minute. And um, one of my favorite issues of Transmetropolitan was when they revealed that there were these people who had volunteered to have their minds limited so they actually believed they lived in a certain human history time so people could visit these authentic uh recreations of different regions and and points in human history and um frank frazetta had died i think was in six months before that and i was like i hadn't done any sort of tribute other than just mourn and then, so the Transmet art book came up, and I remembered his cover for Epic Illustrated One, uh, Seven Romans. Um, at, believe me, I got a point. And so what I did is I did uh, Spider Jerusalem, His Filthy Assistance, and some people who thought they were Romans in the Seven Romans composition. And when I signed it, I bastardized Frazetta's signature, because it's obviously an homage to Frazetta's painting. Uh, so I bastardized Frazetta's signature I took letter forms to make my my uh, my signature, and it stuck. This is it's shifted over the years, but this this bizarre weird pace I do is entirely my continuing homage to the the artist who is the reason I'm an artist today. So there we go. That's that's the origin of the signature, and I think I think this piece is done. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scan it. Uh, when I take my next break at four hours, uh, four hour, 15 minutes, uh, so that's about an hour and 15 minutes away. Um, but what I am going to do is put it out of the way, put all this razor back, all this amazing boar reference that I printed out uh, in my recycle room, um, and start prepping for the next piece. Uh, the next one is a uh, another 9 by 12 um so i can either grab an art book of reference because i have a lot of this artist's work or i think it might be better for me to like just print out some stuff like i did with the boar head and um so that i can put it around the table so you guys can see it while i'm um drawing now this is another massive influential uh artist and character uh, let's see if I can find a good full reference. That's a good one. Oh, that's a small one. Let's see if I can do large images. Tools. Size large. You know how good resolution this is. Oh, that's terrible. Can't use that. That's another artist drawing a character. Wow, it's really hard to find good reference. Um, this is bad. Uh, it's a video. I want to use a video as a reference.
think this character is more about the hat and his mount. This one. I think, I think these are all I need uh, to really get across, like, who I'm uh, drawing next. Full figure nine by twelve. This dude, Arzak by Mobius. Oh my god! I did a, I did a Mobius tribute piece uh, a couple years ago. Um, Arzak on his bird mount, but really far in the distance, and a woman sitting on a rock watching him fly away. I was kind of happy with the piece, but this is kind of cool because I'm going to be focusing on the dude himself. Um, so I get to basically figure out how I want to draw this guy. And um, yeah, okay. Time to do some ideation, I guess. Uh, hmm. Thanks, Jason Dragon. Uh, happy you like that piece. Uh, I think I think Arzak's going to be a little, almost more of a traditional type of drawing. Um, see, I got some private messages uh, outside of this, but about this. That makes sense. Um, and put her message about this. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, Cadence is still taking commissions for this weekend. I have a few spots left. Um, okay, that's sorted. All right, so putting the pens away, post its away. I have all these, uh, red cups on my uh on this table adjacent to my drawing table and um as i'm working with the pens a lot of times i'll just like toss them onto the table when i'm done and uh the table fills up with pens some of them the same size uh like i'll, I'll use like the same zero one but three or four pens because i'm just i want to grab the one that's fastest to my hand um and that means the, the spot is full of, of pens. So if I put them away a bit, it, it gives me a little bit of space. Oh, this one's dead. All right, and I have a nail clipper here on the table. I don't know. I must have clipped my nails. Hmm. All right. I I love I love this weird kind of chunky. Oh, I just hit the camera. Everything's so subtle. All right. I love this kind of like chunky, thick, layered costuming that Mobius did. Um, I mean, just look at this boot. I mean, it's like, I, th I think this is somewhat influenced by his time on Blueberry, drawing a whole bunch of uh, indigenous Americans with the detail in their their costuming. Um, so a lot of these tassels and everything, but like the layer, like, like this boot is got a cover over what could be just a shoe. So, and it's tied up there above his calf. So that could be something that people did to protect their calves when riding horses. And Mobius just put it over here on Arzak. Um, I love like the, the lacing on this knife. The hood, the weird kind of like, why does he have like an ear thing here? I mean, what's that shape on his forehead? Um, he's got a lot of times he's just got like shapes that are like just or almost to feel like reflexive organic drawing. Um, because it's it's not overly consistent. It's like you know, Arzak has the same 
wardrobe of clothes that most humans do as opposed to like superheroes where they have the one costume and it stays consistent until there's a revamp um yeah i think i know i think i know i got an idea i don't know if i'm gonna pull it off um so it's a full figure but you can kind of cheat full figures by putting them in, into things um I like how thoughtful he is. He's clearly under some sort of umbrella because the shadow following here. But whatever the shadow is, I wonder if this is. I've seen this before, but I don't know if this is part of a much bigger piece. Um, because I mean, the shadow's falling across this part of the body, right? So if it's coming down there, why is that shadow so thin? So whatever's casting a shadow has also got to be reasonably thin. Um, because, I mean, from the direction of the shadow, this should be a little thicker because his leg's going diagonally across. And Mo yeah, Moby's bullshitted something. Imagine that. Uh, so that should be a little thicker, and that thickness should be coming down to the shadow from the chair. But look how thin that is. That line, it's like the implication that the light is, I mean, if, if this is boring, tell me. So from the chair shadow, sh chair shadow we see, you got the start of the chair leg here and the top of the chair leg hitting the leg there. So you get a sense of that's the angle of the light source. And if you're using a natural, like all the light sources are going to come from that that angle consistently. Um, so that part of the chair there, because the sun doesn't do like a, a light bulb sense where like the light bulb light radiates from that central point that's really close. The sun's so far away, all its light is traveling at that same angle. So if that's the angle of the light, there should be a shadow cast by that leg on the ground somewhere around there. Now, no one gets it all right. I, 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 I BS this type of stuff all the time. And that leg is going diagonally across this leg. So if that leg's supposed to be there, there should be, and let's say its foot's over there, there should be a shadow crossing like this. And this should be thicker. But that should be, that should be a shadow. There should be that there. Now, what is casting that shadow? Because the foot could be in the sunlight, we just can't see it. But this kneecap's in shadow. So whatever's casting the shadow of that knee would hide that part of the light hitting there. So it's almost like Mobius saw the picture of the chair in, in shadow, and he put a figure in it. And he didn't correct the shadow. But on top of that, we have that same, we can actually see the angle I drew, but it's a little more acute coming down here. So what is the shape? Large enough to cast a shadow over Arzak, but not big enough to cover more of the ground. And even Arzak's not really covering more of the ground here. It's 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 cool. It's cool. It's a puzzle. Like when you learn all this shit as, as an art student, uh, and you see like someone who mastered the form as well as Arzak, you you go, okay, was it deliberate? Was it just a quick sketch and he didn't care? Was it a piece of photo reference that he, he wanted to play with because he did that a lot? And then he turned into a fantasy piece because, I mean, then he could sell it. Um, it it's really, really curious. I love, I love analyzing. I love finding the mistakes in master's work. Um, partly it humanizes them more. But then you realize, okay, why were they not considering that important? Because that I think that as an artist, that's an important thing. Not everything can always be important in a piece there has to be things of secondary important um importance tertiary importance or insignificance even and that's where you can like you can just let things slide um all right so i've got arzak standing here This hat goes back, so this would be like this. So 
So Arzak's looking at a map. Because why wouldn't he? I mean, he's got to figure out where he's going. I get to draw the map up here. Gives me an opportunity to draw like arm wearing chunky stuff the way he does. Gloves, shoulder pads and stuff like that. Maybe a hood. Let me bend his hand backward to hold this map. He's standing in some water so I don't have to draw the whole legs. I can actually drop it down and then just copy these uh, cool booties here. Have him standing in the shallower water. Nice cheat. Um, he's going to have dunked all over his belt. Not going to see that. We have his cape. I don't think he's, yeah, he doesn't have a cape in the seated. He, he's so often drawn with that cape. Capes are amazing. They, they save you so much time from drawing stuff, especially when they're doing like back, back shots. Uh, I'm so happy that Sunstar has a cape. Um, my collar, some stuff going down. Maybe a shoulder pad there, cape. This cape then I can actually do it like in the water or whatever he's standing in. Eyes line, so we're going to be around this level ish. If I include the bird, it becomes a much smaller drawing, but it becomes a better drawing as a result. Yeah, I think I think I'm gonna. Do these weird kind of like spikes coming out of the water. I think in the very first uh, Arzak story, he's traveling with two birds. And then one of them dies and falls into the field of weird worms. Looks like a sh an alien shag carpet. Oh, I loved how Mobius like, filled space. So like if I do this, can like fill the whole horizon with all this. I can do a second bird here. And do a bunch of those horizon. Yeah, see, the thing is, for just a single figure, 9 by 12, it seems like I'm messing myself up a bit by uh, adding all the birds. But by forcing everything to be smaller in the 9 by 12, it actually ends up becoming a... Uh, I mean, the figure ends up being so small. I don't. I honestly don't know if the person commissioning this wants an incredibly tiny Arzac drawing. He may just want, like, a big, cool drawing, like, with a blaster or something. This might be too Mobius-y. 
Hmm. Although I gotta say, I kind of love, I kind of love just the pure casual element of of Arzak sitting in a chair. I might, might do a a variation on this. This would, this would be cool to like just draw, you know, Arzak chilling somewhere. Um. Damn, that's a hard call. I'm like, I'm super conflicted at the moment. This is, uh, this is the hard part of this. Hmm. Uh. Hmm. See, if I was at a con in my head, like a really full list, I'd, I'd literally have to at this point decide, okay, I'm going to go and do this one or that one and just go because I have to, but I'm in my studio. It's like, I don't have to, you know, network and socialize after I could like, when the stream ends for today, I can take a break and say, oh, you know what? I come up with a better idea and like have it ready to go tomorrow morning. So that's, that's another benefit of like doing this here live out of, out of my studio. Um, although I gotta tell you, technically, I mean, this is, this is the classic, this is the classic, let me move this over a bit. This is the classic idea of what people think about with Arzak, Arzak on that bird creature. See, the thing is, one, one, there's one story where the, the bird gets repaired, not healed, repaired. So I think these are machines. Eventually, they become revealed to be machines because they get repaired with components. Hmm. I know, you know, but again, that becomes a very like if I, as soon as I draw the bird. And I'm almost literally drawing the same drawing, but it's like my style. So I'm drawing the bird. And do things like, you know, have the bird looking in a different direction. Um, and I can have him like sit, seated. <coughs> Excuse me. I haven't done this much talking since Baltimore last year. So this is um, this is very much like the con experience. <laughs> this is me yakking away constantly. Um, the wing would be coming like that. Be the legs. It'd be the, the ropes for like the saddle and stuff. I could have them sitting differently. I love the way you design things. I think I know where all my Milvius books are. I could I could pull them out so I could actually like look at the whole Arzak arc. Those weird kind of feet he drew. This almost guarantees that I have to draw it horizontally. Um, Nine by 12. And so instead of vertical, like portrait thing, I do. Uh, landscape format and it's just a beautiful drawing you draw like the horizon line with uh, weird structures I feel this this feels like what a mobius arzak full figure commission should be
Isaac feels pretty big there. Yeah, okay. I, I think to make this work, I think this would have to be an 11 by 17. Because then I'd really have to pull up the vertical scale, let the sky happen, let the depth of the background happen. Arzak would be this size on the artboard, but the board would be, you know, a little bit taller. Maybe he'd be sitting closer to the bottom. And this would be the, uh, these are 11 by 14, so that yeah. The piece would be about this big. He'd be sitting at the bottom. I could even theoretically push, like, one of the birds much higher and, like, get that perspective up, have this bird up here, and then have this depth happening. Yeah, this is an 11 by 17 composition that's building up. Put that aside. I think I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it landscape format on the 9 by 12. It's going to be a small Arzac, but it's going to be a nice big bird. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's where I got to go with this. Arzac's going to be a little smaller. Where's my moo? Here's my moo. Boop. I need to go with that. And I might, will this fit on camera if I turn it sideways? It will. Um, there you go. Low focus. So I'm only losing like the bottom, bottom most point, point, the last inch and a half at the bottom, but I'm not really going to be drawing there. All right, cool. So I'm going to turn this sideways. And I'm going to draw it this big. All right. Yeah, I think that I think this will work a lot better. The saddle back there, and here's before I draw the wings, I'm gonna figure out what Arzak's doing. I think he's gonna be sitting with his feet on either side of the stirrups, or the front part of the saddle. Steps are planted there. Let's give him a little slouch. Um, Letting me up a bit more. Weird thing is, is it doesn't look like he has like um, reins for this bird. He's got this weird little rope he's hanging onto in the saddle. I kind of want him to have reins, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna make up reins on uh, on this bird here. I don't know if he controls them psychically or not, but I was a weird kind of empty eye socket. I'll just exaggerate that slightly there. I think I'm inevitably going to be drawing things a little differently in terms of like how I like drawing creatures. back and that's where his wing comes in so his wing can be actually 
down like that. Close that, come around, around like that. That, that. Back there, there's this joint connection jack. Come to a part. Those are small wings. Maybe I can make them bigger. There we go. Happening at the other side, curvature of the back where our Zach Singh is sitting. All right. That no recedes. Yes, that. No, it should be down there, shouldn't it? Yeah. Study your perspective, kids. It'll save you mistakes. So he's got a rope going around there. It's going to be curved back. And way back here, he's got those almost vestigial legs. The part of one of, the, of these um, birds that remind me of like plucked chickens. Especially like the back part here where it's like it's just that little nub of a featherless tail. I want it just a little long so it's not like a vestigial nub. Get that out there. And then like this rope because, you know, wow, it's got to have the rope. Then the harness wrapping around. Now, would reins on a giant bird go in the mouth or around the snout? So it goes around the snout, it can't open its mouth, so he can't feed it while he's flying, which he does in the first story. Um, ew, sorry, excuse me. Um, I know, hang on, I know, I know, I know, here we go. Oh, lead is too short now. We killed the lead. We killed our first lead. I can't uh, draw with that little lead left. Way to go, stream. What if I put that and then a ring and then and, like put tassels all the way along it. And then he has like another one here. He has that in his other hand. Yeah, we'll grab the, the nine by twelve. I think that's quite wrong. No, nine by twelve. I think that's not. No, it's taller. See, I'm looking for stuff. All right, so it's nine by twelve. So, at this size, again, if I poured it over to Photoshop, I think I need to do another layer over top and tighten it up a bit. So I have to reduce it. Um, the bird itself is already filling it up. 
So yeah, if I reduce it like by 10% or something, then that gives me nice space for doing stuff at the bottom. So I can do a horizon line and weird shit on the ground plane. Um, you know, I'm not gonna bother with that part of it now. What I'm gonna do is put it underneath and do another drawing before, and I'm actually gonna pull it up closer to the top of the page here. It's on this camera, good. So I'm gonna, now that I know where everything is, I still think Arzac might be too big. I mean, look at the scale here. Yeah, I think I'm making Arzac too big. That bird is massive. I mean, it's not as big as it should be to carry a human being. That bird's massive compared to him. Here he's, he's, he's instead of like being essentially 20% of the size, size of the mass of the bird, I got him here at like 30 to 40%, 30% there. Yeah, so I'm going to make Arzac a little bit smaller. The bird is pretty much right. But yeah, all right. Which is good also because if we're looking up at this angle from the bird, Arzak shouldn't be that much in profile. So, I mean, he's, his butt should be here. So that'd be his torso and hips. And if I angle him leaning forward, and if his foot's rested there, his knee would be way up there. And then this one would be like way over here. Yeah, he's still too tall there. There we go. Yeah, so it's a very small Arzac, but uh, he's, it's Arzac. I mean, it's Mobius. I mean, most of the, most of the drawings of Arzac, he's he's like a, the size of a thumbnail. Um, Yeah, that, that seems that seems the right size. If you can see like the ghost of the bird underneath, that that this feels like the right size of Arzak underneath here. Let's put up saddle. So everything everything just feels a lot better. I'm gonna put a bunch of clutter here. I might end up doing another trace now that I've sorted this out. Get some of that sense of the jaw coming from the other, the other side of the neck here. And this would be narrower because we're looking at it from underneath. Yeah, that, that seems like a much better, maybe he's a little small now, but to me, to my mind, that's how big the size difference between Arzak and the bird should be. Got this cool like ridging of lines that creates depth. I love it. So then the wing coming out from behind the harness. Get a little more thickness here. It's just a wonderful insectile bat-like element to the wing here. 
I, I just love it. I just love it. I, I when I first got the Mobius books when Marvel was putting them out, like I, I'd seen Mobius in Heavy Metal. Uh, um, I got a Heavy Metal story. Uh, I got a few Heavy Metal stories, but I have one positive Heavy Metal story. I was way too young. I think um, the issue I got actually had a Mobius cover on it. It was a creature sitting on a rock, if I remember correctly. This is a long time ago. I was looking at magazines when my grandmother was buying groceries in a grocery store. So I was hanging around the, uh, the magazine rack and they had shelled heavy metal with the kids magazines. So clearly no one looked at the contents of heavy metal. It just looked like a comic book magazine. And I flipped through it and the art was so mind blowing. I'm, I want to say that this is like 1976, 1977. So I would have been eight or nine years old. And I was so blown away. I was already into art, but I had no idea that you could be an artist for a living. I was so blown away by the art. I asked my grandmother to get it and she bought it for me. Just assume that any sort of comic book would be for kids because, you know, it was the 1970s and, and um, you know, comics were for kids in North America. That's, that's, that's just what it was. And um, I brought it home and I was blown away by it. And my older brother saw it. And in that issue, there was a den story. So you got to see, you know, Richard Corbin render a massive penis and, and huge breasts. And there was also a story, I want to say it's by Kaza. And it was this nude woman running across a desert like landscape and she finds an oasis. And in this oasis, there's a tree with all these weird fruit. And she peels the fruit much in a way you would roll a foreskin off of the head of a penis. And she eats it. And she eats all this fruit that just foams as she eats it. And then she passes out. And when she wakes up, she's pregnant. And her belly looks like one of those fruit with a foreskin on it. And, uh, I mean, these are things that maybe eight-year-olds shouldn't be seeing. And my older brother, who's around 12 at the time, saw it. And he went and told my mom. And um, to my, my parents' credit, they just didn't immediately take it away and throw it away. They confiscated it. They said, you're too young to have this. Uh, we'll give it back to you when you're older. Um, that, is, that is my first memory of heavy metal. Um, getting it when I was too young to possibly ever uh, legitimately be be having this in my hands. And uh, I, I have an inordinate uh, amount of uh, affection for the magazine ever since. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, um, okay. We're at three and a half, three hours, 40 minutes. I want to take a break at four hours, 15 for half an hour. That 15 minute break. Oh my God. That just evaporated. Um, let's get that. Get the bulge behind that. I want to see. I, I should be able to at least finish penciling this before that break. Yeah, I got that. So this comes around. That, that. And points back. So this is on the other side of this. It's right going forward. That, that, that. Yeah, I think this is even further back, the proper wind shape or wing shape. In fact, let me. Simplify that shape a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's I think that's much closer. I mean, this is without building a three D model. You're you're guessing. And he's got these weird. Thighs, it's incredibly tiny. They changed 
shape a lot. He, he redesigned stuff as as he's free to do because I think he designed on the site on spot. So if that is on the other side of this, then that foot might come around there. There we go. He's got a harness coming behind the wings. He's got like nice tassels and tethers flying everywhere. I think I think this is pretty much the shape I'm gonna go with. I like that kind of weird kind of chunky textural stone-like work on these wings here. Yeah, I think I think that works. I think that works. I could be wrong. I have been wrong before. And what did I decide? I decided some more sort of weird, like implanted. Into the rain, so you can actually pull on the bottom jaw, so they're like riveted in, and he just hooks them up. Yeah, that's the ticket. I kind of want to draw that rope there. Pull some of that graphite out of the area with the eraser without necessarily rubbing so the line kind of remains. So he's got some gear there. So I'm going to draw some gear. There's his foot sitting on something, some sort of saddle. Let me, let me put something back here. Imply that there's more of a saddle there. He's got this, this big thing, a rope. I'm not going to be able to draw it as big as he's drawing it, but I can I can do this. But the harness is coming underneath it. I want to draw the same sort of harness. Kinda want to do something a bit more elaborate because I'm just drawing this, but I'm drawing it so small, it might get lost. I like I like the kind of weird um, in this part of the harness. I like the red, white, red, white, red, white balance there. And I'm thinking about like how on medieval horses they would actually have like the harness would have like the soft fabric with, with like flaps. So it'd be implied motion as um as it went around as opposed to like you know side by side ropes that seem to be happening here. Like um kind of want to do something like. That work. Make them longer, but then it would get tangled in them if it goes down. Yeah, maybe maybe that didn't work. Yeah, maybe I just bundle them a bit. Make them echo distant.
I shrink it down, the landscape, the horizon is still going to be around there because we're looking up at them. Now I could do the water landscape I originally wanted to do in the first piece. I don't know, it just, it just seems like Mobius landscapes were like so full of crystals and weird shit that uh he also did like I'm kind of bullshitting it here, but uh he did this type of shape a lot. Essentially like a dropped ice cream cone. Um and so many of his landscapes where it's like the idea of like some sort of like big bulbous shape attached to the ground and then some sort of spire coming off at an angle off it. He did that a, an awful lot to the point where I remember it like as a very distinct motif. So I wonder if, I know he had some sort of weird, I don't know if it was a religion or philosophy or whatnot, uh, where it was crystals and, and, and weird stuff like that. I think that informed his work a lot. Um, yeah, I think this, I don't think I have to draw it again. Um, shoulder, arm coming through there, back through there, hip, knee, hip, knee. Yeah, I think uh, I got this figured out. Let me see if I can make this fit on uh, nine by twelve, and I'm I I will be able to start inking this before I take my next break. Um, let me put this guy back on the camera for a bit, so you're not looking. At, oh, I can leave that. Here we go. I'll leave that drawing there. Um, while I scan this and get it ready to go be the next piece of making. Um, again, it's uh, the reason I do it this way is the art paper they make nowadays is is terrible. Um, so by you saw how much racing and penciling and, and if I was drawing it right on, and I've done it so many times at conventions uh, where you do everything on the paper, your initial planning, um, uh, you you fight with your drawing, you draw a race, redraw, draw a race, redraw. Um, doing that all on that paper wears away the surface they manufacture because they put the least amount of work into the surface of the paper now. And um, and uh, and so that means the surface itself is already at risk uh, of not taking ink well because well, uh, you've already uh, abused the surface so much. So by Breaking in half, all the penciling work that's done on a paper that doesn't need to uh, exist beyond the initial pencil drawing, uh, and then putting all the blue onto the artboard. That means, and that's also, I, I only do about 80%, if that, of the work on, on the bond paper. So there's actually a lot of drawing done in ink. Um, back in the old days when I was just a penciler, I would put everything on that board, everything. Every line I wanted, every shape of that line I wanted. And it took about probably longer than penciling and inking does now. Um, by, by breaking this down, ne knowing full well I'm never going to um, have to replicate exactly the line I put down in pencil um, is hugely liberating. Um, and it means I don't have to rely on the paper surviving the, the whole process. There were pages back in the day where, uh, in the early days when I started inking myself, where I did so much work on the page that um, 
there were areas where the ink didn't sit the same as in other areas, especially if you're using a marker, like a micron or something ink. Uh, the micron just wouldn't hit the paper the right way, or you would have grooves in your paper that would screw up the ink line you're trying to put down. Um, not, not a pleasant thing, not a pleasant thing. I'm gonna do it like that. Crop. Just means curves. This is me uh, getting the darkest lines dark and the white, the white parts of the paper white. And I like that shape. What does this come down to? This this might be another more or less borderless piece where I don't draw, I, I wouldn't even necessarily draw um, a shape around. Like, like in this piece here, you have uh, that moon tying everything together and everything else is just kind of floating in or ending. Uh, since this is existing on a smaller piece of paper, um, that's probably not the best. I'm going to go to the size. Uh, width. Go nine, five. So this works out. I'll do it all. Take this. Just a second. Sorry for the dead air. I'm just like getting this ready to print. Okay. Sharpen the edges here. Right? Filter, sharpen, unsharp mask. Yeah, it's better. Uh, adjustment to black and white. Get rid of other color noise. And then I'm going to, yep, okay, Control U. That's why I opened up the hue saturation screen, Control U. I click the colorize button. My hue is 180. Saturation is 100%. My lightness is 83. I'm going to print it as landscape format. I'm not going to put any borders. Move this up a bit so I can put this to point here. All right. All right. So I'm going to start inking this imminently. We are nearing the four hour mark of the first day of C2E2 at home. Um, Got one piece drawn today. I'm pretty sure I'll easily be able to um, finish inking this Mobius piece. It's it's nowhere near as render heavy as the Razorback piece. Uh, and then I'll probably probably start the big piece tomorrow, or I will um, if another one comes in, I might do that. I have a Batman painting I've been working on. Uh, might work on that. that. That might be actually something better to do tomorrow. Like just just focus on doing the whole Batman painting. So here's the uh, blue pencil. Kind of cuts off at the bottom of the camera here. I guess I could like tape it up there, but I kind of don't want to put tape on this. Um, yeah. So let's uh, let's get going on this. Oh, now I'm thinking maybe I want to put like a low moon in the horizon here. I might do that. Now that I'm looking at with the size and what it really is going to look like in the artboard, I think a, a weird little Mobius moon right here, and maybe a smaller one up there. So I got that shape. Composition goes back there. This points back up there. 
yeah, I think just one shape there. Mm. Placement there. Yeah. All right. Let me get get me get my glasses on. Um there they are. Oh god. If you're like me and you and you only occasionally wear glasses, you're always taking them off. I'm always taking them off. Um and that means you generally put them down and you have to find them. So I picked up um, the same level of enhancement readers and I have a pair sitting in every room in my apartment. Uh, kitchen, living room, dining room, bedroom, studio. I have like two pairs sitting in the studio so I, if, I'm never losing them. I even have a pair in my bathroom. Um, they're just so damn handy, man. They're just so damn handy. Okay, and this is going to rely on me getting Arzac right. So I'm going to start with Arzac because if I screwed up, um, I'm going to print it out, start again. That's that's the other benefit of um, doing either work on paper uh, and then transfer transferring it to artboard. If I screw it up, let's say I spilled ink or a marker, just I've had this where there was a marker I was using, and suddenly it just releases ink. No idea why. It just releases all this ink, and suddenly you have to start again. If I did all the pencil work here, it's gone. Drawing is gone. I have to start over from scratch. This way, I can at least start over from the penciling stage. So, all right. So, let me pull up the classic. Where did it? There it is. Pull up the classic Mobius drawing. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that low level of detail in the face. It's just, just eyes, nose, mouth, and head shape. No rendering, no rendering. It's so simple. I love that. I love that. And he drew huge, too, at least mostly. All right. So. I like the Arzak helm with a little bit of a visor. So I can use the shadow to define the eyes. Got his knee here. I'm giving him like weird funky boot coverings the way he always has. So I got him holding the reins up high. Get those reins hooked up. Sometimes you got to move the paper so you get the swoop of the line the way that feels right. So this is going to be going here. There we go. And this one's going to be going over here.
So that's why the head's turning. So he's actually pulling with one, one of the uh, harnesses. And no, it might be too much visual noise going on in there. Let's put a little pack or something there. Seat. Go. And then we got the cape coming up from here. We got that big loop of rope. Some sort of weird hook device in here or loop device. So he's all hunched up there on the top of the uh, the bird. And I want to put a little more junk here. The idea that he's like got a whole bunch of storage stuff all over this bird. Yeah, it's looking all right so far. <clears throat> My throat is so dry already. Uh, I carefully build these like weird kind of like stony shapes to make up this bird. I don't want it to look too inorganic and I don't want it to look too organic. I want it to feel like a Mobius drawing. Got me aping Mobius. I'm hearing weird sounds from my computer. Um, I, I got to tell you, JC Dragon, I'm really happy you're chatting because I've seen other people pop in and out. I think there's three people currently watching. Oh, down to one. Um, it's good to, good to get the feedback going. I love it. Thank you so much. Bring this to come around there.
like we're looking at the underside of the uh, head enough. It was drink and draw. Why did I, how did I forget that? It was Dan Panosian, Dave Johnson, Jeff Johnson. Uh, they had a host whose name escaped me. Actually, really kept the chatter flowing really well. Uh, and usually, you know, sometimes Joe Quesada or an, and another guest. And it was the it was the drink and draw Thursday night drink and draw. I don't think I've seen one for a while. Um, no, although we're in the con season and everyone's busy, but uh, I love watching those guys work. I think one of the appeals of Mobius's stuff is so many of his characters are so organic and so chaotic from one panel to the next, honestly, that um, drawing them means you can make all sorts of mistakes and they still look right. At least, at least that's that's my story and I'm sticking to it. This is working out pretty good, uh, even if I do say so myself. And so far, I've only used the uh, zero one Odo uh, liquid ink ballpoint pen. Um, I will most likely come back in with a point three to heavy up some lines. Uh, give it a little more sense of volume and um but i don't see myself using any brush um uh, although i i think someone told me that mobius did everything all all this fine line work even though it looks like it's a nib uh, uh, mobius primarily used a brush so if like <laughs> it'd be hilarious if you use like a, a six you know what's a newton seven like a big, massive, thick brush and get all these fine lines. There's a part of me that have to, has to believe that um, I've, I've I've seen his original work, but behind glass and at a distance. I've never handled a, a Mobius original. Um, so handling original art's the best way to see like how the ink went down and what tools they most likely used. Um, so if I got to handle a Mobius page, I'd, I'd be able to you know decide if the story of him doing everything with marker was either just applying the blueberry or or what because so much of his work looks like pen and ink 
uh, except for the really brushy parts, I should say. Some sort of ring buckle there. I don't think I necessarily have to track his gear identically. I'm I'm already making changes, but um, good to actually understand what he'd put down and try and use it when he can, because he has designs. I'm pretty sure that this is the best way to do the far wing. Line break a bit. A little solidity makes it look like it's further away. I am tempted, tempted to either render the shadow side of this or use one of my rubber stamps and actually just allow the rubber stamp to, to, to build a very subtle shadow underneath here. I'd use my 20% stamp. I think I'm going to use my stamp. Part of me, like, uh, had I thought of an advance, especially if they, you know, commissioned watercolor, I could literally just throw a light wash um, 
for the shadow side. That would that would have been cool. That would have been cool being able to do like washes. I didn't think of it. Darn, now I really want to do this in color. <laughs> Commissioner's going, yeah, yeah, do it in color. Just don't charge me for it. Which what understandable color is expensive. Your test. It's got a decent amount of depth. There's something he was able to do so masterfully in terms of getting that horizon, that sense of depth with just the minimal amount of information. It just worked so well. So many people learned from him how to do that. I wonder where he got it or if he developed it himself. Hmm. Hard to believe that this one's already almost done. Oh, Mobius, you and your beautiful, simple landscapes, making everything so much easier for us artists to follow you. I have a cut piece that I could use. It's big enough. Nope. All right. So this is a uh, frisket, mostly used for airbrushing. Um, I picked some up when I started using rubber stamps as part of my tool. I'm going to mask this off. So I think I'm going to cut there to about there. Kind of wasteful when it comes to fifth gear, but it makes my job so much easier when I'm doing this stuff. Watch me have cut along the wrong square path. Oh no, I'm good. All right. And that that gives me a nice piece I can use for like masking off just a small area in another piece. So I, I never throw the, the unused scraps off because um, it comes in really handy, especially if I just want to do like a little bit of rubber stamp. I, I got a very specific idea how I want to do this, this piece. Hey, you guys get to see me using my rubber stamps live on a camera. Some of you guys have been asking for this for a while. 
So this is kind of be kind of exciting for me anyway. So I don't have to be careful since I'm not really doing like, you know, airbrush level frisket application. I just got to get it down there and then I cut away with my exacto knife when I can find it. I did, oh, there it is. I just used it recently. So I use this and what I do is I cut away the areas I want uh, the rubber stamp to leave ink down. And since the idea is like the sun's above whatever sunlight, I got to remember to do them. So I don't forget, almost forgot. Uh, I really want to get a sense of that shadow and reflected light with the rubber stamp. Um, but I have to, I, I like to think ahead a little bit. So if the sun's hitting here, right, um, I only have to cut away the expo or the underside where that shadow, that shadow, underside of the wing is shadow, under here on the tail. Uh, this foot's going to be in shadow, that's going to be in shadow coming along here underneath, and that's in shadow, leaving a little bit of that leading edge. And because I want a different quality of shadow here than what there, I'm actually going to cut it so I can reapply or remove the piece of frisket there as I go. Um, I am tempted to just hit Arzac all in shadow and then pop out highlights to make them a little different than the sky, imply that there's color in him. And I think I'm going to do that. All right. And the weird thing with the rubber stamps I use, these are my rubber stamps. So you can see, can you see, is it focus? you can see that it's a dot pattern. That's all it is. Um, I use this instead of Zipatone or, or dry transfer rubs. Um, and it, uh, it, it just, it just adds this subtle little level of like, oh God, I like that. Um, so let me get to cutting. Let me get to cutting. Hmm, there's some stuff in there I may want to fiddle with. So it's generally me just cutting right directly above an incline. You know, since I want a, an aspect of ref reflected light, I don't mind that the rubber stamp is not going to immediately go all the way to that edge. It's not like an airbrush where it just sprays into the smallest area. It, it, it's a pressure application. So I have to push incredibly hard if I want those dots to go like all the way in there. Um, and I usually don't. I usually like the uh, the rubber stamp to fall away from the edge a little bit. It somehow makes it uh, feel a little bit more organic, a little bit more natural. Think of how precisely I've seen friends cut frisket. Like they're so slow and they're methodical and they get everything exactly the way they want. And I'm like, yeah, it's in the ballpark. I can always use white paint.
although I'm being quiet because I do have to focus a little bit more when I'm cutting. I don't want to screw up too much. Well, technically, I don't want to screw up at all, but, you know, everyone always screws up. At least I know I do. Mm -mm. Yeah, this will be all in shadow because it's under the rope. Cut through here. They did this one, right? They did. All right, cool. And then I want this to be able to come out as well. And it's always tricky to make sure that I cut away all the things I want to cut away because otherwise it'll tear. Got to be a little careful about making sure that foot removes out there. And I wanted Arzac to be stamped away, so to speak. Yeah, you know, tricky things. I use stamp pads, like just commercially bought stamp pads. Um, uh, the ink does not dry immediately when I stamp on here on the plastic surfaces, as as, as you would expect. Um, as expected not to, I mean. Um, but what that means is it's very easy to get onto my hands and then get onto the artboard. So I generally have to be pretty clear careful and even then sometimes i have to you know clean up a little bit of stuff with white paint a little bit of dots to show up in there so i'm going to kind of crude but not too crude i get everything nope top of the cape and here I use the uh, reflection on the edges of the cuts um, to catch the light to see where I may have forgotten to cut. Okay, I think, or is that? Oh, no, there's a little bit I missed. Let's get Arzak out. Lifting at the head, the head here a bit. When you do these tiny, tiny, fiddly little cuts, very easy for. There we go. Yeah, good. That that came out. Be a little bit of plastic. Now, the larger shape should come out, but I'm worried about these feet. So I'm going to pop these feet first. So I don't care if they tear if they're already out. Oh, there was a tear. Now I'm going to keep this one handy because I think I want to reapply it for when I do this. That wing, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to very lightly stamp that wing, but I don't want to darken the stuff adjacent to it. All right, so 
I don't know if you can see. Let's show the reflection a bit. Um, you can see from reflections where the plastic is and where it isn't. It doesn't necessarily adhere to where all the lines are. And let's put that up there. I'll probably forget it. Get my rubber stamp. And so this is based on a 20% um, zip screen or tone screen. And this is my archival ink rubber stamp. It's always a bit sketchy to get it to stay on my drawing table when I'm when I'm working because the lip is so shallow here. All right. Now, what I'm going to do to keep overlapping layers of ink from hitting it, because, I mean, it's like the stamp size, I'm, I'm going to get a bigger screen of it. I think I'm going to mask off using um, post-it notes some of the areas so I don't end up with extraneous overlap. So there's a lot of lines here, so I don't mind if there's some extra visual noise in that part of the uh, the bird. I'm also gonna, I don't wanna over stamp on Arzac either. So. See it's smudged a bit there. But it doesn't matter, it's smudged on the plastic side. I kind of want to just do just a little extra turn it 45 degrees and get a little a little bit extra in the core shadow there. So, oops. All right. Take this off. Do Arzac here. I'd be a little careful because I've already stamped and I don't want to overlayer the stamp too much. Post-it notes work perfect for this. Yeah, I got just enough, a little bit of dots there. Great. Now the rubber stamp dries almost immediately on the paper, which is great. Um, but again, now I have to be really, really careful about accidentally touching to the point where I'm not even going to demonstrate it. I don't want to accidentally touch it with my fingers because then, you know, that ink gets everywhere. Um, now, the stamp's not big enough to do all of this in one. I'm going to order a larger stamp. Like, here's a, uh, this is the size I like. So I ordered a, a tone gradient stamp, and you can see it's it's the same width, but it's 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 wider. Um, so I want to get something like this, um, this deep, and maybe like half that. So maybe an inch longer this way, and about that wide, and that way I can do larger areas of tone a lot a lot more effectively. Um, by the way, I do go through a ton of post-its. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask off part of that. I'm going to leave the masks over there because I, I, I just don't want to risk going over there. And because I don't mind it being a little bit darker in there, and since I'm going to be holding the same stamp and same angle, I'm just going to do that and just not press as hard towards the bottom. And do this just to minimize the uh, over overlap. Okay, so I'm going to go stamp and try and match up as close as possible the edge. Stamp. I missed a little bit, but it's not going to show up that much. And I can even do a little bit of. freelance stamping into shadow areas just to add extra dots. Just darkens it a bit.
So I did the wing. Now I want to free up the rest of, I even got the tail about as much as I wanted to get done. I'm gonna go here and I covering too much of the, nope, that's exactly where I want it. All right, good. And I think just to be on the safe side, I don't wanna do more there. So I'm just doing that. So here we go. And you can see that some of the rubber stamp already hit here. So what I'm gonna be doing is by still holding it in the same vertical direction without you know creating almost like a moire pattern, uh, I'm just gonna darken that area a bit. Push. There we go. I think that did the trick there. Okay. Yeah, see, see, I got some ink on my thumb now, so I gotta be super careful because that, that will smudge right onto the artboard really quickly. Somehow the ink doesn't dry on skin the same way it dries on paper, probably because the oil's in their skin and everything. And it's really, you know, attractive to the skin when it's on the plastic, I'm not drying here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little bit of frisket here that I saved from covering the torso. I don't need a massive uh, level of precision that we're reapplying this. I just need it to be in the area. There we go, because I'm going to pull up this one. And what I'm going to do with this, wipe my hand again just to make sure, I am going to take the stamp, grab a scrap piece of paper. In this case, it would be one of the printouts of uh, the uh, Arzac. And I'm going to get some of the ink off of it, because I want a lighter distant level of dots. All right, so that's done. I'm gonna give that a second to dry. Double check my hands, looking for ink. It's a little bit of ink from a ballpoint, but no rubber stamp ink at this point. All right, so I'm going to pull this off. In its entirety. Cutting instead of lifting, here we go. Damn it, I'm gonna get ink on my fingers there. So hopefully you can see the uh, the just slight shadowing. Hmm. The rubber stamp didn't grab a spot that I really wanted to have just an incredibly subtle amount of tone right there. So what I'm going to do is again pulling out the first uh, the post-its, cover that, cover that. I'll use these until the stick wears out on, on the post-its. Uh, the ink fully dries pretty quickly. And there's a little area I don't think the ink's gonna go. Um, so I'm not gonna worry about masking like a, a tiny millimeter of area that's just outside of that. Don't need a full load of ink on it, but do need some. There we go. That's all I needed, all that 
Well, that uh, post it reapplied for that. And let's take some clear here where I cut twice. There we go. That's me applying a very, very limited amount of, of uh, rubber stamp there. I want to do a moon. And like every artist, I am going to pull up my circle template. How big a moon do I want? I want it to feel like a moon. Yeah, it's like, I want it there. I think this I think it's a good point. The loops pointing onto there. I'm not sure if I'm gonna well, the cap just went flying. This doesn't feel like a point of oh, sorry, zero zero five. No, that was a cap. So zero zero five. The line's too thick. There we go. I think that's where I want it. Make sure there's no bulbs of ink so I get a blob. Don't get a blob. Mm -hmm. Now, do I want to do the weird thing here? I think I do. Can't do it like he did here with the colored pencil. I'm just doing ink. But I can imply it. Lines a little stronger towards the shadow side of this moon. We'll imply uh, rendering where there isn't any. Doing more detail here, we'll imply a core shadow that doesn't really exist. And there is Arzak. Um, where should I sign this? Right here seems right here below. Yeah, I'm going to sign down here. I'm going to sign right down in here. All right, there we go. That, that is piece number two from C2E2 at home. I'm nearing five hours. I was supposed to take a break at quarter after four. Um, I think I am going to take a half hour break now. Um, uh, I'll probably scan a couple pieces, grab a bite to eat. Let's, you know what? I hate to say it. I, I think I'm going to make it a 40 minute break so I can actually eat something and not like take a bite and then um, uh, not finish it. Like having cold eggs in my studio this morning. Um, but I'll scan this, post this, share the link with people again, and um, and uh, pick it up in in forty minutes, and start working on another piece for you guys. All right, let's see here. Um, what's that big chunky marker? Here we go. Oh, here we got a sharpie. A, a sharpie that's drying out. That one's dead. All right, now it's garbage. Uh, so Forty minutes from now. What time is it? No, one fifty-five. So it's two. Let's call it two. Um, so I'll be back at two. I'll just say two thirty-five.
This is a brush pen. Wow, I thought I was grabbing a chisel tip. Where are my chisel tips? I mean, I could have done it with a brush pen. I could have. Could have, should have, would have. Yeah, this is the point where I got to start putting all the pens back. Because now everything's varied with other stuff. Um... What did I say, 235? All right, I'm going to put this on mute, uh, do the scanning, grab a bite, and then be back. And hopefully my throat will be more rested because, oh boy. Um, I'm going to put this on the here while I'm scanning, but I'm going to mute. Let me do, there we go. Uh, see you guys in a bit.
Hey everybody, I'm back. Um, oh, I'm alone. Um, I'm about to start drawing Shredder. I've never, ever, ever drawn Shredder before. Um, I've drawn a handful of turtles. Um, the one with the long swords, or the sorry, the katana. Oh god, I probably just upset a lot of people uh, when they hear that. Uh, the one with Quintana, the guy with the uh, Psy, I think that's Raphael. Um, yeah, I think I've drawn those two. Uh, I have not drawn uh, the guy with the nunchucks um, or the other guy. <laughs> that doesn't help. I have I have no bona, bona fides when it comes to turtles. Um, it 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 started broadcasting a little past me. I had friends who were into it, but it just wasn't my sort of thing. I was uh, really falling in love with uh, live action movies, all those wonderful 1980s, uh, incredibly violent, stupid, sometimes uh, action movies, often with Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Willis, um, and those other guys. And so Turtles weren't in Transformers, too. I, I got lots of friends who love those Transformers. and. Um, I don't have any nostalgia for them, but I got to tell you, Shredder's cool. I, I I did see the movies. Every every version of Shredder was was uh, more pointy than the last, to the point where I think there was one where he popped up like he popped up blades, like Wolverine pops out his claws, and it went on for like a minute. We kept up popping up more and more blades from his body, and I I just love the absurdity of this. So this one. This is going to be an 11 by 17 shredder in hell. So I am like, uh, you, you can almost give me any character to draw in hell and I'm excited. And you could give me a My Little Pony character in hell and I would I would be there. Uh, I would give it my all. Uh, something about putting something in that infernal smoky environment where I can do lots of white paint effects. I'm there for it. So I get to uh, figure out what version of Shredder or come up with my own version of Shredder. Kind of like this one with like, like all the, the battle damage on them. I, I, I think this is the, the original cartoon version. Like with the weird kind of um, exacto, like uh, car, no, snapped off uh, carpet knife blades stuck onto his like his armor. Um, and... I'm not going to any of the live action ones uh, for reference because that, that would probably be too distracting. I think this might be one of the more recent animated versions. This is pretty freaking cool. This is a nice, clean, I mean, like, look at look at the jump, right? Uh, there's, there's some real nice uh, design work. It still has reminiscent design shapes from the first animation, I, I assume, in the... Uh, in the Eastman and Laird comic, and maybe the uh, I think it was Archie that originally published uh, the Turtles comics. Um, I like the more samurai headgear. Uh, I like that the um, headdress, the, instead of wrapping around the helmet, looking like a very soft uh, extra layer of helmet padding, actually becomes a what nice element. So I, I might run with this. I do like a cape though. Um, uh, but the sash is rocking. This is a very cool sash. Um, and it allows you to get that nice silhouette. So the, the, the sash is good. I figure if, if Shredder's in hell, he's going to have the hell beat out of him, if you know what I mean. Like, he's going to be, like, seriously battle damaged Shredder. So I'm leaning towards looking at these guys as design inspiration, and this one just to, to, to fire off everyone's, uh, uh, nostalgia glands to salivate in the right way um because this is this this i i don't know how to describe it this is the most naive version of a bad guy you could almost see this this would be the villain uh, villain that show up in the smurfs uh to my mind um those blades aren't they don't particularly look that threatening even though honestly if you were walking in the street and a guy was coming at you with this type of armor, with those blades on it, you'd still be scared. 
But if you're a mutant ninja turtle, you got training from Splinter, and you know how to fight bad guys, this guy would do nothing to you. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. But these guys, this guy, I like this guy a lot. Uh, this guy, I really like. Um, I like this helmet better. I like the damage on this guy. I like the little cut around the eye. It's just, it's just kind of cool, man. It's cool. There are cool things that uh, you didn't have to be into as a kid to think are cool. So I have to start figuring out. At least I don't. It's not like drawing a boar. Um, it's it's uh, it's puzzling out like what part of this character is going to be like really working for me. And my art rep just reminded me. Um, there are slots available for this weekend if you want uh, a commission uh, to be done at C2E2 at home. The page of I, I posted it everywhere except for YouTube, which uh, seemed to not want me to post uh, URLs um, to link things, Eric. So that was that's troubling. So I, I think maybe I have to be a member for longer or I have to do some sort of approval process. But if you go to let's see if I can load it up here. We go. If you go to cadenceselect.bigcartel. Or you just go to cadencecomicart.com and you go to like commissions. My commission list is open. Um, they start at 150. And um, so a 9 by 12 bust, like I did with Razorback. Um, let me pull them over. So this bad boy was 150. Uh, this full figure Mobius, uh, Arzak piece where, where the figure is more the bird and everything, but it's a full figure piece. Um, that's 225. And this 11 by 17 shredder, and you're going to see me draw it 11 by 17 shredder, um, was back, background stuff at, at my discretion. So I'm going to be adding, you know, elements of hell, smoke, clouds, rocks, lava, whatever. That is 350. If you ever want a cover quality piece, I think I think this recent Hellboy piece uh, demonstrates that pretty well. So this would be like an 11 by 17 cover quality piece. If you want something like that, that is $600, and that'll take me a long time. But you get to see me do every every single step of it. And the first person who goes to the, goes to the cadence comicart.com and commissions a cover quality 11 by 17 commission, whatever you want, I am going to throw in, I have one, this foil printed Batman print. And I love it. I don't know if I would sell a bunch of them at cons. I stopped selling 11 by 17 prints that comes recently. Um, but I have this one. And I think it looks bonkers cool. Um, so I am going to throw this in to the first person to uh, commission an 11 by 17 cover quality commission for C2E2 at home. Uh, okay, so let me take a sip of something. Um, this is hard on my throat. I, it's, I'm carrying the whole thing unilaterally in terms of like talking so it's uh, a, a little a little hard on the throat so um yeah a little sip all right let's get going here um to reiterate um uh like many of you i i i'm old well, not like many of you. Like I'm, I'm getting old and I'm wearing glasses. But when I, when I'm doing loose initial pencils, I kind of like the blurry vision. Um, and uh, so I, I end up not doing my initial sketches wearing glasses, and I, I really lean on wearing glasses when I'm inking, so I can really see the line quality and everything develop. So I'm not so much at this very, very initial phase, not so much worried about like the design of Splinter. I think I think some of the stuff I'm going to make up as I go along when I start penciling it, um, playing with shapes. But I got to think about it's like, so what type of hell I'm going to design? Because again, it's just limited um, uh, background. So it's 
just to give the presence of uh, an environment, the pre presence of an environment. Yeah. Um, I'm tempted to do like kind of like a, a standard like upshot of the villain, make him like look menacing. And then like give like almost like weird kind of like canted stalagmites of lava and everything like sitting out in like just terrible terrible i really like that sash i think i think i think i'm gonna i get largely base it on this with elements from this because this one looks more beat up um yeah so a nice full figure i get that helmet happening there you could be like looking off like that direction I get the hands, I get like those those faux wolverine claws happening. I get like he's defiantly standing in hell, ready to take on like whatever, but it's like a burning horrific landscape. Like something like that. That could work. Um I find that down shots, like when people are commissioning something, they generally don't want like a down shot of the character, like um while that will often make for a good cover uh, having like like shredder like say there's that classic x-men wolverine shot or he's in the sewer in the old burn um claremont burn austin run and he's like, he's like, ah, Wolverine's going to come back and do terrible things. And of course, I mean, he, he shows up in the next issue and gets the crap kicked out of him. But it looks so cool with Wolverine in that sewer, right? I mean, uh, that that's a down shot. So, I mean, you could do this, and I could do, like, you know, horrible, like, again, pointy ground, lava, stuff like that. That, that could work. Uh, I'm leaning, again, uh, doing, like, the upper shot of what's happening here. Um, for a while, like the back shot was like the, the biggest thing in Hollywood. Uh, I don't think I want to do like a full on back shot of, of of this character. It's like too much, too much of the visual interest is in the front or in the profile. So I could do like an upshot, like can't the horizon um, have him twisting around and looking up. And um, get that, you know, guess. And still have him looking up in that direction, All right? Uh, but then again, I, I do all the jagged, you know, terrifying hell earth, um, ground, whatever, and that works. Um, and a lot of times, either uh, for a commission, either you're going to have the character looking out at you or looking off to the right. Um, I don't know why, but it just seems that looking off to the right implies that they're either advancing towards something i think i think it's because we're you know largely trained to look from left to right but um looking looking that way also works i mean like so like he's like who knows he might be ready to fight someone that's coming in from this way uh, so he's leaning in Almost like, do, you know, he, he he's essentially Wolverine um, in terms of like what would make him work visually. So if if you can make Wolverine work in a certain pose, like um, give him the helmet there, arms, fists, claws. I'm doing my oh my god, stupid cartoon level. And we're still looking up at him. I mean, that still sort of works. Actually, I might, I don't know, you know what? I think I'm on to something here. Not that specific pose, but I think we're on to something here. Um, keep keep a, a super low ground level. 
um, have the front leg coming right towards us, potentially drawing, driving right into the pelvis. Have this leg coming back. Have a slight twist in this. You want to do it like that, yeah. <laughs> So we get all the shoulder pads here, sticking out like that. And then we get silhouetted blades going out, which is kind of attractive from a design standpoint. And we get silhouetted blades coming out like that. Everything's pointing there. Um, arms coming out here. And then we got like uh, the reverse Batman blades there. You know what, honestly, um, I might flop this. I think just in terms of like uh, visual direction, I think instead of necessarily like that, having them go at it that way, like look at it that way, like literally flip this drawing uh, may work better. Not a huge difference, but uh, Think it could actually you know tie it together that's it's got weird kind of like samurai sign things they make his hips look heavy it's got a knee pad which is always easy to do i'd probably design it to something else maybe put like an echo of uh the headpiece here I like it's got cool boots, man. Um, I don't like this this weird kind of like flap. Uh, so I'm covering that so that works. Add shin guards with blades. Well, you've got three here. Okay, not four. Blade, blade, no more blade. Um, I do like that sash. If I, if I flip them, the sash is now on this side. I like that. So I, that's another thing important uh, works for the flip. I love the silhouette of that arm. This arm's not working for me yet. Um, there's part of me that kind of wants to have the arm coming towards us and then have the fist, but then oh, I wonder if I pull like that, pull it across. Pull that arm back and have it bent more. Move towards us. Let's 
So then we get that uh, fist there and then more blades. That could work because then I get I get the silhouette simplifies. Um, in, in a sense, um, both blades are being held forward in a more threatening manner, makes them more powerful as a villain. Um, so it's chest here. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And shredder like mystery eyes. And it really looks like he's about to engage with someone. Now the question is, does if that arm's coming forward, that arm this leg should be forward. Then this one should come back. It's a little stiff. I mean, it's a more adequate gesture, but and the posing is kind of like neutral, like he's just standing there. Um, hmm. Have to think about it. Um, see, this would be a great point to actually have like live chat. Because then I could like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And then they could tell me, and that would be, you know, helpful. Yeah, I guess I guess I could have him drive forward physically more from this. So instead of um, as upright, I could actually like pull the torso back so he's actually leaning more into it. Instead of bending at the hip forward, actually have it like that. So if that leg's coming forward, it's also coming back, even though the foot's coming towards us. The Foot Clan. Um, Excuse me. And this leg, which I brought forward like that, could could stay like that. Leaning forward, like it really becomes a case of him like driving forward. All right. So this drawing told us we want to flip it. So he's facing this way. But we want to more aggressively. So he's posed leaning into it. So I can't draw over this in any means uh, of usefulness. But what I can do is I can uh, get, all right, can I actually twist this up too? So the arm's coming forward, but he's like, you know, um, his pizza pizza delivery guy uh, has a better sense of, I don't know where I'm going with that. I thought there was something funny there. And I started talking about pizza pizza, which <laughs> people outside of Ontario won't know. And I realized I had no punchline. This is live streaming, people. I have no punchline. Um, yeah. Let's see. So I got that arm. I really want that arm coming forward. So I can get those blades coming out. It's going to have, we have a nice underside shot of that. Can do his helmet, but we can obfuscate some of it, focus more on that weird diamond silhouette going on. Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> that might not work. I might need to. That twisting his rib cage down like that. He's doing that, then definitely this this leg's got to be coming forward.
Well, we definitely have more movement here. He's, he's driving forward. And even though... Oh, I'm twisting a bit. If I, if I have him driving forward there, and they, but he's twisting more. So the knee's not going that way. It's coming more towards here. That means this leg is going backwards there. It's a little bit more complex perspective. But... Um, a little bit more dynamic. Get a weird shot on the helmet though. The underside with a mask like this is a little problematic, but he's only got like black eye, black, um, black face with red eyes happening in there. So that uh, those eyes, as long as those eyes show up, I think that the brief has been met. Um, I think I want this arm down a bit more. I think, I'll, yeah, so I, I liked over here that shoulder is a little bit lower. I think I'm going to lower the shoulder. Bring the knee there. Bring the knee there. Calves. <sighs> mm. I like to pose if I actually had them like fighting demons. Like if, if this was the cover quality uh, commission, then there would be, he'd be fighting some like smaller, I'd make them look like vaguely like turtles, not necessarily ninja turtles, but I'd make them like demonic turtle creatures, like armored uh, reptiles, and then do some sort of like big balaragi type thing in the background above the fire and smoke. Like it's like it's observing or about to enter. So it'd be almost like this is the fight that Shredder has to go through in hell. And this is the the Lord of Hells that he has to defeat next. I like this. I like this figure. It needs work, of course. I like this figure, but I think I'm now leaning back after exploring that. I think this type of shot. Where he's like, he's just surrounded by hell, like hell as a landscape. I can imply stuff in in the smoky clouds in the background, but I think we, we I just end up with a, uh, well, that's not that straight up on camera when it's on the side there. Yeah, having having gone through all stuff to this, I'm coming back to here thinking that, that kind of like wide stance hero shot uh is more applicable to make shredder and hell appealing to to a viewer as a as a as a as a drawing yep i think i have to go that i have to go that route this is what i do every single day i do a whole bunch of drawing that goes nowhere but it helps me find the drawing that goes hopefully somewhere so i'm going to put this aside start working i like i still want to do the like low force perspective vanishing point so when i used to teach drawing i would teach like uh the loomis mannequin and um george brinkman's a three block figure um and here i am i'm I'm literally just scraping at proportions um so if, did that, if you pull this shoulder back and pull this shoulder forward it would still only be like that No, that torso is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. I did buy a brand of leads, and I think I'm putting them here that were from Staples, which is a local, well, I think they're in the U.S. too. Uh, office supply uh, spot. It was like the Staples brand, and they're very brittle. They're inconsistent. 
um, in terms of uh, softness, sometimes they got bits of clay and unprocessed or unmixed properly with the graphite. Um, and it just, they just break constantly. You may ask yourself, if they do that, why do I use them? Well, because I'm an artist and you spend 12 bucks on a box of leads uh, in bulk to save some money because you, you do stuff in bulk. Um, yeah, you use them. And I think I want to drop that shoulder. Hmm, I'm trying to think of like what the gesture is here. He's... Okay, so that's higher. And he's dropping the shoulder. Shoulder can be up here. Yeah, this is closer to what I want. I'm going to drop that shoulder. No, nope, I don't want that like bent. What if you drop that hip and just strung supported that? That come forward that still still sits there. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, yeah, this is getting there. Let's give a head shape. Generally speaking, when you're drawing heroic figures, you draw the head a little smaller than you would in human proportions. The human, average human proportion is um, seven and a half heads, which doesn't help anyone. But to get it properly broken down, what you do is you cut off the feet at the ankle and then you break that down into seven. Um, which is awkward as hell because that's that's just bad math. How do you naturally break this down to seven? Um, what I what I recommend is is you use eight heads, which automatically makes the the head a little bit smaller in proportion to normal human um, proportions. But we're so used to seeing film shot in a certain way where the head isn't like it's looking up at someone or any sort of stuff that the head doesn't look like it's you know, one seven and a half of the body length. So Ed's eight heads are is better. It's easy to remember. And what you can do is you can draw a stick, uh, divide that stick in half. So suddenly you have upper body, lower body. Now divide that in half, and you got the midpoint of the heads and your uh, lower half of the body. And you divide that in half, you get a head. And if you study your proportion, if you get like John. Uh, George, George Bertrand's book has it. Um, Andrew Loomis's book has it. Um, I'm thinking of, why am I blanking on his name? Do I have it over here? I mean, every, every single anatomy book will have an eight head tall figure for the most part. Um, the guy's name is Ham. It's drawing a human head and figure. And I'm not seeing it on my bookshelf, which which is weird. I must have taken it out to show somebody. Uh, oh no, here it is. 
this is if someone just learning to draw, and especially if they're younger, this is this is possibly um, the best book I could recommend. It's um, it's a real thin uh, book. Um, it's like thirteen bucks. So I bought this copy. Uh, it's from Dover. Well, I know Dover apparently went out of business, but um, there's still a lot of them on Amazon. So you can pick it up dirt cheap. And it breaks things down in a way that's great for beginning beginning artists. I mean, there's some stuff that's like very not. I mean, there's a grease pencil and coquille board that doesn't really do anything. So there's a few drawings like that. But here he is. He's breaking down the head into like an egg shape. And he breaks it down so you can put all the proportions down. Really simple, really direct forward. Then he goes into more detail, how to do it more, more mathematically accurate, how to how space out the eyes, how to actually place the features. Does a whole bunch of different examples of eyes, eyebrows. Again, this is from like, what, the 40s or 50s? Let's see what, when it was first published. Um, oh my God, this is the, fifth, the 47th printing? Or 50th printing. I'm not sure when it goes that big if that's uh hmm. So it's and I've had this for years. First printing was 1963. My gosh. Um, so this this book is 19 early night early 60s. Now, anyone designing stuff in the early 60s is probably in a mental design space of the 50s, mid to late 50s. So that explains, oh my God, this, this face is so terrifying, where he actually uses the eyes to show the spacing of everything. So if you get your eye size correctly, you can use it to place, like, okay, the mouth is going to be from the one eye width from the any point at the bottom of the jaw. The nose is the width of an eye. The space between the eyes is the width of an eye. The distance between the bottom of the eye and the nostril is an eye. The width from the side of your head to your eye is an eye, and it just looks terrible. It almost looks like this could be, you know, some sort of like monster from Greek mythology. Uh, eye step by step, really simplistic, but but he really gets into it and he explains it. Noses, look at all the noses. I mean, they're all white guy noses. Um, so I mean, late fifties, man. They're, it's all white people. It's literally all white people. He, he is when he talks about hair, it's white people hair. I mean, this, this so this book is very limited um, to when it was made. Uh, and he gets it, but the information itself is still incredibly useful. Uh, if you can master the principles as he goes through this incredibly. Um, clear simple approach to drawing everything cartooning i mean he's he, he actually did a book on cartooning and he's not a good cartoonist uh his book on landscapes is great this book is great um but this is really why i came to this i mean here we are here is um your human figure one two three four five six seven eight eight heads tall okay um and a lot of times when they do the man's eight heads tall, they say the woman's seven and a half, seven and a half heads tall. Generally speaking, everyone's roughly seven, like, unless they be, when they start getting taller or much shorter, um, the human head is is kind of like a, a, a somewhat consistent thing because it wants to have the brain of a certain size. Um, so really, really tall people, they start drifting off into real eight, head, eight heads, eight and a half, nine heads tall territory. Um, because their body just grows in proportion to the skull. And the same with people who are much shorter. Their head stays relatively the same size as other human adults. Um, but their, their physical body proportions get smaller. But here we are. We have an eight head tall figure. And the easiest way to get there, draw a stick about the height of the character you want to draw. Right? Divide it in half. There's your midpoint. That's right at the crotch on, on your eight head tall male figure. Divide it right in half. There's uh, there's the nipples, but there's the head there, head there. Uh, divide that in half. There's your, your navel. At the halfway point between the crotch and the ground is essentially the bottom of the knee, and then your feet are are sitting in that bottom half 
of that last head. Uh, might even be less. No, it's about, I think the ankle's about halfway between. Um, so it's like, you know, just getting those heads a little bit better proportioned. Um, so that's how you can really get your figure really well done there. So um, here, my shredder. See, I'm bringing it back to the drawing. I, I did all this digression, but I'm bringing it back to this drawing. My shredder here, he's essentially an a head tall figure. I want that. Can't it, but it's going straight. Maybe have that swoop more. That's coming out. I want the hip coming there. Dusting forward. Shoulder dropping back, shoulder going forward. And then I have the arm coming down. You can see that the fingertips generally run at the midpoint of the thigh. So if you arc out from there, you know, your, your fist is going to be around there because the fingers are cooked up. So you can actually get good, good in drawing uh, adjustments to uh, proportions by just comparing the other parts of the anatomy. Uh, this is coming out towards us. Give him his claws. Getting there. Getting there. Still not in love with it. Um, not quite ready to break out the reference figure for posing, um, which honestly, if this was like just a commercial job, it'd probably be the first thing I'd do. I'd, I'd probably pose a figure, take a bunch of phone pics to get uh, an idea of like how I get the gesture going. I, I don't like leaning on, and, and what I'm talking about is. One of these guys, uh, one of these uh, drawing, I, I guess they're really the, for collectible costume things, but a bunch of artists started using them for reference because the proportions and posability is pretty good. Um, uh, problem is I bought, I bought a, I, th I thought, you know, the Captain America guy there, uh, this Chris, uh, had a pretty good generic heroic head. Um, and this is like just one of the standard, I guess, Fison or TB league figures with like a, a steel uh, frame, certain amount of posability. Um, it's great because the silicone moves in a certain way. In certain parts of the body, when you where you, you you deform and everything, it really gets you a sense of what 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 the anatomy is going to do. But not the joints. The joints are are mush. So you have to know your anatomy still to make this work. Um, yeah. So. Good back muscle placement too so you get the rhomboids and all that stuff and the traps but yeah i bought this guy and the head is a little small and some and there's so many aftermarket heads they don't necessarily fit on the socket so i, I think i stuck some um putty in there uh like a needed eraser or something to keep it from falling off uh the really bad one is i got uh i got a female one and the head is way small uh, like really, really embarrassing. I'm not going to put her on camera. She doesn't have any clothes on, and she just ends up falling down everywhere and gets dirtier and dirtier as as uh, as it goes on. Um, yeah, and now I'm actually starting to pose them for what I want. So maybe I'm going to go through the process. Maybe I'm actually going to use a reference on camera during live stream. Okay, so I want that. Yeah, kind of like, you know what? I was, I was going to have him like twisted like that and have that arm kind of drop back. Oh, that still kind of works too. That's, how's, uh, does that work? So you'd be looking, I don't want to use this camera as a reference. So it, you'd be like that. Ah, oh, this hand kind of gets. I want those claws to read. And if I get them at the angle like that, that claw reads. 
but this clock doesn't. So what if I... you could be making a fist? I got fists that come with this figure. If you guys are looking at this, they're like about, I think they're about 150 bucks. Um, for the figure, the heads are about 40 bucks each. So you can just, you don't need the head. Here we go. Yeah. See, there's a rubber muted eraser. I don't think you need the head really. Uh, if you can draw reasonably well, but it helps. Uh, just crush it. Back. I'm doing okay. Uh, <laughs> erg. Um, yeah. So I did that, then the claws up. Nah, that doesn't work. I, I can. Nah, if I do that, then he's he's doing this. It's gonna cross twist. Still can be. Still want that. Twist. Like going back. Like that leaning back. Let's force the pelvis forward a bit. Bend the knees. I know people who use like 3D poser software. Um, I guess that's okay. Um, because every you know everything that gets you to the end results like fair game. But I like these because I can actually draw from these, get a real sense of um let's get this hip twisted a bit more. Here we go. Yeah, this looks like this looks more like the pose of someone who's like ready to take on all comers, right? Yeah. Okay, like I can put them on a shelf over here. And I can draw him. Part of the reason that um, the shelf's up here just for like supporting all my lights and everything. But it becomes it comes in handy when I'm like posing stuff for reference. Um, and knocking stuff over. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I guess that, that kind of serves as a point, so I can like sketch from that. What I could also do, and I really recommend artists do this a lot. We we all have smartphones. If you have a figure like this, or any any sort of reference figure, take a bunch of smartphone pics to get an idea of the range of possibilities. I'm not necessarily like take a picture and copy it, uh, but um, and. Uh, uh you can really re realize that okay if you move in you get a different perspective you move out you move a different angle just by looking at it through your through your camera gives you a radically different look at like what you can do um here that's good still think that arms to it but i can i can redraw that that's my inner elbow. There we go. Um, there you go. So I, I took a, a photo, for example. Let's see if we can look at. So it's right there. I can like literally just put this down here, and I got uh, my reference photo. See, already I don't like the arm placement, so I, I I'm going to change that. Um, as I draw the figure, but now I have these shapes I can work with. Um, I can push that perspective a lot more. Put the head there. I'm not even really paying much attention to proportions right now. I just literally taking that information from posing the figure, um, put it down here. Yeah, I don't I don't like the, how high the arms are. 
but I can I can easily fix that. His butt's winking out a little too much. Coming towards us, so I forced the perspective around his ankle a little bit more. I hope this is serving as like you know tips, like how to use reference. Uh, I've seen people who take pictures of uh, the Sigma photo, uh, Sigma, Sigma, Fison figures. I, I think that was me merging Fison and figure together into one word. I see, I see them take photos and just trace them off. And that's kind of like, that defeats the point. I find I'd much rather uh, pose the figure, get a real sense of uh, the anatomy that you have going on, but also be able to get a gesture from drawing from it from essentially life. Um, cause I can move and change things, uh, quite a bit here. Um, I think my problem is not so much that the arms are swinging out this high. I think my problem is that, um, the, 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 the positioning, like this is almost pleading. It's like, why? Or, whereas, you know, of course, I mean, I don't think ending up in hell would be a happy event for any villain. Um, but I think if I get slightly angrier shapes here, and you can see, I'm I'm really just I'm using the reference so I can actually get a sense of the silhouette of the figure reading as a shape. Because one, one of the clear things that a lot of artists fail at, one of the clear things, one of the things a lot of artists fail at is the clarity of the pose. Um, the viewer, the reader, the, the faster they understand the pose and the action, the faster they grasp what you're doing in the story. So that, that level of simplicity uh, of action, I think Eisner goes into it in uh, pretty good, inf pretty, pretty clear terms in his first book on drawing comics and, and the clarity of the silhouette. I might even go grab my, I'm pretty sure my copy is like sitting right over here. Um, I can grab my copy and actually flip to that spot. Put my comic pages on it. There we go. Here we go. I bought this when it first came out. So this probably is first printing. It's um, been read an awful lot of times. Yeah, this is this is first printing. I didn't get the hardcover though. There was a hardcover simultaneously simultaneously published. Um, Expressive and adding 100. Let's go there. I think I'm pretty sure that's there. Here we go. Um, we talked about early cave drawings, Egyptian friezes. But here it's like a micro dictionary of gestures where he goes on about how the silhouette, and these are all silhouette drawings. These silhouette drawings deliver so much of the information to a comics reader or even somebody who's viewing an illustration. If your gesture delivers the emotion, it does most of the narrative work for you. Um, confused, busy figures where you can't clearly see what's going on um, don't, don't help you in any way. Um, I think, does he go into... Figures that don't make sense. Well, he's talking about like, you know, finding the ideal figure to, to get the action across, which is good. But I don't think he actually. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. All right. So, yeah. So you, you want a certain clarity of your gesture and figure um, before you proceed, because if especially if you have a complicated costume, you want to clearly see the pieces. You don't want to obfuscate the figure uh, in it. Um, it's, it's very important that uh, the viewer gets to um, understand 
what they're looking at as 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 po quickly as possible because if if they have to puzzle over what they're looking at, it's a very good chance that they're going to think it's not very good because it's not clear. Um, you can be cool and dynamic and everything, but you have to be clear to really effectively get that that stuff off. You get it work as as a storyteller. Probably, you know, I'm going to draw the feet. I'm probably going to end up having like, you know, sheet cracks and stuff and light coming out. So it's like the feet are going to be lost as a silhouette. Um, forearms. I do kind of want, yeah, you know what? Okay, so it's back there, back there. So forearms going to be coming back there. I'm going to do a big fist here. Big ball of anger fist. And then he's going to have those claws. And I'm going to give him the same claws in both hands, even though I don't know if Shredder, that's the Shredder design. And uh... and again, I might flip this. I'm, I'm going back to where I had... Um, well, if he's kind of more, more or less looking up, i to bring the head back down here a bit. He's got that samurai helmet that's kind of like messed up. I keep that clear. So keeping that working there is good. Then he's got that weird funky headdress. Yeah, the one thing I don't like about my my sketch right now is I'm burying the headdress a bit because that's that's catch a kind of a distinctive element now. But I can, as long as I can get that pointiness across, because that seems to be the key point, the key element of that design, that that extra spikiness. He's got the jaw cover. Got chest armor, and because I have the figure and it has like the line going down here, I can actually visualize where exactly that chest armor is going to go down to the pubic bone. Pecs are going to come around here, serrata here, so that we have that element there. They're in plates, so they're going to get thicker. He's even got like shoulder samurai uh, shoulder plates, I guess. And they float around, so they're going to curve around. And he's got the armor coming up arc, which makes his shoulders look really monstrously huge. And curve down, come back around. And when I get into it, like when I actually start penciling this for real, because this is just me all planning drawing, figure out anatomy. That kind of thickens them up. He's a little more muscular than I'm drawing him right here. Um, but I want I want that kick that uh, figure clear. I want to be when I move. I put it down in the wrong spot. Is this my opportunity to open the 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 long awaited new move box that's been sitting here forever? It is. Why don't you turn up right after I do the erasing? Oh, being defeated by the uh, eraser packaging. Hang on. The cardboard shredded ev everywhere except where I needed it to. There we go. Gonna show you guys a fresh moo eraser. They come in nice little boxes. I think I think you know everyone assumes that you know everyone's gonna be very carefully using the uh, the eraser only in the holder. This holder doesn't last it long at all. I get rid of it almost right away. And to show you how soft, I mean, look at look how soft that is. I mean, that's a stupidly soft vinyl eraser. Um, there have been times when I like I just want to cut uh, erase something really really fine, so I'll cut a point out of the eraser just so I can get that edge in. 
I don't know why it seemed like it seems important to do sometimes at the time. Um, still not in love with the arm placement yet, and I'm probably gonna fiddle with that. But we're getting close. I, I still might flip it because I like the sash sitting. So, so he's wearing his armor here. That's where his navel is. The sash is coming across. Back down. Slash back down. Then he's got the those pelvic samurai plates. New pads, of course. And then he's got that weird kind of like this. I'm gonna have to re redesign that. That's either gonna be more of a cloth, I, or I'm gonna look up what what samurais actually wore in terms of armor, and then use something that goes that. Because this this just feels. I understand they, they, they you have to minimize the uh, space uh, where you design things in animation. I've I've done some uh, limited design for animation. Most of the stuff I done was for video games and movies and stuff. Um, animation's hard. Good animation designers are 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 worth more than gold. Uh, that's why I'm not an animation designer. Um, but uh, yeah, but for an illustration, this is kind of lackluster. Yeah, I think I'd, pro I'd probably pull up like what samurai actually wore in terms of armor around their hips and everything, because I I, I think these weren't curved. I think they had flat layers of lamellar armor there and i'm not quite sure what they wore to protect their crotch um so i might come up with something that's a little more samurai specific or i just might make something up on the spot that i, I hopefully think looks cool because i like the sash but i'm not liking these 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 weird hip pads um i think i'm going to make them a little more chunky I'm going to do another pass on this, and I'm going to make him a little more muscular. This arm can be bigger, I think. Um, I might actually give him, like, super chunky, like, arm armor. Like, just, like, big, like, you, if you remember Joe Quesada and Jimmy Palmiotti's Ash, and they, they had these massive bracers um, on, on the main character's arms. They just they just looked cool. It's like it's like two two of Hellboy's gloves on the end of uh the guy's uh arms. So that that looks kind of cool. I, these are mm, I'm having a problem with they don't they work fine for me because they look more like what the samurai wore, like those flat plates of lamellar armor. The, the completely bending it around the form um makes me wonder how the hell they'd work. So I'm not not in love with them at that point. Um, not entirely in love with how the armor here is. I might do something different there. So there's a knee pad. There's a part of me uh, because we just did Mobius. I almost want to give him like like uh, evil looking Mobius boots and and uh, and give him the blades on the uh, on the shin guards. And he's got like layers of stuff on his feet. This is coming down. What did I like about the other helmet here? Let me pull there it is. So what I liked about this helmet um, was first off, you got some nice, nice, you know, battle damage, and the shape is less busy. And he has kind of like a collar around to go with the cape. Um, but I really like that that uh, trident like helmet element. So instead of looking up, I might have him looking down at the viewer. So I'd redraw the head so he's looking down at the viewer. I think I think that's where I'm going to go with that. Right, so let's. Flipping is a good way to immediately see if there's uh, anything that you really want to, I don't even need to reference anymore. Close the camera down before I kill the battery. Um, so this is working for me, like the leg position and everything. 
I can I can do stuff with that. The hips are going good. I kind of these things are really bothering me. I will I think I will dig up some reference on that. I like I think I want a bit more of a twist happening here, which will bring his sternum here. But keep that there. Yeah, I think I like the reverse better. Um, let's give him that there. So the sternum's there. It's running up there. Deltoids are going to start there. Deltoids are going to start there. So that's going to change a lot of like my arm positioning. Pop his head up. Yeah, I'm going to have him looking straight at uh, the viewer. And do I want him head like that or like? Yeah, I'm going to have him. His body's going different direction. If his head's more straight up and down looking at the, uh, the viewer, I think that works a little bit better. I like, I like the simpler helmet. But I want to keep that trident, keep that trident coming off of his eyes. That, uh, immediately putting a scowl in really works as a design element. Yeah, I think that I think that's going to work better. Yeah, it's already feeling like a more dynamic pose. Give me a second. I am going to go over to my desktop and I am going to look up like what samurai armor looked like as a better reference point. Um, so. I'll print it out so you guys can see it. Um, Wow, of course, of course, there's thousands of types right off the bat. There's some nice limit, more limited stuff. They got some cosplay samurai armor, which is pretty damn cool. Uh, they got some like over the top, like ornate, almost probably it must be. Um, oh, I like this a lot. I can see where they. Uh, Where they play elements they took for the shredder. It's a video game design. I only need like one or two pictures of uh, to get the information I want. Okay, so I like this one. Open image. Print. Uh, let me get this bigger so I can look at it. Let's make it like 150. Yeah, good. Print that. Same sort of view. Um, maybe I only need this. I like a lot of the elements in this. Like a lot of the elements in there, I can easily bring that over to Shredder. Um, yeah, I, th I think I'm going to go a little visually crazy with what I want to do with this guy. So here, this is a good picture. This is a good picture. Uh, more settings.
Because if I remember correctly, Shredder was a samurai. Um, and Splinter was his pet. And there was some sort of like magical spell thing that kicked this off. Um, so what I like, I, I like this treatment of uh, pelvis armor a lot more. A lot more. Um, uh, the sash, I can see where they got the sash because they got rid of the, the katana and everything. Um, I don't like the, yeah, and it's like they are layers of plates. They're slightly curved. They're not wrapping around. Like I've drawn a lot of this, this armor that kind of wraps around. It, it, it gets old fast. Um, I like these plates. I like the layers of the plates going in different directions. Um, I like that he has a collar here. And I think that's like a gorget that comes underneath the mask, touch the front of the throat. And there's more of a flare happening here. Uh, but I do like I like this design of the the head spike. I right, clean it up later. Don't worry. Um, Splinter always has that mask, so I don't feel like I don't feel comfortable getting rid of like key design elements. So I have that mask. Neither samurai is actually wearing. Well, this guy's got something that looks like a bit of a gorget or at least a, like a scarf or something. So if I gave him sort of scarf going around there, that works. And what if instead of the chest armor that we have over here, so that I go for... Um, And then this wraps around. And put a design element in there. Get the shoulder pads and the shin pads and the and the uh, uh, bracers on his forearm are very key elements to the character. So instead of going too much to the samurai thing, what I can do is I can uh, level up shoulder pads and have them curve around a bit and then he has to have the spikes hanging off so i do clear spikes there um i do a spike I do a spike here, and do we see another one going? I said no, I don't think we do. But here we have this. So we have that spike I just drew there. This one still peek out there, and this one would still peek out there. Shallower, having having more of the wraparound armor here. I can actually. Do some detail stuff there. He's got the sash going right across on top. So I can do the sash button that I really like here with the shredder symbol. Didn't they, you know, have to wear a foot or something? That was the name of the group, right? The foot. Um, so we have the sash come across, and that gives us a good design point to do the layer of the lamellar armor. And oh, there's a big white belt, it seems like, right there. So we have that, but that overlaps. Pretty reason I feel it. 
That overlaps a longer set of armor that comes underneath this, these lamellar plates. I can do that like fabric. So I can do patterning, texturing things here. Um, have uh, say a heavily quilted fabric. Come over there. Do the same thing on this leg. It starts just above, the, stops just above the knee. Um, give them the knee pads, and I got to tell you, considering you know what he is, I think we got to we got we got to put a couple of spikes on his kneecaps. Like blades, so we can shred with his kneecaps. Like just by, you know, kneeing a guy in the in the groin, suddenly it's serious, serious stuff. Um, then we give him the uh, shin plates. This is going in, in a place I'm more comfortable from a design standpoint. Um, I do like I do like the the rivets. Wonder if I think I can plot those out and they'll make sense. Um, I think under the shoulder I'm going to do more of that quilted fabric. He has he has the shoulder plaid, so I don't think he needs the. Uh, the, the the samurai plates under his arm so i'm going to do that so spike spike and just one spike here that's working better i think um lamellar sorry uh padded fabric coming over, over this arm and both these guys have like really heavy fabric Around here, I think what I can do is I can I can lean into the superhero convention and just give them like really you know, muscular stuff there. And then he's going to have the big chunky blade bracers. And um, these are cool blades. These are cool blades. I'm not so much about, uh, I like the idea of these becoming one piece with the forearm guards. So um, I just like literally have them come like this and then and then we have um, one blade that shows up there on the underside. And same thing here. So a lot of blacks will get spotted in here with like extra details. This would be quilted. You'll wear armor his feet. Do that, yeah, okay. And then extra blade showing up here. Shredder have, where did I put that really cartoony one? Shredder have more spikes on his head or no? I've already done so many sketches for this character. 
not there. I stick up the other Oh my gosh, there we go. Okay, so Shredder didn't have any spikes on his head in the early edition. I wish I had the Turtle comics, uh, like the real original Eastman and Laird ones, to see what those guys did. I do like the bit of cape, so I kind of like. So if I was doing this in color, I'd have the fabric. I'd actually have a scarf of some sort, and then I have the sash, and it'd be the same color, so it'd repeat as an element through the uh, the design. But yeah, this is already feeling like a shredder I can get behind. Uh, if that makes sense, in terms of like my drawing. Um, yeah, let me take a look. I, I really like those rivets. I think those are really, really cool. These little rivets on the armor. And it looks like they're going across in like a diamond pattern. So I should be able to... Um... Mm -hmm. I want to rub it there. Oh, did I, did I burn this lead out already? I did. Here we go. Second lead. Um, no, that's that's how badly I placed the uh, grad. And what I can do is I can do the same thing where it's like there's shadow all the way down through here. And it's like a shine right through there. How metallic should Shredder's face mask be? It's so dark in this piece. And again, this is this is the one I like the most of all of them so far. But even then, I don't like certain elements. Um, and I still want to do like some sort of battle damage on them. Um, I'm a scarf like that. No, nah, I'm not going to have it come out. Yeah, this feels much more like um, something I can get behind drawing. Look how much of it transferred because I flipped it. So I can't use that piece of paper. Uh, but I'm getting to the bottom of the pad. So what I can do is I can take both sheets of paper. I want it to be higher up on the page. So the trick I do when I want to be high on the page, either I fold the page or I just rip it off. Um, get a ruler. Doesn't have to be too straight. And um, so when I put it underneath, I can just shove it all the way up there. And I can also like shove it over a bit to the side. Doesn't matter if it comes out of the side of the pad too much. There's some more center, yeah. Yeah, so before I actually like launch fully into the this big 11 by 17, you know, Shredder and Hell thing, I, I better have Shredder figured out. And I think I'm about, what, 70% there? Uh, unless I radically change my mind on something. Um, I, I think he's going to look more like a samurai here. Um, there's part of me that wants to give him like a, at least a Wakazashi, uh, if not a katana. I mean, that just the katana, the length of the katana would would break this up funny. But a Wakazashi just right here, like across his waist, would create like an echoing line to uh, the arm there. And that might be nice to allow me to do some like breakup detail here on these these pieces around the hips. Um, hmm. Hmm. 
things that make you go, hmm, oh, I should probably move the camera up a bit uh, so you can see all the. I, I think I think the upper body is more important to the feet. At least Rob Liefeld thinks so. Um, double check the time. Uh, we've been on for going on seven hours. It's almost four. I took a break at 2.35. I should take my next break at... I finished my break at 2.35. I should take my next break at 4.35. All right. So I'm going to give myself half an hour uh, while drawing here to figure this out. Get a nice pencil, pencil figure here um, that I can I can scan and re be ready to, to put on the board the ink. And it also gives me... Uh, and then when I come back, I can figure out the environment so it supports this shape better. Uh, and some of what I'll mean is literally just putting the figure that I'm happy with under transparent bond and then drawing backgrounds on top of it. And when I have that all happened, um, I, I definitely will get it started before the end of today because we end at um, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time, which will be seven. No. What time do I end today? Um, I think it's supposed to go till 6 p.m. Eastern. Let me double check. I want to have a good understanding of how much I'm going to get done today. Uh, 7 p.m. Central, which would be 6 p.m. my time. Yeah. So, no, hold it. That's backwards. That's 8 p.m. my time. Okay, I should be able to finish this piece tonight. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so let me, let me work on this, get this figure sorted. Yeah, I got a drink. Um, yeah, yeah, so there's four hours left total. I'm going to take another 15 minute break in half an hour, uh, and then I'll be working right through to eight. And I think... Uh, I'll definitely have all the pencils done. I I absolutely am convinced I will have the background figured out. Uh, I'll scan it, print it out, and board, and I'll definitely be inking before the end of the day. And then I'll, that means um, if I don't finish tonight, I'll be launching into it um, tomorrow uh, with a partially inked piece. Um, yeah, I think I think the shape is working. Uh, now to start refining. I like the curvature of that that headpiece. So let me let me refine the head here. I like the scarf I'm going to have happening here. That's going to create like a slightly more interesting level of. Do I want? scarf coming out like there's there's always that thing where it's like if you do a scarf do you do you like the scarf like bill sinkovich did the shadow scarf where it goes for like six feet beyond the body which is pretty cool um and i could i could actually have that come out here but i don't do the wakizashi the scarf can come out through here it replaces the sash uh i still might you know i might i might do that 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 shredder button as like a belt buckle. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Let's let's do the. So this is spinning around like that. Um, oh, I know what I'm gonna do. All right, so I'm gonna have the scarf at the front come through here. It's gonna be raggedy and torn and everything. And then I'm gonna have another one coming out through the back, like that. There we go. Okay, so I get to do that scarf. Um, let's give him a more blunt top of the helmet. So it at least emulates samurai helmet a bit. Have that come back there. Yeah, shredder and hell. Um, okay, cool. Just just check quickly checking chat to see if there's anything I had to add. So people are already answering for me, which is great. 
I start doing more streams. I'm definitely going to be streaming with friends. Uh, so I'm not carrying everything because my throat's starting to starting to go, man. Um, Terrifying little red eyes here. Yeah, that works to me. Anyway, it works for me. All right. So I think I got the helmet where I want. Maybe narrow this down a bit. Get a little more of a swoop happening here. Um, you know what? I'm going to put lines in anyway, but I'm not going to do the uh, the layered lamellar stuff. I'm going to do some lighting stuff. Uh, it, it's, he's going to be bottom lit for the most part. There's going to be some atmospheric light coming up above. So he's um, there's going to be a shadow cast from the scarf. This is going to be black. This is going to be black. Um, This is probably going to be mostly silhouette with some lighting effects on it. So I want the silhouette, I want the eyes to pop out of this. But having knowing that there's this detailed information, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to do this. There we go. Messes up his his lines a bit, but knowing that this this information's underneath is going to change how it lights. It'll just create more visual information in there. Um, shoulder pads. Mm, I kind of want to curve that. Don't have that. Then we don't have. Then we have this one here. Here we go. So I have a like a pattern coming through there. Then that would repeat on the way back. Did I get a good shot of like what's going on uh, Samurai's back, or did it completely get covered up? Yeah, no idea what's going on in the back there. I do like the idea of like having the nice gap here. And having it more tight on his arm there. Um, let's get the lambler going right down into the forearm there. I'm going to have this come back. Now I can't actually see what I designed it because I did all that rendering over it. <clears throat> it's going to be mostly black, so I don't have to worry about that at all. Um, I'm not sure why these pieces are here because it would they would jam into the breastplates. Um, generally smoother shapes. So let me pull that out. And it actually allows this to match up a bit. And then we have like almost like a lightning strike coming up for the armor there. It's 
scarf's going to cover that. So I have the arms going to be like that, and then it's going to curve around. So that works. Have the line, the shadow line. We have the blade coming off of there. Medial line. We have the blade coming off of there. And we have the top line, blade coming off of there. And we're going to see that blade. So that's going to be. We're going to actually see a lot of blades on that shoulder because of the angle. The scarf's going to be blocking that. Have this come back there. Actually, I want this to curve a bit. I know Shredder's not about uh, curves, but I don't want him to be stabbing himself. All right, so. And we have this flop down there. That works. Then we have this popping up there. We have heavily quilted armor there that creates a nice pure metal drive it oh, maybe i'll let this one up more here we go so i want a lot of lines working in synchronicity to drive the figure up so we have this everything's coming to a point with this head i don't want to pull these in a bit so let's pull like that so i do i want to get this Yeah, I think I'm going to, even though it's like bending in space, I think I still want this to be the tallest of the spikes in this helmet. I think that'll just work better. And knee pads with the spikes I've added. Let's make them bigger. Do I want three? Three might be overkill. Um, <laughs> who are we talking? Who cares? It's overkill, man. Do it, do it. Um, two blades here on either part of his kneecap. Have the armor come up around the ankle, widen out there. It's got. Wow, that foot got big fast. Let's give him a couple more blades here. Yeah, I'm really pushing the perspective a bit, but I kind of like it. And, um, there's going to be a lot of atmospheric stuff happening here at the uh, foreground at ground level. So um, even though a lot of this is going to be like, there's going to be like light sources from every way. So you're going to have like shadow cast from that blade. Um, won't be any there. Um, this is black. So this, this blade will really pop. I can probably do a bit of a, a gleam of white paint off of it. Pop the shoe will be in shadow because it's right at ground plane. Yeah, it'll just look it'll just look spooky, man. Spooky. Um, let's get
a good thing he doesn't ride horses, I tell you. I mean, uh, the horses would hate him because he'd always be poking holes in them. Excuse me. Um, all right. So I got this. Got the quilting. Let's create a nice black shape. Everything moves up. Let's get these. Why do these blades? Why do these blades point down? Who is he gonna hit? Like he's gonna have to fully extend his toe point down, lift up his knee, and then slide his shin down someone. Or is he just hoof someone upwards? These spikes go right into them. Man, I got to tell you, I'd make a better shredder, better shredder upper. All right, and then this one pointing slightly away. Okay, so I think I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going to end up, this is going to be solid black. A lot of this is going to be solid black uh, with the lighting effects. Do the belt. Let's get these gauntlets. Start the back curve. Start the back of the hand and then curve. This way. There's another one here. And then this one comes out. So there's nothing but points everywhere. All right. Um Yeah, I think that works. I think that works. I don't I don't know that I want uh I could I could actually gap in that and then have it come up wider. How does that work? See that becomes black, this drops in. Uh doing things like this just becomes a um a good break, visual break point to uh, just just so it's not just all straight lines and smooth and everything. So by just dropping a little divot in his, uh, his bracers here, um, it just has a different visual effect on it. And uh, by mirroring it here, it just looks more designed to engineering e engineered engineered. Come like that, come back up. Uh, and then the back one, more prominent. And then the one that's on the other side is not very prominent. And we got his hands here as well. All right, I'm not, I'm not doing too bad. I, I wanted to have this penciled by, by 4.30. And uh, I got nine minutes. 
this is gonna be black. So I can, let me finish the lamellar or the armor going across the front here. Just come out from underneath. Okay, uh, I want that one highlight to run around through there. So I got to. On the fence, but doing those rivets, I like them on the actual armor, but for a one off piece like this, they might just get lost. I might, I might hold off deciding on those until. <clears throat> until I'm actually inking. Well, you know, if I make that call. And it's better to have them placed. All right, so let me. All right, so rivet, 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 rivet. Um, mm -hmm. No, I did that wrong. Rivet, 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 rivet. Then. Pull it up there, rivet, no rivet, rivet. God, I sound like a frog. Rivet. I want to do the quilting on the leggings there. Let me take another look at how they. So this one has really, really, really cool studs on it. I don't know if you can see that in the picture. It's got like actual studs on, on like discs. And this one, I'm not quite sure what it is. And this one I can see like there's like layers of thread going through. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to add a uh, not particularly price, precise pattern. It'll just rhythm, rhythmically run through. Um, you'll see when I'm making it, but you're going to see that uh, I'm going to do this. And it's going to create the illusion that I did all this planning for a pattern um, without having done all the planning for a pattern. That. Okay, yeah, so this would be dark. So I, I, if I do the rivets, so the underlight, a highlight will hit the under part of the breastplate um, and get darker as it goes up towards the head, just like the, the these will get darker, like the top of the, the shoulder pads and that. Um, and then I'll just do a little white paint on each on each rivet divot. Um, and I'll make them pop even though you can't see them. So I don't have to do a tremendous amount of like super detail planning. Now to get this, so I wanted to come around to there, there like that. Yeah, they, see this one looks like it goes all the way around hanging down like that. So I think that's what they do. So I'm going to
yeah, as long as I'm rendering within the the idea that there's a grid there and there might be some highlights, it's going to make it easy to create uh, a, a sense of fake detail. Now I'm saying a lot of things like fake detail, um, implied detail is probably a better term um, because I'm I'm not doing, the idea is to create a visually busy aspect to a piece. Um, so the little bit that the viewer can uh, really clearly see, like when I get into the detail here, the detail in the hands, I tighten this hand up a bit more too. Um, we'll read immediately as like really detailed, strong, solid work. So once the reader sees or the viewer sees those aspects, um, they assume that I put the same level of attention to detail into areas where it looks like things are thought out. Um, it's it's visual closure. Um, and, uh, I think, I, th I, I think you, you see those artists who draw every single detail. I think, I think they realize they should learn that they can take some time off if they, if they figure a way around it. <laughs> That's not a diss. It's not a diss. I want this to be heavier though. I'll go through here. I don't know. I think that, I think that's working. I think that's working as my shredder. What do you guys think? Um, how many people are actually watching? Right? No one's watching right now. Oh no, I'm all by my lonesome. Um, I had a bunch of people tell me they're going to watch it and rerun. I, I don't know if the whole stream can actually go go up because this is this is going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of stream, man. I think I got my shredder designed. All right. And since this is 11 by 14 paper, this is perhaps a little bigger than he needs to be. So I might end up reducing him. But to figure out the background, I need a larger pad. So I can take this out since he's going to sit this much in the foreground. I can put him on a bigger pad. Wow, last penalty on that pad. So if I got them like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that could be, it's going to have to reduce a little bit. Um, I want some of the environment to come across. Time wise, 4.30, all right. Um, 
got time time to do a uh, a new note as I take a another fifteen minute break. Uh, Shredder to help out here. That visible. All right, let's move it over a bit. And give me a chunky marker again. There we go. I wonder if this one works. All right. Uh, five, two, five, I'll do four, four, five, uh, four fifteen. All right, see you guys in 15 minutes.
Hey everybody, I'm back. Um, great. Okay, so we're going to be going through the last part of today. Um, this is wrapping up and um, two hours, two hours. I think it is. Oh man, my brain, my brain's putting right now. Um, I've never had to talk on my own this much ever. <laughs> Next time I do this, I'm definitely gonna gonna partner up with some uh, some people. Uh, have like a like a little mini online comic convention. Get some other artists, and we'll all be on Twitch or something, or or here on YouTube. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think this is the last two hours. I I, I I've already looked it up, but it's fallen outside of my head completely. 7 p.m. CST. So that means I'm going to eight. So I got three more hours to go. Oh my gosh! I don't know if I can make the full eight hours. If if I look up and there's no one watching at at uh, seven o'clock my time, I might just say, "Oops, I'm done." <laughs> um. So yeah, I got to figure out the the background for the shredder, and um. Uh, which will finalize the composition. I'm pretty happy with the figure. So I'm going to be doing all the um, design work entirely around making this guy work. Um, I was thinking about this while I took my break, instead of like just relaxing and recovering my throat. Um, I think I'm going to put him closer to the top. And I'm going to have him standing on, I've done this before, it's it's kind of a fun gimmick, uh, kind of like crackle lava ground. Um, so he's, he's being lit from underneath. And I can do things like, you know, have like weird kind of like mini volcanoes of, of uh, lava come through. Um, so basically, all I'm going to be doing is I'll be breaking down these shapes. And these things will be spewing like light and shadow. So it's. So I want them basically. So we got this, got this. I want him backlit almost everything, but I also want the idea that there's like clouds and shadows coming through here. So I have like these weird kind of like like just erupt turn points. It's hell after all. You can make up shit. Um, so that could be all in shadow. Have that come in like that. And then the real dark points are kind of like all pointing at. So I'll, I'll find an echo point for visual echo point for uh, stuff in the ground coming through, pointing everything towards Shredder here. And I'll just yeah okay this this kind of like wow that that was a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. All right, let me scan this, assemble it, and um, get to inking. See, I, I'm pretty sure I can finish inking this. In three hours, unless I go on like a really big um, digression on on like I've been doing all day. Um, I don't know. You put up an earlier sketch. Uh, did I save any? Everything's been like been dumped into the. Uh, you know what? Oh, yeah, here it is. Everything's been getting dumped in the recycle bin really quickly, just, just to keep the studio from getting overwhelmed with all this stuff. Uh, 
Um, Photoshop, import. And um, yeah, as soon as I'm, I'm happy with all this, how this all uh, sorts out, I'll print it off on some nice high quality uh, Bristol. Um, actually, I'll, I'll use my favorite Bristol in the market right now is Eon uh, uh, comic art boards. Uh, I believe Joe Casada before he, uh, he he quit Marvel um, actually ordered. Uh, all the marble boards to be the the uh, eon boards. Ah, I've been streaming for going on eight hours. Oh my god! Oh my god! Um, so, so 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 no, I wrapped at six. Oh my gosh, I'm wrapping in an hour. No, because it's seven. This goes to seven. It's seven in Chicago when it's eight here. This is how brain dead I am at the moment. Yes, I'm going to eight. So I got three hours. I should finish this tonight. Um, no, hang on. Yeah, it's just a long day. It just feels like so insanely long. Um, even though I, I routinely put in 12 hour days in my studio, I think the constant talking. Um, is is just that much more uh, fatiguing. Um, cool, what it does. All right, I'm scanning the background. Let me just go straight to scan with that. Um, yeah. So the one the time difference in trying to continually adjust for it for how long I'm doing here. So if it's mm, yeah, I started at nine because oh wait, hold it. Am I really messing this up? This feels like such a ridiculous thing. So it's 11 here when it's 10 in Chicago. So I actually started two hours earlier than I should have. That's what I did wrong. And that's why it's messing with me. All right. Okay. I get to sleep in tomorrow. I feel so much better that I get to sleep in tomorrow. Um, yeah. Okay. That's what I did. I started too early because I, I did. The, I flipped the reverse part of it. I, I started earlier instead of starting later than Chicago time. Um, so, yeah, I'll still go to the end of Chicago time today, but I'm going to start proper time tomorrow. I started too early because I just panicked because, you know, it's what you do. At least what I do when convention time's happening. All right. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Let's go curves. Black value there and the white value way over there. There we go. So to multiply, you can see the background here. Crop this down a bit. Crop image size eleven and a half. That's a little big. Uh, let's make this ten. 
ish. And at 200 dpi. Well, for the background, I don't really need that, it's just shapes. And let me. Yeah, I like that better. Get to fiddle with things a little bit in Photoshop. Sure, this is clean. So when I start inking, everything goes fine. And Q hundred and eighty oh, colorist. Q hundred <clears throat> A. Uh, hundred percent saturation. Let's go to eighty four. That I'm on a black border on this. I'm going to apply one in Photoshop. It'll make it easier. Canvas size three. I think I'll do. Do no, I have to write the landscape for the last one, and this is 11 by 17. I have to change the paper on my paper tray, and I'm also going to not center the image. There we go. You're just constantly chattering. I'm not really responding to anybody. Is that a paper set thing? Done. I'll be inking in moments, my friends. Um. All right, there we go. Yeah, I'm I'm good to go for this. This will be funny. Uh, is that enough? Do I need to pull the camera back up? Because there's a lot that's not showing up here. Let me pull this camera back up. Do, do, do. Maybe I'll just angle it so it's covering the top part of the image a little bit better. There we go. There we go. That away. Probably going to do most of this with the point one or the zero one again. 
and glasses have to come on. Yeah, I, I tend to twist the paper in every single dis direction while I'm uh, doing this stuff. Anything you can do to make it so you get the line quality you want, you should do. Um, because otherwise you're just creating a struggle out of nothing. And this is a case where that head is so important to get right. Uh, if I, I, I need to ink it first, because if I screw it up, I'll just print it out and start again. A little bit more helmet going this way. Here we go. Scarf there, there's the shoulder. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I want there. And I really wanted to get an idea of almost like scallops and metal in this. Like there's like levels of sharp metal laid on top of to form his mask. Work.
every once in a while you'll get uh, one of these pens that will feel like it's it's dragging on the ink. Now it may be that the uh, the tip is already worn down from just a little bit of drawing, um, but the vast majority of the time these pens just flow like crazy. Like that one does. Yeah, so I think this is a garbage pen now. It's terrible, um, but I buy these because they flow a certain way. So if the pen's not flowing the way I need it to, it's got to go. Just hit the camera with my eye glasses. When looking at um, the lag on my on my desktop, I'm not sure how it did that. Maybe I, I accidentally paused it or something. But it's still with me penciling Shredder from like a couple of hours ago. Oh yeah, just re uh, reloaded it. All right. I really want to see what that black around the eyes is going to look like. So I might have to go back in, white paint the eyes or something to get it exactly the way I want. I'm going to fill them in now. Pop this camera there.
and that works pretty much the way I wanted it to. All right, um, I am going to Yeah, this is this is pretty much what I plan to do. All right, good. When it, when it starts developing the way you you anticipated, you kind of go, okay, I can I can breathe a little easier that uh, everything's coming out the way I hoped. Yeah, and that's reading like there's like real, I'm essentially doing a very scribbly, not very accurate checkerboard pattern in what's the lamellar armor I want on his shoulders here and our upper arms. And because of the way, you know, we visually read information, um, just the fact that there's a pattern in there 
is making it read like there's intent. Like I'm actually taking the time and getting the lamellar pattern correct when I'm not. And one of the wonderful things about dry brushing is it also creates the illusion of detail. So a lot of times there'll be a lot of people that go, oh my God, you work so detailed. And it's not really, I mean, sometimes there is a lot of detail, but most of the time what I do is I'm, I'm, I'm actively creating an illusion of detail. That's uh, part of the job, part of the gig, create the illusions. And part of it, um, I'd much rather create the impression of a level of detail because then the reader gets the impression and moves on and isn't distracted by too much information to think that um, it's, it's an important part of the story. Uh, I find that the more detailed the artist, the slower and more distracted the comic reading experience is. And I like, I like, I like reading my comics, man. Okay, so do the other shoulder pad or don't, you know, I kind of want to get some more cross hatching up here. There we go. I think I'm going to do the shoulder and then I'm going to move down across. I'm generally going to work my way down the figure, maybe till about here. Then I'm going to go and do all the, uh, uh, the clouds and everything. So I can actually have a sense of how that's going to work. And then finish the ground because that's going to be a lot of rendering. And then I have to go in with white paint on top of that to get um, things looking exactly the way I want in terms of like a lot of visual noise. If you've seen my recent um, uh, dark side pictures or uh, I think an Etrigan I did a little while ago where it's like I, I throw a ton of white paint on top of a whole bunch of rendering I've done um you'll you'll know what i'm talking talking about in terms of like creating layers of visual noise to uh just make it's like it's almost like ridley scott films where he um he fills like the the, the atmosphere with so much stuff it just you start seeing shit that isn't there Oh, welcome back, JC. I have to, uh, for future streams, I have to get a uh, higher platform of my laptop on because it's the chat portion is completely blocked by my drawing table right now. So it's, uh, I, I, I almost see people commenting by accident.
Oh, I gotta top off my drink. Mm -hmm. Oh, looks like the autofocus is kicked in again. I'm, I'm just looking at this, the monitor, it looks like it's pulsing. That's that's annoying as, as heck. I turned the autofocus off a while ago. I don't think I want to risk trying to make any adjustments midstream. I have to move my hands in there. Still doing that, isn't it? Well, the camera is getting warm, so it could be doing a stream for this long. Might be a little too much for it to handle. Um, and now it stopped, hasn't it? All right, that was a that was a little bit of a worry. All right. Well, I won't be streaming as long tomorrow, um, as I mentioned earlier, because I'll have the hours right. I don't know what I was thinking, man. I, I think I just stayed up too late and then just panicked when I woke up thinking I, I was late and then just didn't redo the math. It's like, it seemed wrong when I was saying, okay, why am I starting at this time? So tomorrow and I'll be starting 11 Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time instead of 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is like, what, what the hell was I thinking, man? What was I thinking? Okay, let's get those let's get those rivets drawn. I'm actually going to draw the shadows of the rivets because I'll be able to see that through the other rendering and be able to apply white paint as needed to make them pop. Pop pop. Oh my god, what was the name of that character from Parks and Rec. Was it Pop Pop or Corn Pop? No, Corn Pop's the, the, the Biden guy. Corn Pop was his name. Um, I think this is going to work out fine. Uh, let's get that horizontal line in there. That in there. That one in there. Was it Magnitude? Was that the character from Parks and Rec? Magnitude who said pop, pop? Damn it. Oh, it's been pulsing for a while, Jeremy. Is it pulsing? It's pulsing again, too, isn't it? it like, stop there for a minute. That's got to be the autofocus. Um, hopefully, I can get that sorted for tomorrow. If it's too irritating, I guess I could. Um, stop and relaunch the stream right away let me know if it's bothering uh anyone because i don't see it unless i'm looking at the monitor um right now all i'm doing is is seeing my drawing as i'm inking okay so it's gonna be coming in
Yeah, it's not too bad. All right, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I might, I might actually, I am a little worried. I just touched the camera. I'm going to touch it again. It's feeling a little warm. Um, it might be getting too hot. I mean, this is a very long stream. First time ever using this camera. I might be putting it at risk. Um, let's see how we're doing at uh, seven o'clock our time here. Eastern Standard Time, that's in an uh, hour and a half. So I might stop at um, an hour and a half just to, you know, give the camera a chance to recover for tomorrow. So I, I hate, you know, brand new camera. I hate to have it like die first time using it. Because I killed it. You know what I forgot to do? I actually forgot to draw the shredder symbol on that belt buckle. I might have to do it straight up in ink and I might completely destroy it. Pretty decent gradation. I think I want that mask a little darker, but I don't want to go in there quite yet. <laughs> yeah, it's a marathon. It's um starting starting two hours earlier was complete stupidity on my part because yeah. But um it's good to actually. I mean, the fact that it's already lasted this long, it's only starting to feel a little warm and doing this pulsing thing. And I'm pretty sure what must must have happened is I must have done something that forced autofocus to turn back on. So, um, again, brand new camera. This is my first time really using it for any length of time. I'll figure it out. I'll sort it out. 
yeah, I have confidence in my ability to sort this stuff out. Someone's got to have confidence in me. It might as well be me. Or the symbol look like the way I throw that at the All over here. Uh, samurai, samurai, samurai. Here we go. Yeah, it's just a simple trident with a diamond bottom. All right, so I got this here, this there. Make that work. There we go. I can probably use There we go. It's there, but it's not over one, over one of the piece. So. Okay, so this would be blocking. So this would be a shadowy part of the belt. So if I curve from there, this a lot of times uh, when I'm lay, laying on um, cross hatching. Um, I'll, I'll find a core shadow to cross hatch out of, and it helps everything look a little bit smoother. I think that's looking all right so far. Still got to do the scarf. Uh, finish the gauntlets. Oh, let's see. That works. Do I want to do the gauntlets first, or do I want to do this belt part and the scarf? I think I'll do the scarf first. All right, it's just the right amount of light hitting that.
Hmm. Oh wow! I'm glad. I'm glad the video quality is is good. I've held off streaming for so long because I tried um, some of the stuff I had on hand, and then a friend uh, recommended uh, the host of the uh, Things Are Getting Sketchy uh, uh, Art Stream. Uh, he recommended this LG Brio 4K. And I am um, like, I was looking at buying like a brand new Sony A camera. Uh, and I was just like, can I justify it just for uh, an entry level? You know, what if I don't like streaming on a regular basis? But I mean, this was, um, I think with tax and everything, it ended up being like uh, 225 bucks off of Amazon. Um and oh my god this is uh this is a great streaming camera compared to like anything i, I could have used before and i'm very very happy with it um not that you know i mean logitech if you want to give me money i'll take it but uh i'm 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 quite happy with this logitech camera uh that was uh just the quality of it compared to every other way like i mean there was the um logitech c90 i think it was called and my friend was using it and the details just weren't there everything was blurry you might as well have been using a phone camera and uh so that and that was apparently the state-of-the-art webcam and i just kind of said well you know i just thought i just have to wait till i can buy a uh uh a high quality dslr or roof uh mirrorless camera can't remember what the term is now because again my brain's putting right now um but uh yeah he recommended this i looked it up online and it was like oh my god that's a it's a, it's a remarkable step up the, the there's elgato has a camera that doesn't come with a mic that's apparently as good as this and it's a little bit more expensive and i've heard good things about elgato because apparently their their cam link is the state of the art for um recording your live streams so you can edit them later which is something i'm i'm planning to do i want to do more like just just i'm drawing for the hell of it come watch me uh i want to do some instructional videos i like teaching i miss teaching i used to teach uh art school at college i did it for about nine years um so i'd like to to be able to bring some of that back pass some of that out there um do I wanna here we go I'm gonna do this just to soften up the transition a bit. Um and this camera's already a key part of it. I, I probably will um I already I bought a new laptop, I bought this camera. Uh how much do I want to spend on streaming right up front? I'll probably wait to see like if I really get the bug if I'm good with this. And then I'll do a two camera setup so you can look at my ugly mug while I'm uh while I'm doing this, apparently that's a big part of like engagement, people seeing the person uh, who's who's on camera, as opposed to like just their hands creating imagery. But yeah, so the this Brio 4K um, is it's got my highest recommendation. It's 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 really good. So what I'm going to do with these, I might sh should finish, I fin I'm going to finish the lamellar stuff first. Hmm. Yeah, it's still working. I went too far out here. Didn't make that go to black there, so I don't have to keep making a mistake.
fill that point there on the far side here, or the fore edge. There we go, that's better. Okay. Yeah, it's working all right. Um, the more I look at, though, the more it bothers me that I didn't finish rendering this. So I'm going to use a 0.5 for that. 0 0.05. Just, uh, push that back a bit, let the eyes pop more. There you go, that pushes it back just enough. So when I go in and put the highlight, the, the highlight will show up. All right, almost six. Let me get the... You just lose time when you get into the zone, when you're drawing. You just, it, it just, it doesn't matter how quick or how slow the drawing was before you got into the zone. As soon as you're in the zone, you look up, time's gone. It's 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 like wow. Is that pulsing getting faster? Yeah, I will be adding uh, specifically the lessons to my Patreon. It's something I've been wanting to do. I've, I've made notes. Uh, years ago, I had a uh, what they called the ultimate hand drawing course, which I thought was like a, a terrible, terrible choice for a title um, because I thought it was a beginner hand drawing course, um, like basically a way to get started so you could actually get better at it with practice and then maybe doing like an advanced course to actually collate your experience with lesson plans. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, uh, via YouTube, um, host a whole bunch of the lessons eventually, but I'm going to shoot them for my Patreons, uh, Patreon backers, my Patreons. That's, that's just a weird, the language of, of this is still a little weird for me. Um, but for my patrons, they're going to get to see the full lessons. Uh, but on YouTube, I'll, I'll post excerpts, like still have informational content, but not the full course. They'll, they'll just be for my patrons. And I'll be, I mean, yeah, it's more content for my Patreon, but it's largely mainly for me because I, I kind of want to still be like passing on this information before I shuffle off this mortal coil so what i'm actually doing is i'm rendering in the shadow zones on these leggings so when i render over top of them it, it'll make the shadow zones like the gaps between the leggings darker but also give like more of a 3d appearance to uh, these bumpy parts so it looks like I'm just doing like terrible plaid shirts all the time. Um, but it's creating a pattern effect. Which will maintain itself underneath layers of, of cross hatching. Now, most inkers don't do this. I mean, this is not uh, a commercial inking style by any stretch of the imagination. This is just how I like making my work. I'm a weirdo, man. I, I like lots and lots and lots of uh, rendering.
Hmm, how do I wanna, I want that curve. Sense of curves, I guess I'm gonna have to cross hatch it. So it looks like like if I pause for too long, it kicks in with the, the pulsing. I don't know, man. I don't know. I want to go darker with that still. I think that that little extra bit of there is tying everything together in a nice way. See how it looks like in the mirror. Yeah, it looks like chunky armor. I like it. A lot of dead air here, sorry. Um, yeah, anyone have any questions? Oh, you took the uh, the ultimate hands course. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was important for me to get the sense of gesture. I, I wanted I wanted the viewers of the course to understand that gesture underlies everything. Um, I ha I have a few I guess out of the norm uh, beliefs when it comes to drawing. I think I think proportions are more important than anatomy. Um, anatomy is important, but I mean, if if you're gonna if you can only get one of them really really done well, uh, proportions will carry more water for your your artwork. Um, uh, gesture uh, drives motion in your drawing, um, which is why I'm not a big. I'm 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 super ecstatic. I'll draw from photographs. I'll draw from videos. I'll draw from uh, drawing figures, life drawing, um, but tracing anything other than inanimate objects kills your drawing dead. And even tracing an, I, I think you can actually infuse a lot of life into an inanimate object drawing um, by actually trying to get a sense of like gesture, or like what type of movement visually you can get out of uh say a car or uh something that's in motion uh i think that, i think that's very important i i'm not adverse to people i mean there's the uh, uh alex toth uh, thing um if you can uh oh god now uh, i'm gonna blow it hang on i'm gonna look it up i'm gonna look it up yeah it, it deserves to be you know, accurately reported. Uh, Toth, if you can trace, maybe it was Wally Wood. Mm, 
maybe it was one of what. Oh, yeah, it was Wallywood. My bad. So Wallywood said, never draw anything you can copy, never copy anything you can trace, never trace anything you can cut out and paste out. Uh, just think about the time saving that that means for a comic artist. If if they they go in with zero compunctions about the source of the material they're using for a comic book, uh, especially considering it's all work for hire, and I think what he's referring to specifically is using other artists who have drawn um, that book and repurposing their um, artwork for the same project. Anyway, that's, that's, I don't, I don't, have I traced? I think I traced when I started. I think I have traced buildings. I've traced cars, of course. Complex, complex machinery I've traced. Um, so I, 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 I'm not adverse to tracing, but, um, wow, is that pulsing getting worse? Turn this that way, see, oops, not quite catching the lip of my, uh, my little laser. Yeah, that pulsing is getting a little worse, isn't it? Um, geez. Yeah, so uh, the digression aside, gesture is everything. If you can get gesture down, if you can capture gesture in the human figure, you can capture it, capture it in the anatomy of the human figure. Uh, if you can capture it in the human figure, you can capture it in animals. And if you can capture it in animals, you should be able to capture it in, well, pretty much anything at that point. Like if you if you're drawing a, a car chase scene, which are Honestly, I don't think writers should really do car chase scenes in in comics. There's 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 a weird belief I have that if you're doing something that's already really really well done in other media, let's say um, car chases, thing, and basically motion chases, things that are really really difficult to do in comic books because there is no motion in, in the comics. It, it's all static imagery. Um, unless you've got a way to really do the sequence really well in the medium you're working in, find a different solution to, to drive the tension. I mean, it's like car chases are fun on TV and in movies. They're not particularly good in comics. I mean, there's no, you lose any real sense of motion they're using the camera to capture motion having the cat the say the cars move across space it's it's gone um comics give you a static image i think if you got if you get you got a really good static image for, for part of a car chase reduce your car chase down to the static image like the two cars just racing in the street and then cut to the people talking in the car and then you know cut to something else because the actual action of the car chase itself does not work in a comic book. I've seen people who've done beautiful drawings in a car chase, but as a, as a narrative story element, I just think they're a mistake. Um, and I, I'm thinking very specifically, I, I was working on an indie graphic novel that I ended up having to get out of uh, because it was just not great because uh, it was full of stuff like that. They, they, they wrote essentially wrote a screenplay and they wanted it to be a comic book because they thought it would help get their movie made, which is, you know, honestly, that was the last time I did something like that. Um, and I had this extended car chase and there was, I was struggling so mightily to try and get a sense of, of narrative tension out of, out of this thing that is just inherently better done almost immediately on TV, just because TV moves. So, yeah, it's uh, even though if you can, you know, you should be able to, if you've been drawing for a certain while, you should be able to capture a gesture of a car, um, but shy of immediately going into cartooning the car and doing a car chase. Um, it's almost impossible to do it for me anyway. Maybe, maybe other artists are just that much better than me. 
um, to do things like car chases um, with any sort of real visual excitement in them. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Holy smokes. I'm actually making pretty good speed on this. It's just after sex. Camera throb aside. Um, yeah, I am going to, the, the camera throb is worrying me quite a bit. I, I want to be able to take a look and see if it's, uh, you know, maybe autofocus has uh, turned itself back on, or maybe I did something wrong there. But um, yeah, I want to get that camera sorted. And I'm also getting tired. At the start of it, it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to you know seven, eight o'clock, and this will be fine. It's like six o'clock. I'm like, I could take a nap. I think my throat needs to to break more than anything else. Yeah, my throat's starting to go, hey, what are you doing to me? Stop. Stop. See me on camera? Okay, yeah, good. Just realize. Yes, I'm getting quiet because my throat's getting sore. Um, I also wanted to make sure I'm mindful of what, what ends up on camera and what doesn't. Just a reminder, um, the commission list for this weekend is open at cadencecomicart.com. Uh, just go to commissions, uh, you'll find me, and there's a drop down uh, menu for everything from uh, 9 by 12 to uh, 11 by 17s. And like just like this, this uh, shredder piece, 
and um, there are spots open. So, you know, uh, if you want art, I'm here to make art all weekend. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Will I finish this by 7? No, I don't think I'll finish this by 7. I'll, I'll finish first thing tomorrow morning. But, um, yeah, yeah, I think this is turning out pretty good. Not to uh, brag or anything. I, I, I just like it when it's like it's turning out the way it should. Get that glove feeling happening in that, that hand. I don't like the line on that. Uh... Just a second. There we go. That works a little bit better. Still not a big fan of that part there. Ooh. Should be allowed to. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, I try not to brag because most often than not, I'm, I'm always vaguely disappointed with my work. Um, I think that's just, you know, that comes with the territory of being an artist, but, um, because you, uh, when you're an artist, especially when you draw from your imagination a lot, you have an idea in your head and you, you're trying to capture smoke at that point um you're chasing like this idealized image you had in your head and um it's really hard to do that man i've been uh trying to do that for years and uh sometimes i come close uh but most of the time i think i think most of us would agree you, you gotta get used to disappointing yourself I wonder, um, this is a new laptop I bought to uh, make sure I had more stable streams. It keeps interrupting me, telling me to um, restart the laptop for my antivirus security. Um, I wonder if that got involved and it's forcing the pulses, like like weird stuff like that. You know, who knows? I don't know. 
I will try and sort it out the moment I'm offline. Run the boot. Now I'm not going to render the boot too much. Is just going to be doing all these lava cracks on the ground. Uh, there'll be actually hot points coming up underneath the boot, and there'll be a shadow on top. But there's going to be so much light spill up from the ground. I'm going to go back in with white paint spell adder and everything. Um, that I'm putting down lines, knowing full well that I want them to be obfuscated by white paint. Um, uh, when the piece is done. So the, the little lines I'm going to be putting here are going to be uh, largely there to get erased by white paint splattering all over them, if that makes sense. It's a thing I do. So this is a uh, core only here. So I want to get the idea that there's a curve here. But this is also where I just explained how there's going to be like all this whiteout splattering everywhere. So I get kind of delicate how I get the shadow on top of this stuff to work. Now, one of the things I also miss uh, from a good convention is there's certain friends I go to good restaurants with. They've done these conventions so long, they know where all the good places are. And um, I'm, I'm here at home in Toronto where I know all the places I normally eat at, um, but I don't really feel like going out after, um, although I did get to hang out with some great friends last night. Um, so I'm thinking I might just do takeout and I'm trying to decide like what I feel like, like for takeout, do I want like some of the stupid and simple, like pizza, do I want like fried chicken? Cause I haven't had fried chicken for a while. I do like fried chicken. Um, there's a great sushi place, but I think they just do um, pick up and I had sushi last night and it was a really good sushi. Uh, so I don't want to overdo it. Although I got to tell you, I do love my, my sushi. Um, yeah, that's part of the con experience I'm missing. I, I am planning to do cons next year. Um, uh, with Cadence, they're going to do advanced commissions for the convention so people can pick them up. Um, they're going to have a lot of books, like a collected book of the witch drawings, uh, another sketchbook, uh, probably have more, uh, second coming trades because we're working on volume four already. Um, so, you know, you pretty sure I'll have volume three and maybe possibly volume four next year. I think that's too soon, though. Uh, Doom to King to Gotham has a new print edition out. I'm going to be getting a bunch of those to do more sketches in. Um, I did a, bunch, a series of paintings for those. In fact, there's a Batman piece I, I, I'll probably be working on. Unless I get completely booked up with 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 other commissions this uh uh, this 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 weekend, uh, there's a Batman piece I'm, I'm planning to work on on camera. It's a painted piece, so that that'll be fun, I think. Um, yeah, and I gotta tell you, I really miss my friends in in con. I did a couple of cons last year. 
Uh, it was so good seeing people that I hadn't seen since before the pandemic. Um, but it's it's still still a little scary out there, both economically and health wise. I think um, I'm not sure that uh, people have recovered. I mean, there's all the talk about the inflation that happened this year. Um, there's still a lot of people getting very, very sick from COVID, even though, you know, we have vaccines out and everything out there. Uh, no, I'm not going to get into a discussion about COVID um, or vaccines, but it's it's still going out. The traveling, there's still added la- uh, levels of stress you got to deal with. Um, and you don't know if the fans can really afford uh, the luxury that is the comic experience. I mean, we're we're a luxury industry. No one needs comics. Um, And uh, I don't know if people have the discretionary spending for for you know going to comic convention yet. That's that's I think that's the real big issue right there. So I got that shadow. Can you see it? So I got the shadow coming up here. I went a little darker in the toe because I want it to uh, advance towards the reader, even though I'm going to be hitting it with white paint. And I reduce that a bit as I go back here. Yeah, I think that's working. And since this is this is curving away from the flight fire a bit, I think I can actually do this. So I'm gonna draw this fist, that boot. I'm I'm on the fence about drawing that scarf in the background. That almost seems like too much, but it feels like I have to do it because I did it hanging in the foreground and I didn't do the other part of the scarf there. Huh. Now I'm on the fence about that. Yeah. The, I, I really do miss cons. I really do um made so many friends all over the place i was initially planning to go to uh ec c c <laughs> emerald city um chicago new york uh, i did baltimore last year uh so i was thinking i was going to give baltimore a pass i did uh uh heroes last year so i was going to skip it this year um I did uh, Kansas City, which is a was a remarkably lovely show, um, and the people there were amazing, and the food was oh my god! So I I I I missed it, but oh my god, I, I definitely have to do Kansas City again. Um, Galaxy Con shows are always great shows for me, uh, mainly mainly for the people. Uh, um, Mike Broder runs a great convention and I really like him and he has, he brings out a lot of people I care about. So it's like always a good time, but this year just wasn't in the cards for me. It was, it was just too much left for the last minute. And I decided better, better to do things like this, which I, I'm going to, I'm going to do more of because I, I, I think, I think this is working out apart from the camera pulsing. Um, and enter enter 2024 with a much better uh, coordinated and organized plan in an industry that is hopefully doing better uh, as it, as it understands like what's happening because I, I mean the con organizers themselves are struggling. Um, I mean, as I understand it, um, all the major con. Com- uh, uh, organizers got stuck with massive bills for events that they couldn't run that they had to make guaranteed payments on 
So that's that's not a good sign for uh, a lot of people in this industry. So let's let's get people to recover from that. And uh, yeah, uh, let's let's go 2024, man. <laughs> All right, it's almost 6.30 already, yeah. And it's pulsing still, darn it. They canceled E3, huh? Wow, that's um, that's the video game one. I just want to make sure that's uh, the video game one. I, uh, yeah, I think, I think everyone was a little too optimistic about live events. And I get it. Um, a lot of people, they need those live events. They're, that's their career. I know some comic artists who paid their, you know, did everything. They, uh, that was their, that was their bread and butter is, is doing live events. And the industry is being in the shape it is, uh, was not good for them, man. It was not good at all. So, I mean, I want everyone to be healthy, happy, and, and uh, secure. And I just don't know that the world's there yet. So I, want to render, yeah, I, think, I think I'm going to render it like this. This is the angle I'm going to hit it at. Still on the fence about that scarf. I have to make a decision about that scarf. What if I brought it coming off the shoulder? It obfuscates one of the spikes or the blades or whatever. Hmm. I think I'm gonna correct this. This is not this is too sharp. I need uh there you go. I have to do some white paint on that after. There's going to be a lot of corrections on this piece when it's when it's done. Um, that scarf, though. Now I'm really bothered by. It. I could I could draw it in and then use white paint to um, pull it out. But I really like the idea of having those rivets pop. Ah, I know I have to I have to do this. I have to. Sorry about that. I'll call them back after. Yeah, I'll just have to use some white paint and get that. Yeah, I like the idea of so much heat coming up, the scarf is being lifted. It's not from motion, it's from like the heat just pushing light fabrics up. Um, <laughs> so I think he done. Um Do I want to start on the back now or do I want to just do I want to prep it up to tape it? Because wow, everything just literally went out of focus there.
Okay, there we go. It's back in focus again. Wow, it just lost all its focus there. Yeah, you know what? Huh. I'm at a good stop point, but I am I was planning to go for another half hour. Hmm. Yeah, the pulsing is really, really bothering me. Uh camera's actually getting hot. It's not warm anymore. It's not actually getting hot. I think I am going to end it now. Um, although it stopped pulsing now. Oh, oh there it goes again. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to end it now. I'm going to wrap it up. It's uh, it's a little early, but I'm I'm tired. I started too early. Uh, this is a good break point for this piece. I can start tomorrow working on this piece um finish off all the background do all the lighting effects uh take my time with it make sure it, i do a good job with it and um and yeah i think i think that's what i'm going to do all right um everybody uh thanks for joining me uh we've done nine hours and 20 minutes so i'm, I'm 20 minutes past what i should be doing at least uh, because i started earlier and um, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night.